Section 0 of The Golden Bell, A Study in Magic and Religion, 3rd Edition, Part 2, Taboo and the Perils of the Soul, by Sir James George Fraser, Doctor of Civil Law, Doctor of Laws, Doctor of Letters, Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, Professor of Social Anthropology in the University of Liverpool. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. The Golden Bow, A Study in Magic and Religion, Part 2. Taboo and the Perils of the Soul, by Sir James George Fraser. Preface The term taboo is one of the very few words which the English language has borrowed from the speech of savages. In the Polynesian tongue from which we have adopted it, the word designates a remarkable system which has deeply influenced the religious, social, and political life of the Oceanic Islanders, both Polynesians and Melanesians, particularly by inculcating a superstitious veneration for the persons of nobles and the rights of private property. When about the year 1886, my ever-lamented friend, William Robertson Smith, asked me to write an article on taboo for the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I shared what I believed to have been, at the time, the current view of anthropologists, and the institution in question was confined to the brown and black races of the Pacific. But an attentive study of the accounts given by taboo by observers who wrote while it still flourished in Polynesia soon led me to modify that view. The analogies which the system presents to the superstitions, not only of savages elsewhere, but of the civilized races of antiquity, were too numerous and too striking to be overlooked. And I came to the conclusion that taboo is only one of a number of similar systems of superstition, which among many, perhaps among all races of men, have contributed in large measure, under many different names, and with many variations of detail, to build up the complex fabric of society in all the various sides or elements of it which we describe as religious, social, political, moral, and economic. This conclusion I briefly indicated in my article. My general views on the subject were accepted by my friend Robertson Smith and applied by him in his celebrated lectures on the elucidation of some aspects of Semitic religion. Since then, the importance of taboo and of systems like it in the evolution of religion and morality, of government and property, has been generally recognised and has indeed become a commonplace of anthropology. The present volume is merely an expansion of the corresponding chapter in the first edition of The Golden Bough. It treats of the principles of taboo and their special application to sacred personages, such as kings and priests, who are the proper theme of the book. It is not professed to handle this subject as a whole, to pursue it in all its ramifications, to trace the manifold influences which systems of this sort have exerted in moulding the multitudinous forms of human society. A treatise which should adequately discuss these topics would far exceed the limits which I have prescribed for myself in the Golden Bough. For example, I have barely touched in passage on the part which these superstitions have played in shaping the moral ideas and directing the moral practice of mankind, a profound subject full perhaps of momentous issues for the time when men shall seriously set themselves to revise their ethical code in the light of its origin, for that the ethical, like the legal code of a people, stands in need of constant revision will hardly be disputed by any attentive and dispassionate observer. The old view that the principles of right and wrong are immutable and eternal is no longer tenable. The moral world is as little exempt as a physical world from the law of ceaseless change of perpetual flux. Contemplate the diversities, the inconsistencies, the contradictions of the ethical ideas and the ethical practice, not merely of different peoples in different countries, but of the same people in the same country in different ages. Then say whether the foundations of morality are eternally fixed and unchanging. If they seem so to us, as they have probably seemed to men in all ages who did not extend their views beyond the narrow limits of their time and country, it is all likelihood, merely because the rate of change is commonly so slow that is imperceptible at any moment, and can only be detected by a comparison of acute observation extending over long periods of time. Such a comparison, could we make it, would probably convince us that if we can speak of the moral law as immutable and eternal, it can only be in the relative or figurative sense in which we apply the same words to the outlines 
of the great mountains by comparison with the short-lived generations of men the mountains too are passing away though we do not see it nothing is stable and abiding under or above the sun we can as little arrest the process of moral evolution as we can stay the sweep of the tides or the course of the stars therefore whether we like it or not the moral curve by which we regulate our conduct is being constantly revised and altered old rules have been silently expunged and new rules silently inscribed in the palimpsest by the busy the unresting hand of an invisible scribe for unlike the public and formal revision of a legal code the revision of the moral code is always private tacit and informal the legislators who make and the judges who administer it are not clad in ermine and scarlet their edicts are not proclaimed with the blare of trumpets and the pomp of heraldry we ourselves are the lawgivers and the judges it is the whole people who make and alter the ethical standard and judge every case by reverence to it we sit in the highest court of appeal judging offenders daily we cannot if we would rid ourselves of the responsibility all that we can do is to take as clear and comprehensive a view as possible of the evidence lest from too narrow and partial a view we should do injustice perhaps gross and irreparable injustice to the prisoners at the bar few things perhaps can better guard us from narrowness and illiberality in our moral judgments than a survey of the amazing diversities of ethical theory and practice which we have been recorded among the various races of mankind in different ages and accordingly the comparative method applied to the study of ethical phenomena may be expected to do for morality what the same method applied to religious phenomena is now doing for religion by enlarging our mental horizon extending the boundaries of knowledge throwing light on the origin of current beliefs and practices and thereby directly assisting us to replace what is in effect by what is vigorous and what is false by what is true the facts which i have put together in this volume as well as in some of my other writings may perhaps serve as materials for a future science of comparative ethics they are rough stones which await the master builder rude sketches which more cunning hands in mind may hereafter work up into a finished picture James George Fraser, Cambridge, 1st of February, 1911. End of section 0. Preface. Section 1 of The Golden Bough, A Study in Magic and Religion. Part 2. Taboo and the Perils of the Soul by Sir James George Fraser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 1. The Burden of Royalty. Section 1. Royal and Priestly Taboos. Life of Divine Kings and Priests Regulated by Minute Rules. At a certain stage in early society, the king or priest is often thought to be endowed with supernatural powers or to be an incarnation of a deity, and consistently with this belief, the course of nature is supposed to be more or less under his control, and he is held responsible for bad weather, failure of the crops, and similar calamities. To some extent it appears to be assumed that the king's power over nature, like that of his subjects and slaves, is exerted through definite acts of will, and therefore if drought, famine, pestilence or storms arise the people attribute the misfortune to the negligence or guilt of their king and punish him accordingly with stripes and bonds or if he remains obdurate with deposition and death sometimes however the course of nature while regarded as dependent on the king is supposed to be partially independent of his will his person is considered if we may express it so as a dynamic centre of the universe from which lions or force radiate to all quarters of the heaven, so that any motion of his, the turning of his head, the lifting of his hand, instantaneously affects and may seriously disturb some part of nature. He is a point of support on which hangs the balance of the world, and the slightest irregularity on his part may overthrow the delicate equipoise. The greatest care must, therefore, be taken both by and of him, and his whole life, down to its minutest details, must be so regulated that no act of his voluntary or involuntary, may disarrange or upset the established order of nature. Tomokado or Diary of Japan 
Of this class of monarchs, the Mikado or Taiyuri, the spiritual emperor of Japan, is, or rather used to be, a typical example. He is an incarnation of the sun goddess, the deity who rules the universe. Gods and men included. Once a year, all the gods wait upon him and spend a month at his court. During that month, the name of which means without gods, no one frequents the temples, for they are believed to be deserted. The Mikado receives from his people and assumes in his official proclamations and decrees the title of Manifest or Incarnate Deity, Akitsukami, and he claims a general authority over the gods of Japan. For example, in an official decree of the year 646, the emperor is described as the incarnate god who governs the universe. Rules of life formally observed by the Mikado the following description of the Mikado's mode of life was written about 200 years ago. Even to this day, the princes descended of this family, more particularly those who sit on the throne, are looked upon as persons most holy in themselves, and as popes by birth. And in order to preserve these advantageous notions in the minds of their subjects, they are obliged to take an uncommon care of their sacred persons and to do such things which examined accordingly to the custom of other nations will be thought ridiculous and impertinent. It will not be improper to give a few instances of it. He thinks that it would be very prejudicial to his dignity and holiness to touch the ground with his feet. For this reason, when he intends to go anywhere, he must be carried thither on men's shoulders. Much less will they suffer that he should expose his sacred person to the open air, and the sun is not thought worthy to shine on his head. There is such a holiness ascribed to all parts of his body, that he dares to cut off neither his hair, nor his beard, nor his nails. Whoever, lest he should grow too dirty, they must clean him in the night when he is asleep, because, they say, that which is taken from his body at that time has been stolen from him, and that such a theft does not prejudice his holiness or dignity. In ancient times he was obliged to sit on the throne for some hours every morning, with the imperial crown on his head, but to sit altogether like a statue without stirring either hands or feet, head or eyes, nor indeed any part of his body, because by this means it was thought that he could preserve peace and tranquillity in his empire, or if unfortunately he turned himself on one side or the other, or if he looked a good while towards any part of his dominion, it was apprehended that war, famine, fire, or some other great misfortune was near at hand to desolate the country. But it having been afterwards discovered that the imperial crown was a palladium, which by its immobility could preserve peace in the empire, it was thought expedient to deliver his imperial person, consecrated only by idleness and pleasures, from this burden duty, and therefore the crown is at present placed on the throne for some hours every morning. His victuals must be dressed every time in new pots, and served at table in new dishes, both are very clean and neat, but made only of common clay that without any considerable expense they may be laid aside or broke after they have served once they are generally broke for fear they should come into the hands of laymen for they believe religiously that if any layman should presume to eat his food out of these sacred dishes it would swell and inflame his mouth and throat the like ill effect is dreaded from the deity's sacred habits for they believe that if the layman should wear them without the emperor's express leave or command they would occasion swellings and pains in all parts of his body. To the same effect, an earlier account of the Mikado says, It was considered as a shameful degradation for him even to touch the ground with his foot. The sun and moon were not even permitted to shine upon his head. None of the superfluities of the body were ever taken from him. Neither his hair, his beard, nor his nails were cut. Whatever he ate was dressed in new vessels. Rules of life observed by kings and priests in Africa and America. Similar priestly, or rather divine kings, are found at a lower level of barbarism on the west coast of Africa. At Shark Point near Cape Pardon, in Lower Guinea, lives the priestly king Kukulu, alone in a wood. He may not touch a woman nor leave his house. Indeed, he may not even quit his chair, in which he is obliged to sleep, sitting, for if he lay down, no wind would arise and navigation would be stopped. He regulates storms and in general maintains a wholesome and equitable state of the atmosphere. On Mount Agu in Togo, 
a German possession in West Africa. The Lisa, Fetish, or spirit called Bagwa, who is of great importance for the whole of the surrounding country. The power of giving or withholding rain is ascribed to him, and he is lord of the winds, including the Hamatan, the dry hot wind which blows from the interior. His priest dwells in a house on the highest peak of the mountain, where he keeps the winds bottled up in huge jars. Applications for rain, too, are made to him, and he does a good business in amulets, which consist of the teeth and claws of leopards. Yet, though his power is great and is indeed the real chief of the land, the rule of the finish forbids him ever to leave the mountain, and he must spend the whole of his life on its summit. Only once a year may he come down to make purchases in the market, but even then he may not set foot in the hut of any mortal man, and must return to his place of exile the same day. The business of government in the village is conducted by subordinate chiefs who are appointed by him. In the West African Kingdom of Congo, there was a supreme pontiff called Chitome, or Chitombe, whom the Negroes regarded as a god on earth and all-powerful in heaven. Hence, before they would taste the new crops, they offered him the first fruits, fearing that manifold misfortunes would befall them if they broke this rule. When he left his residence to visit other places within his jurisdiction, all married people had to observe strict continence the whole time he was out, for it was supposed that any act of incontinence would prove fatal to him, and if he were to die a natural death, they thought that the world would perish, and the earth, which he alone sustained by his power and merit, would immediately be annihilated. Similarly, in Humbe, a kingdom of Angola, the incontinence of young people under the age of puberty used to be a capital crime, because it was believed to entail the death of the king within the year. Of late, the death penalty has been commuted for a fine of ten oxen inflicted on each of the culprits. This commutation has attracted thousands of dissolute youth to Humbe from the neighbouring tribes, among whom the old penalty is still rigorously exacted. Amongst the semi-barbarous nations of the New World, at the date of the Spanish conquest, there were found hierarchies or theocracies like those of Japan, in particular the high pontiff of the Zapotecs in southern Mexico, appears to have presented a close parallel to the Mercado. A powerful rival to the king himself, this spiritual lord governed Yopa, one of the chief cities of the kingdom with absolute dominion. It is impossible, we are told, to overrate the reverence in which he was held. He was looked on as a god whom the earth was not worthy to hold, nor the sun to shine upon. He profaned his sanctity, if he even touched the ground with his foot. The officers who bore his palanquin on their shoulders were members of the highest families. He highly designed to look on anything around him, and all who met him fell with their faces to the earth, fearing that death would overtake them if they saw even his shadow. A rule of continence was regularly imposed on the Zapotec priests, especially upon the high pontiff, but for certain days in each year, which were generally celebrated with feasts and dances, it was customary for the high priest to become drunk. But in this state, seeming to belong neither to heaven nor to earth, one of the most beautiful of the virgins consecrated to the service of the gods was brought to him. If the child she bore him was a son, who was brought up as a prince of the blood, and the oldest son succeeded his father on the pontifical throne. The supernatural powers attributed to this pontiff are not specified, but probably they resembled those of the Mikado and Chitome. The rules of life imposed on kings in early society are intended to preserve their lives for the good of their people. Wherever, as in Japan and West Africa, it is supposed that the order of nature, and even the existence of the world, is bound up with the life of the king or priest. It is clear that he must be regarded by his subjects as a source, both of infinite blessing and of infinite danger. On the one hand, the people have to thank him for the rain and sunshine, which foster the fruits of the earth, for the wind which brings ships to their coasts, and even for the solid ground beneath their feet. But what he gives he can refuse, and so close is the dependence of nature on his person, so delicate the balance of the system or forces whereof he is the centre, and the least irregularity on his part may set up a terror which shall shake the earth to its foundations. Yet nature may be disturbed by the slightest involuntary act of the king. It is easy to conceive the convulsion 
which his death might provoke. The natural death of Jitome, as we have seen, was sought to entail the destruction of all things. Clearly, therefore, out of regard for their own safety, which might be imperiled by the rash act of the king, and still more by his death, the people will exact of their king, or priest, a strict conformity to those rules, the observance of which is deemed necessary for his own preservation, and consequently for the preservation of his people and the world. The idea that early kingdoms are despotisms, in which the people exist only for the sovereign, is wholly inapplicable to the monarchies we are considering. On the contrary, the sovereign in them exists only for his subjects. His life is only valuable so long as he discharges the duties of his position by ordering the course of nature for his people's benefit. So as soon as he fails to do so, the care, the devotion, the religious homage which they had hitherto lavished on him cease, and are changed into hatred and contempt. He is dismissed ignominiously, and may be thankful of the escapes of his life. Worshipped as a god one day, he is killed as a criminal the next. But in this changed behaviour of the people, there is nothing capricious or inconsistent. On the contrary, their conduct is entirely of a piece. If their king is their god, he is or should also be their preserver. And if he will not preserve them, he must make room for another who will. So long, however, as he answers their expectations, there is no limit to the care which they take of him and which they compel him to take of himself. A king of this sort lives hedged in by a ceremonious etiquette, a network of prohibitions and observances, of which the intention is not to contribute to his dignity, much less to his comfort, but to restrain him from conduct which, by disturbing the harmony of nature, might involve himself, his people, and the universe in one common catastrophe. Far from adding to his comfort, these observances, by trampling his every act, annihilate his freedom, and often render the very life, which it is their object to preserve, a burden and sorrow to him. Taboos observed by African kings Of the supernatural endowed kings of Loango, it is said that the more powerful a king is, the more taboos he is bound to observe. They regulate all his actions, his walking and his standing, his eating and drinking, his sleeping and waking. To these restraints, the heir to the throne is subject from infancy, and as he advances in life, the number of abstinences and ceremonies which he must observe increases, until the moment that he ascends the throne, he is lost in a notion of rights and taboos. In the crater of an extinct volcano, enclosed on all sides by grassy slopes, lie the scattered huts and yam fields of Riaba, the capital of the native king of Fernando Po. This mysterious being lives in the lowest depths of the crater, surrounded by a harem of forty women, and covered, it is said, with old silver coins. Naked savage as he is, he yet exercises far more influence in the island than the Spanish governor at Santa Isabel. In him the conservative spirit of the boobies or aboriginal inhabitants of the island is, as it were, incorporate. He has never seen a white man, and according to the firm conviction of all the boobies, the sight of a pale face would cause his instant death. He cannot bear to look upon the sea. Indeed, it is said that he may never see it even in the distance, and that therefore he wears away his life with shackles on his legs in the dim twilight of his hut. Certain it is that he has never set foot on the beach. With the exception of his musket and knife, he uses nothing that comes from the whites. European cloth never touches his person, and he scorns tobacco, rum, and even salt. Among the Uwe-speaking peoples of the slave coast in West Africa, the king is at the same time high priest. In this quality he was, particularly in former times, unapproachable by his subjects. Only by night was he allowed to quit his dwelling in order to bathe and so forth. None but his representative, the so-called visible king, with three chosen elders, might converse with him, and even they had to sit on an oxide with their backs turned to him. Prohibition to see the sea. He might not see any European, nor any horse, nor might he look upon the sea, for which reason he was not allowed to quit his capital, even for a few moments. These rules have been disregarded in recent times. The king of Dahomey himself is subject to a prohibition of beholding the sea, and so are the kings of Loango and the great Adra in Guinea. 
The sea is the fetish of the Eeyores. To the northwest of Dahomey, and they and the king are threatened with death by their priests if ever they dare to look on it. It is believed that the king of Kaor in Senegal would infallibly die within a year if he were to cross a river or an arm of the sea. In Mashonaland, down to recent times, the chief would not cross certain rivers, particularly the Ririqui and the Nadriri, and the custom was strictly observed by at least one chief within the last few years. On no account will the chief cross the river. If it is absolutely necessary for him to do so, he is blindfolded and carried across with shouting and singing. Should he walk across, he will go blind or die, and certainly lose the chiefmanship. So among the Mahafalas and Sakalavas of the south of Madagascar, some kings are forbidden to sail on the sea or to cross certain rivers. Horror of the Sea The horror of the sea is not peculiar to kings. The Basutos are said to share it instinctively, though they have never seen salt water, and live hundreds of miles from the Indian Ocean. The Egyptian priests loathed the sea, and called it the foam of Typhon. They were forbidden to set salt on their table, and they would not speak to parts because they got their living by the sea. Hence they too would not eat fish, and the hieroglyphic symbol for hatred was a fish. When the Indians of the Peruvian Andes were sent by the Spaniards to work in the hot valleys of the coast, the vast ocean which they saw before them, as they descended, the Cordillera, was dreaded by them as a cause of disease. Hence they prayed to it they might not fall ill. This they all did without exception, even the little children. Similarly, the inland people of Lampong in Sumatra are said to pay a kind of adoration to the sea, and to make an offering of cakes and sweetmeats when they behold it for the first time, deprecating its power of doing them mischief. Taboos observed by chiefs among the Sakalavas and the hill tribes of Assam. Among the Sakalavas of southern Madagascar, the chief is regarded as a sacred king but he is held in leash by a crowd of restrictions which regulate his behaviour like that of the Emperor of China. He can undertake nothing whatever unless the sorcerers have declared the omens favourable. He may not eat warm food. On certain days he may not quit his hut and so on. Among some of the hill tribes of some, both the headman and his wife, have to observe many taboos in respect of food. Thus they may not eat buffalo, pork, dog, fowl or tomatoes. The headman must be chased, the husband of one wife and he must separate himself from her on the eve of a general or public observance of taboo. In one group of tribes, a headman is forbidden to eat in a strange village, and under no provocation whatever may he utter a word of abuse. Apparently the people imagine that the violation of any of these taboos by a headman would bring down misfortune on the whole village. Taboos observed by Irish kings The ancient kings of Ireland as well as the kings of the four provinces of Leinster, Munster, Connaught, and Ulster, were subject to certain quaint prohibitions or taboos, on the due observance of which this prosperity of the people and the country, as well as their own, was supposed to depend. Thus, for example, the sun might not rise on the king of Ireland in his bed at Tara, the old capital of Erin. He was forbidden to alight on Wednesday at Marbray, to traverse Mar Cullin after sunset, to incite his horse at Fan Comair, to go in a ship upon the water the Monday after Beltane, May Day, and to leave the track of his army upon the Athmain on the Tuesday after All Hallows. The King of Leinster might not go around Torth Lecan, left hand wise on Wednesday, nor sleep between the Dothair, daughter, and the Dublin, with his head inclining on one side, nor encamp for nine days in the plains of Colan, nor travel the road of Dublin on Monday, nor ride a dirty, black-heeled horse across Mar Manstein. The King of Munster was prohibited from enjoying the feast of Loch Lean, from one Monday to another, from banqueting by night in the beginning of harvest before it came at Lake Tarikia, from encamping for nine days upon the Seir, and from holding a border meeting at Gabran. The King of Connaught might not concede a treaty respecting his ancient palace of Kukan, after making peace on All Hallows Day, or go in a speckled garment on a grey speckled steed to the heath of Dalchase, nor repair to an assembly of women at Segays, nor sit in autumn on the sepulchral mound of the wife of Maine, nor content in running with the rider of a grey one-eyed horse at Athgalta between two posts. 
The King of Ulster was forbidden to attend the horse fair at Rathline among the youths of Dal Arraid, to listen to the fluttering of the flocks of birds of Lynn Silek after sunset, to celebrate the feast of the bull of Dare Macdare, to go into Makoba in the month of March, and to drink of the water of Bo Nimed between two darknesses. If the kings of Ireland strictly observed these and many other customs which were enjoined by immemorial usage, it was believed that they would never meet with mischance or misfortune, and would live for ninety years without experiencing the decay of old age, that no epidemic or mortality would occur during their reigns, and that the seasons would be favourable and the earth yield its fruit in abundance, whereas if they set the ancient usages at naught, the country would be visited with plague, famine, and bad weather. Taboos observed by Egyptian kings. The kings of Egypt were worshipped as gods, and the routine of their daily life was regulated in every detail by precise and varying rules. The life of the kings of Egypt, says Doidorus, was not like that of other monarchs who are irresponsible and may do just what they choose. On the contrary, everything was fixed for them by law, and not only their official duties, but even the details of their daily life. The hours both of day and night were arranged at which the king had to do, not what he pleased, but what was prescribed for him. For not only were the times appointed at which he should transact public business or sit in judgment, but the very hours for his walking and bathing and sleeping with his wife, and in short, performing every act of life were all settled. Custom enjoined a simple diet. The only flesh he might eat was veal and goose, and he might only drink a prescribed quantity of wine. However, there is reason to think that these rules were observed, not by ancient pharaohs, but by the priestly kings who reigned at Thebes and in Ethiopia at the close of the 20th dynasty. Among the Carian Nils of Upper Burma, a chief attains his position, not by hereditary right, but on account of his habit of abstaining from rice and liquor. The mother, too, of a candidate for the chieftainship, must have eschewed these things and lived solely on yams and potatoes, so long as she was with child. During that time she may not eat any meat nor drink water from a common well and if a son is to be qualified for the office of chief, he must continue to observe these habits. Taboos observed by the Feynman Deus at Rome Of the taboos imposed on priests, we may see a striking example in the rules of life prescribed for the Feynman Deus at Rome, who has been interpreted as a living image of Jupiter, or a human embodiment of the sky spirit. They were such as the following. The Flamandalis might not ride or even touch a horse, nor see an army under arms, nor wear a ring which was not broken, nor have a knot on any part of his garments. No fire except a sacred fire might be taken out of his house. He might not touch wheat and flour or leavened bread. He might not touch or even name a goat, a dog, raw meat, beans and ivy. He might not walk under a vine. The feet of his bed had to be daubed with mud and his hair could be cut only by a free man and with a bronze knife, and his hair and nails when cut had to be buried under a lucky tree. He might not touch a dead body nor enter a place where one was burned. He might not see work being done on holy days. He might not be uncovered in the open air. A man and bonds were taken into his house, the captive had to be unbound, and the cords to be drawn up through a hole in the roof, and so let down into the street. His wife, the Flaminica, had to observe nearly the same rules, and others of her own besides. She might not ascend more than three steps of the kind of staircase called Greek. At a certain festival, she might not comb her hair. The leather of her shoes might not be made from a beast that had died a natural death, but from only one that had been slain or sacrificed. If she heard thunder, she was tabooed till she had offered an expiatory sacrifice. Taboos observed by the Bodia of Sierra Leone. Among the Grebo people of Sierra Leone, there is a pontiff who bears the title of Bodia, and has been compared on somewhat slender grounds to the high priest of the Jews. He is appointed in accordance with the behest of an oracle, an elaborate ceremony of installation he is anointed, a ring is put on his ankle as a badge of office, and the door posts of his house are sprinkled with the blood of a sacrificed goat. He is charged of the public talismans and idols, which he feeds with rice and oil every new moon, and he sacrifices on behalf of the town to the dead and to demons. Nominally, his power is very great, but in practice it is very limited, for he dare not defy public opinion. 
and he is held responsible even with his life for any adversity that befalls the country. It is expected of him that he should cause you have to bring forth abundantly, the people to be healthy, war to be driven far away, and witchcraft to be kept in abeyance. His life is trammelled by the observance of certain restrictions or taboos, thus he might not sleep in any house but his own official residence, which is called the anointed house, with reference to the ceremony of anointing him at inauguration. He may not drink water on the highway, he may not eat while a corpse is in town, and he may not mourn for the dead. If he dies while he is in office, he must be buried at dead of night. Few may hear of his burial, and none may mourn of him when his death is made public. Should he have fallen victim to the poison of deal by drinking a decoction of sassy wood, as it is called, he must be buried under a running stream of water. Taboos observed by a sacred milkman among the Todas of South India. Among the Todas of Southern India, the holy milkman, Palol, who acts as priest of the sacred dairy, is subject to a variety of irksome and burdensome restrictions during the whole time of his incumbency, which may last many years. Thus he must live at the sacred dairy, and he may never visit his home or any ordinary village. He must be celibate. If he is married, he must leave his wife. On no account may any ordinary person touch the holy milkman or the holy dairy. Such a touch would so defile his holiness that he would forfeit his office. It is only on two days a week, namely Mondays and Thursdays, that a mere layman may even approach the milkman. On other days, if he has any business with him, he must stand at a distance, some say a quarter of a mile, and shout his message across the intervening space. Further, the holy milkman never cuts his hair, or pairs his nails, so long as he holds of us. He never crosses a river by a bridge, but wades through a ford, and only certain fords. If a death occurs in his clan, he may not attend any of the funeral ceremonies, unless he first resigns his office, and descends from the exalted rank of milkman to that of a mere common mortal. Indeed it appears that in old days, he had to resign the seals, or rather the pails, of office, whenever any member of his clan departed this life. However, these heavy restraints are laid in there entirely, and they are milkmen of the very highest class. Among the Todas, there are milkmen and milkmen, and some of them get off more lightly in consideration of their humbler station in life. Still, apart from the dignity they enjoy, the lot even of those other milkmen is not altogether a happy one. Thus, for example, at a place called Canodres, there is a dairy temple of a conical form. The milkman who has charge of it must be celibate during the tenor of his office. He must sleep in the calf's house, a very flimsy structure with an open door and a fireplace that gives little heat. He may only wear one very scanty garment. He must take his meal sitting on the outer wall which surrounds the dairy. In eating he may not put his hand to his lips, but must throw the food into his mouth. And in drinking he may not put to his lips the leaf which serves as a cup. He must tilt his head back and pour the liquid into his mouth, in a jet from above. With the exception of a single layman, who is allowed to bear the milkman company, but who is also bound to celibacy, and has a bed rigged up for him in the calf's house, no other person is allowed to go near this very sacred dairy under any pretext whatever. No wonder that some years ago the dairy was unoccupied, and the office of milkman stood vacant. At the present time, says Dr. Rivers, a dairy man is appointed about once a year, and holds office for thirty or forty days only. So far as I could ascertain, the failure to occupy the dairy constantly is due to the very considerable hardships and restrictions which have to be endured by the holder of the office of dairy man, and the time is probably not far distant when the dairy, one of the most sacred among the Todas, will cease altogether to be used. Section 2. Divorce the Spiritual from the Temporal Power the effect of these burdens and rules was to divorce the temporal from the spiritual authority. The burdensome observances attached to the royal or priestly office produced their natural event. Either men refuse to accept the office, when hence tended to fall into abeyance, or accepting it, they sank under its weight into spiritless creatures, cloistered recluses, from whose nevertheless fingers and reins of government slipped into the firmer grasp of men who were often content to wield the reality of sovereignty without its name. 
In some countries this rift in the supreme power deepened into a total and permanent separation of the spiritual and temporal powers. The old royal house retained their purely religious functions, while the civil government passed into the hands of a younger and more vigorous race. Reluctance to accept sovereignty with its vexatious restrictions. To take examples, in a previous part of this work, we saw that in Cambodia, it is often necessary to force the kingships of fire and water upon the reluctant successors, and that in Savage Island, the monarchy actually came to an end, because, at last, no one could be induced to accept the dangerous distinction. In some parts of West Africa, when the king dies, a family council is secretly held to determine his successor. He on whom the choice falls is suddenly seized, bound, and thrown into the fetish house, where he is kept in durance till he consents to accept the crown. Sometimes the heir finds means of evading the honour which it is sought to thrust upon him. A ferocious chief has been known to go about constantly armed, resolute to resist by force any attempt to set him on the throne. The savage tomes of Sierra Leone, who lack their king, reserve to themselves the right of beating him on the eve of his coronation, and they avail themselves of this constitutional privilege with such hearty goodwill that sometimes the unhappy monarch does not long survive his elevation to the throne. Hence, where the leading chiefs have a spited man and wish to rid themselves of him, they elect him king. For only before a man is proclaimed king of Sierra Leone, it used to be the custom to load him with chains and thrash him. Then the fetters were knocked off, the knightly robe was placed on him, and he received in his hands a symbol of royal dignity, which was nothing but the axe of the executioner. It is not, therefore, surprising to read that in Sierra Leone, where such customs have prevailed, except among the Mandingos, and Suzies, few kings and natives of the countries they are governed. So different are their ideas from ours, that very few are solicitous of the honour, and competition is very seldom heard of. Another writer on Sierra Leone tells us that the honour of reigning so much covetude in Europe is very frequently rejected in Africa on account of the expense attached to it, which sometimes greatly exceeds the revenues of the crown. A reluctance to accept the sovereignty of the Ethiopian kingdom of Gingiro was simulated, if not really felt, as you learn from the old Jesuit missionaries. They wrap up the dead king's body in costly garments, and killing a cow, put it into the hide. Then all those who hope to succeed him, being his sons or others of the royal blood, fly from the honour they covet, abscond, and hide themselves in the woods. This done, the electors, who are all great sorcerers, agree among themselves who shall be king, and go out to seek him, entering the woods by means of their enchantments they say a large bird called leber as big as an eagle came down with mighty cries over the place where he is hid and they find him encompassed by lions tigers snakes and other creatures gathered about him by witchcraft the elect as fierce as those beasts rushes out from those who seek him wounding and sometimes killing some of them to prevent being seized they take all in good part defending themselves the best they can till they have seized him. Thus they carry him away by force, he is still struggling and seeming to refuse taking upon him the burthen of government, which is mere cheat and hypocrisy. Sovereign powers divided between a temporal and a spiritual head. The Mikados of Japan seem merely to have resorted to the expedient of transferring the honours and burdens of supreme power to their infant children, and the rise of the tycoons, Long the temporal sovereigns of the country is traced to the abdication of a certain Mikado in favour of his three-year-old son. The sovereignty having been wrestled from an usurper from the infant prince, the cause of the Mikado was championed by Yoritomo, a man of spirit and conduct, who overthrew the usurper and restored to the Mikado the shadow, while he retained for himself the substance of power. He bequeathed to his descendants the dignity he had won, and thus became the founder of the line of tycoons. Down to the latter half of the 16th century, the tycoons were active and efficient rulers, but the same fate overtook them which had befallen the Mikados. Enmeshed with the same inextricable web of custom and law, they degenerated into mere poets, highly stirring from their palaces and occupied in a perpetual round of empty ceremonies, while the real business of government was managed by the Council of State. In Tonquin, the monarchy ran a similar course. Living like his predecessors in effeminacy and sloth, the king was driven from the throne by an ambitious adventurer named Mac, who, 
from a fisherman, had risen to be Grand Mandurin. But the king's brother, Tring, put down the usurper and restored the king, retaining, however, for himself and his descendants the dignity of general of all the forces. Thenceforward, the king, or Dovas, though invested with the title and pomp of sovereignty, ceased to govern. While they lived secluded in their palaces, all real political power was wielded by the hereditary generals, or Chovas. The present king of Sikkim, like most of his predecessors in the kingship, is a mere puppet in the hands of his crafty priests, who have made a sort of priest king of him. They encourage him by every means in their power to leave the government to them, whilst he devotes all his time to the degrading rites of devil worship and the ceaseless muttering of meaningless jargon of which the Tibetan form of Buddhism chiefly consists. They declare that he is a saint by birth, that he is a direct descent of the greatest king of Tibet, the canonized Strongstan Gumbol, who was the contemporary of Muhammad in the 7th century AD, and who first introduced Buddhism to Tibet. This saintly lineage, which secures for the king's person popular homage amounting to worship, is probably, however, a mere invention of the priests to glorify their puppet prince for their own sordid ends. Such devices are common in the East, the custom regularly observed by the Tahitian kings of abdicating on the birth of a son, who was immediately proclaimed sovereign and received his father's homage, may perhaps have originated, like the similar custom occasionally practiced by the Mikados, on a wish to shift to other shoulders the irksome and burden of royalty. For in Tahiti, as elsewhere, the sovereign was subjugated to a system of vexatious restrictions. In Mangia, another Persian island, religious and civil authority were lodged in separate hands. Spiritual functions being discharged by a line of hereditary kings, while the temporal government was entrusted from time to time to a victorious war chief, whose investiture, however, had to be completed by the king. To the latter were assigned the best lands, and they received daily offerings of the choicest food. The Mikado and Tycoon of Japan had their counterparts in the Rokotui and Funivalo of Fiji. The Rokotui was the reverend or sacred king. The Vunivalu was the root of war, or war king. In one kingdom, a certain Takumbao, who was the war king, kept all power in his own hands, but in a neighbouring kingdom, the real ruler was a sacred king. Similarly, in Tonga, besides the civil king, or Hao, whose right to the throne was partially hereditary and partially derived from his warlike reputation and the number of his fighting men, there was a great divine chief called Twit Tonga, or Chief Tonga, who ranked above the king and the other chiefs in virtue of his supposed descent from one of the chief gods. Once a year the first fruits of the ground were offered to him as a solemn ceremony, and it was believed that if these offerings were not made, the vengeance of the gods would fall in a signal manner on the people. Peculiar forms of speech, such as were, applied to no one else, were used in speaking of him, and everything that he chanced to touch became sacred or tabooed. When he and the king met, the monarch had to sit down on the ground in token of respect until his holiness had passed by, yet though he enjoyed the highest veneration by reason of his divine origin, this sacred personage possessed no political authority, and if he ventured to meddle with affairs of state, it was at the risk of receiving a rebuff from the king, to whom the real power belonged, and who finally succeeded in ridding himself of his spiritual rival. The king of the Gete regularly shared his power with the priest, whom his subjects called a god. This divine man led a solitary life in a cave on a holy mountain, seeing few people but the king and his attendants. His consuls added much to the king's influence with his subjects, who believed that he was thereby enabled to impart to them the commands and admonitions of the gods. At Athens, the kings degenerated into little more than sacred functionaries, and it is said that the institution of the new office of Polmark, or warlord, was rendered necessary by their growing effeminacy. American examples of the partition of authority between a king and a pope have already been cited from the early history of Mexico and Colombia. Fetish Kings and Civil Kings in West Africa In some parts of Western Africa, two kings reign side by side, a fetish or religious king and a civil king, but the fetish king is really supreme. He controls the weather and so forth, and can put a stop to everything. When he lays his red staff on the ground, 
no one may pass that way. This division of power between a sacred and a secular ruler is to be met wherever the true Negro culture has been left unmolested. But where the Negro form of society has been disturbed, as in Dahomey and Ashanti, there is a tendency to consolidate the two powers in a single king. Thus, for example, there used to be a fetish king at New Calabar, who ranked above the ordinary king in all native matters, whether religious or civil, and always walked in front of him on public occasions, attended by a slave, who held an umbrella over his head. His opinion carried great weight. The office and the causes which led to its extinction are thus described by a missionary who spent many years in Calabar. The worship of the people is now given especially to their various items, one of which, named Nadem Mefik, is a sort of tutelary deity of the country. An individual was appointed to take charge of this object of worship, who bore the name of King Calabar, and likely, in by past times, possessed the power indicated by the title, being both king and priest. He had as a tribute the skins of all leopards killed, and should a slave take refuge in his shrine, he belonged to the team ethic. The office, however, imposed certain restrictions on his occupant. He, for instance, could not partake of food in the presence of any one, and he was prohibited from engaging in traffic. On account of these and other disabilities, when the last hold of the office died, a poor man of the Cobham family, no success was found for him, and the priests would have become extinct. One of the practical inconveniences of such an office is that the house of the fetish king enjoys the right of sanctuary, and so tends to become little better than a rookery of bad characters. Thus on the grand coast of West Africa, the fetish king, or Bodio, as he is called, exercises the functions of a high priest, as regarded as protector of the whole nation. He lives in a house provided for him by the people, and takes care of the national fetishes. He enjoys some immunities in virtue of his office, but is subject to certain restrictions which more than counterbalance his privileges. His house is a sanctum to which culprits may betake themselves without the danger of being removed by any one except by the Bodio himself. One of the Bodios resigned office because of the sort of people who quartered themselves on him, the cost of feeding them, and the squalls they had among themselves. He led a cat and dog life with them for three years. Then there came a man with homicidal mania, varied by epileptic fits, and soon afterwards the spiritual shepherd retired into private life, but not before he had lost an ear and sustained other bodily injury in a personal conflict with this very black sheep. The King of the Night At Porto Novo there used to be, in addition to the ordinary monarch, a King of the Night, who reigned during the hours of darkness from sunset to sunrise. He might not show himself in the street after the sun was up. His duty was to patrol the streets with his satellites and to restore whom he found abroad after a certain hour. Each band of his catchpoles was led by a man who went about concealed from head to foot under a conical casing of straw and blue blasts on a show which caused every one that heard it to shudder. The king of the night never met the ordinary king, except on the first and last days of their respective reign. For each of them invested the other with office, and paid him the last honours at death. With the king of the night at Porto Novo, we may compare a certain king of Hawaii, who was so very sacred that no man might see him, even accidentally, by day under pain of death. He only showed himself by night. Civil Rajas and Taboo Rajas in the East Indies In some parts of the East Indian island of Timor, we meet with a partition of power like that which is represented by the civil king and the fetish king of Western Africa. Some of the Timorese tribes recognize two rajas, the ordinary or civil raja, who governs the people, and the fetish or taboo raja, Raja Panali, who is charged with the control of everything that concerns the earth and its products. This latter ruler has the right of declaring anything taboo. His permission must be obtained before new land may be brought under cultivation, and he must perform certain necessary ceremonies when the work is being carried out. If drought or blight threatens the crops, his help is invoked to save them. Though he ranks below the civil raja, he exercises a momentous influence on the course of events, for his secular colleague is bound to consult him in all important matters. In some of the neighbouring islands, such as Roti and Eastern Flores, 
a spiritual ruler of the same sort is recognized under various native names, which all mean Lord of the Ground. Similarly, in the Mekio district of British New Guinea, there is a double chieftainship. The people are divided into two groups according to families, and each of the groups has its chief. One of the two is a war chief, the other is the taboo, a full chief. The office of the latter is hereditary. His duty is to impose a taboo on any of the crops, such as the coconuts and areca nuts, whenever he thinks it desirable to prohibit their use. In his office we may perhaps detect the beginning of a priestly dynasty, but as yet his functions appear to be more magical than religious, being concerned with the control of the harvest rather than with the probitation of higher powers. The members of another family are bound to see it that the taboo imposed by their chief is strictly observed. For this purpose, some fourteen or fifteen men of the family form a sort of constabulary. Every evening they go round the village armed with clubs and disguised with masks or leaves. All the time they are in office, they are forbidden to live with their wives and even to look at a woman. Hence women may not quit their houses while the men are going their rounds. Further, the constables on duty are prohibited from chewing betel nut and drinking coconut water, lest the areca and coconuts should not grow. Where there is a good show of nuts, the taboo chief proclaims that on a certain day the restriction will come to an end. In Ponape, one of the Caroline Islands, the kingship is elective within the limits of the blood royal, which runs in the female line, so that the sovereign passes backwards and forwards between families which we, reckoning descent in the male line, should regard as distinct. The chosen monarch must be in possession of certain secrets. He must know the places where the sacred stones are kept on which he has to seat himself. He must understand the holy words and prayers of the liturgy, and after his election, he must recite them at the place of the sacred stones. But he enjoys only the hours of his office. The real powers of government are in the hands of his prime minister of his year. End of section one. Section two of the Golden Bell, a study in magic and religion. Part two, Taboo and the Perils of the Soul, by Sir James George Fraser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2, Part 1. The Perils of the Soul. Section 1. The Soul as a Mannequin. What is the primitive conception of death? The foregoing examples have taught us that the office of a sacred king or priest is often hedged in by a series of burdensome restrictions or taboos, of which a principal purpose appears to be to preserve the life of the divine man for the good of his people. But if the object of the taboos is to save his life, the question arises, how is our observance supposed to effect this end? To understand this, we must know the nature of the danger which threatens the king's life, and which it is the intention of these curious restrictions to guard against. We must therefore ask, what does early man understand by death? To what cause does he attribute it? And how does he think it may be guarded against? Savages conceive the human soul as a mannequin, the prolonged abstinence of which from the body causes death. As the savage commonly explains the process of inanimate nature by supposing that they are produced by living beings working in or behind the phenomena, so he explains the phenomena of life itself. If an animal lives and moves, it can only be, he thinks, because there is a little animal inside which moves it. If a man lives and moves, it can only be because he has a little man or animal inside who moves him. The animal inside the animal the man inside the man is the soul, and as the activity of the animal or man is explained by the presence of the soul, so the repose of sleep or death is explained by its absence. Sleep or trance being the temporary, death being the permanent absence of the soul. Hence if death be the permanent absence of the soul, the way to guard against it is either to prevent the soul from leaving the body, or if it does not depart, to ensure that it shall return. The precautions adopted by savages to secure one or other of these ends take the form of certain prohibitions or taboos 
which are nothing but rules intended to ensure either the continued presence or the return of the soul. In short, they are life preservers or lifeguards. These general statements will now be illustrated by examples. The soul is a mannequin in Australia, America, and among the Malays. Addressing some Australian blacks, a European missionary said, I am not one, as you think, but two. Upon this they laughed. You may laugh as much as you like, continued the missionary. I tell you that I am two and one. This great body that you see is one. Within that there is another little one which is not visible. The great body dies and is buried, but the little body flies away when the great one dies. To this some of the blacks replied, Yes, yes, we also are two. We also have a little body within our breast. One being asked where the little body went after death, some said it went behind the bush, others said it went into the sea, and some said they did not know. The Hurons thought that the soul had a head and body, arms and legs, in short that it was a complete little model of the man himself. The Eskimos believed that the soul exhibits the same shape as the body it belongs to, but is of a more subtle and ethereal nature. According to the Nuktas of British Columbia, the soul has the shape of a tiny man. Its seat is in the crown of the head. So long as it stands erect, its owner is hale and hearty. When from any cause it loses its upright position, he loses his senses. Among the Indian tribes of the lower Fraser River, man is held to have four souls, of which the principal one has the form of a mannequin, while the other three are shadows of it. The Malays can see the human soul, seven gats, as a little man, mostly invisible and of the bigness of a thumb, who corresponds exactly in shape, proportion, and even in complexion to the man in whose body he resides. The mannequin is of a thin, unsubstantial nature, though not so impalpable, but that it may cause displacement on entering a physical object, and it can flit quickly from place to place. It is temporarily absent from the body in sleep, trance and disease, and permanently absent after death. The soul is a mannequin in ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians believed that every man has a soul, ka, which is his exact counterpart or double, with the same features, the same gait, even the same dress as the man himself. Many of the monuments dating from the 18th century onwards represent various kings appearing before divinities, while behind the king stands his soul or double, portrayed as little man with the king's features. Some of the reliefs in the temple at Luxor illustrate the birth of King Amenophis III, while the Queen Mother is being tended by two goddesses acting as midwives, two other goddesses are bringing away two figures of newborn children, only one of which is supposed to be a child of flesh and blood. The inscriptions engraved above their heads show that, while the first is Amenophis, the second is his soul or double. And as with kings and queens, so it was with common men and women. Whenever a child was born, there was born with him a double, which followed him through the various stages of life. Young while he was young, it grew to maturity and declined along with him. And not only human beings, but gods and animals, stones and trees, natural and artificial objects, everybody and everything had its own soul double. The doubles of oxen and sheep were the duplicates of the original oxen or sheep. The doubles of linen or beds, of chairs or knives, had the same form as a real linen, beds, chairs and knives. So thin and subtle was the stuff, so fine and delicate the texture of these doubles, that they made no impression on ordinary eyes. Only certain classes of priests or seers were enabled by natural gifts or special training to perceive the doubles of the gods, and to win from them a knowledge of the past and the future. The doubles of men and things were hidden from sight in the ordinary course of life. Still, they sometimes flew out of the body endowed with colour and voice, left in a kind of trance, and departed to manifest themselves at a distance. The soul was a mannequin in Naos, Fiji and India. So exact is the resemblance of the mannequin to the man, in other words, of the soul to the body, that, as there are fat bodies and thin bodies, so there are fat souls and thin souls. As there are heavy bodies and light bodies, long bodies and short bodies, 
so there are heavy souls and light souls, long souls and short souls. The people of Nias, an island to the west of Sumatra, think that every man, before he is born, is asked how long or how heavy a soul he would like, and the soul that desired weight or length is measured out on him. The heaviest soul ever given out weighs about 10 grams. The length of a man's life is proportioned to the length of his soul. Children who die young have short souls. The Virginian conception of the soul as a tiny human being comes clearly out of the custom observes at the death of a chief among the Nakilo tribe. When a chief dies, certain men, who are the hereditary undertakers, call him as he lies, oiled and ornamented, on the fine mat, saying, Rise, sir, the chief, and let us be going. The day has come over the land. Then they conduct him to the riverside, where the ghostly ferryman comes to ferry Nakelo ghosts across the stream. As they thus attend the chief of his last journey, they hold their great fans close to the ground, to shelter him, because, as one of them explained to a missionary, his soul is only a little child. People in the Punjab who tattoo themselves believe that at death the soul, the entire little man or woman, inside the mortal frame, will go to heaven blazoned with the same tattoo patterns which adorned the body and life. Sometimes, however, as we shall see, the human soul is conceived not in human, but in animal form. Section 2. Abstinence and Recall of the Soul Attempts to Prevent the Soul from Escaping from the Body The soul is commonly supposed to escape by the natural openings of the body, especially the mouth and nostrils. And since the leaves, they sometimes fasten fish hooks to a sick man's nose, navel and feet so that if his soul should try to escape, it may be hooked and held fast. A Turek on the Baram River in Borneo refused to part with some hook-like stones, because they, as it were, hooked his soul to his body, and so prevented the spiritual portion of him from being detached from the material. When a sea dyak sorcerer or medicine man is initiated, his fingers are supposed to be furnished with fish hooks, with which he will thereafter clutch the human soul in the act of flying away and restore it to the body of the sufferer. But hooks, it is plain, may be used to catch the souls of enemies as well as of friends. Acting on this principle, headhunters in Borneo hang wooden hooks beside the skulls of their slain enemies, in the belief that this helps them with their forays to hook in fresh heads. When an epidemic is raging, the Guajiro Indians of Colombia attribute to an evil spirit. It may be the prowling ghost of an enemy. So they hang strings furnished with hooks from the roofs of their huts, and from all the trees in the neighbourhood, in order that the demon or ghost may be caught on a hook, and thus rendered powerless to harm them. Similarly, the Cauchiquiz Indians to the west of Paraguay used to plant arrows in the ground about a sick man to keep death from getting at him. Attempts to prevent the soul from escaping the body One of the implements of the Haida medicine man is a hollow bone, in which he bottles up the departing souls, and so restores them to their owners. When any one yawns in their presence, the Hindus always snap their thumbs, believing this will hinder the soul from issuing through the open mouth. The Marquesans used to hold the mouth and nose of a dying man, in order to keep him in life by preventing his soul from escaping. The same custom is reported of the New Caledonians, and with a like intention, the Bagobos of the Philippine Islands put rings of brass wire on the wrists or ankles of their sick. On the other hand, the Etonomans of South America seal up the eyes, nose, and mouth of a dying person in case his ghost should get out and carry off others. And for a similar reason, the people of Naias, who feared the spirits of the recently deceased and identified them with the breath, seek to confine the vagrant soul in its earthly tabernacle by bungling up the nose or tying up the jaws of the corpse. Before leaving a corpse, the Wakalbura in Australia used to place hot coals in its ears in order to keep the ghost in the body, until they had got such a good start that he could not overtake them. Eskimo mourners plug their nostrils with deer skin, hair, or hay for several days, probably to prevent their souls from following that of their departed friend. The custom is especially incumbent in the persons who dress the corpse. Tying the soul in the body. In southern Salibs, to hinder the escape of a woman's soul at childbirth, the nurse ties a band as tightly as possible round the body of the expected mother. 
The Minangkabauers of Sumatra observe a similar custom. A skin of thread or a string is sometimes fastened round the wrist or loins of a woman in childbirth, so that when her soul seeks to depart in her hour of travail, it may find the egress barred. Among the Cayennes of Borneo, illness is attributed to the absence of the soul. So when a man has been ill and is well again, he attempts to prevent his soul from departing afresh. For this purpose, he ties the taunt into the body by fastening round his wrist a piece of string on which a lucat or antique bed is threaded, for a magical virtue appears to be ascribed to such beads. But lest the string and the bead should be broken and lost, he will sometimes tattoo the pattern of the bead on his wrist, and this is found to answer the purpose of tethering his soul quite as well. Again, the Koryak of northeastern Asia fancy that if there are two sick people in a house and one of them is at the last extremity, the soul of the other is apt to be lured away by the soul of the dying man. Hence, in order to hinder its departure, they tie the patient's neck by a string to the bands of the sleeping tent and recite a charm over the string so that it may be sure to detain the soul. Unless the soul of a babe should escape, and be lost as soon as is born. The old fours of Zalibs, when a birth is about to take place, are careful to close every opening in the house, even the keyhole, and they stop up every chink and cranny in the walls. Also they tie up the mouths of all the animals inside and outside the house, for fear one of them might swallow the child's soul. For a similar reason all persons present in the house, even the mother herself, are obliged to keep their mouths shut the whole time the birth is taking place. When the question was put why they did not hold their noses also, lest the child's soul should get into one of them, the answer was that breath being exhaled as well as inhaled through the nostrils, the soul would be expelled before it would have time to settle down. Popular expressions in the language of civilized peoples, such as to have one's heart in one's mouth, or the soul on the lips or in the nose, show how natural is the idea that a life of soul may escape by the mouth or nostrils. The soul as a bird. Often the soul is conceived as a bird, ready to take flight. This conception has probably left traces in most languages, and it lingers as a metaphor in poetry. The soul conceived as a bird, ready to fly away. But what is metaphor to a modern European poet was sober earnest to his savage ancestor, and is still so to many people. The Bororos of Brazil fancy that the human soul has the shape of a bird, and passes in that shape out of the body in dreams. According to the Bilquala, or Belacula Indians of British Columbia, the soul dwells in the nape of the neck and resembles a bird enclosed in an egg. If the shell breaks and the soul flies away, the man must die. If he swoons or becomes crazed, it is because his soul has flown away without breaking its shell. The shaman can hear the buzzing of its wings, like the buzz of a mosquito as the soul flies past, and he may catch and replace it in the nape of its owner's neck. A Melanesian wizard in Lepers Island has been known to send out his soul in the form of an eagle to pursue a ship and learn the fortunes of some natives who were being carried off in it. The soul of Aristius of Proconesus was sent to issue from his mouth in the shape of a raven. There is a popular opinion in Bohemia that the parting soul comes forth from the mouth like a white bird. The Malays carry off the conception of the bird's soul in a number of odd ways. If the soul is a bird on the wing, it may be attracted by rice, and so either prevented from taking wing, or lured back again from its perilous flight. Thus in Java, when a child is placed on the ground for the first time, a moment which uncultured people seem to regard as especially dangerous, it is put in a hen coop, and the mother makes a clucking sound, as if she were calling hens. Amongst the Batas of Sumatra, when a man returns from a dangerous enterprise, grains of rice are placed on his head, and these grains are called Badiroma Tondi, that is, means to make the soul Tondi stay at home. In Java also rice is placed on the head of persons who have escaped a great danger or returned home unexpectedly after it has been supposed that they were lost. Similarly, in the district of Sintang in West Borneo, if any one has a great fright, or has escaped a serious peril, or comes back after a long and dangerous journey, or has taken a solemn oath, 
first thing that his relations or friends do is to strew yellow rice on his head, mumbling, cluck cluck soul, koel kur simangat. And when a person, whether man, woman or child, has fallen out of a house or off a tree, and has been brought home, his wife or other kinswoman goes as speedily as possible to the spot where the accident happened, and there strews rice, which has been coloured yellow, while she utters the words, cluck cluck soul, so and so in this house again. Cluck cluck soul. Then she gathers up the rice in a basket, carries it to the sufferer, and drops the grains from her hand on his head, saying, Cluck, cluck, soul. Here the intention clearly is to decoy back the lord in bird's soul and place it in the head of its owner. In southern Salibs they think that a bridegroom's soul is apt to fly away at marriage, so coloured rice is scattered over him to induce it to stay. And in general, at festivals in south Salibs, rice is strewn on the head of the person in whose honour the festival is held, and the object of detaining his soul which at such times is in a special danger of being lured away by envious demons. For example, after a successful war, the welcome of the vicious prince takes the form of stirring him with roasted and cold rice to prevent his life spirit, as if it were a bird, from flying out of his body in consequence of the envy of evil spirits. In central Salibs, when a party of headhunters returns from a successful expedition, a woman scatters rice on their heads for a similar purpose. Among the Minankaboers of Sumatra, the old, rude notions of the soul seem to be dying out. Nowadays, most of the people hold that the soul, being immaterial, has no shape or form. But some of the sorcerers assert that the soul goes and comes in the shape of a tiny man. Others are of opinion that it does so in the form of a fly, hence they make food ready to induce the absent soul to come back, and the first fly that settles on the food is regarded as the returning trot. But in native poetry, and public expressions, there are traces of the belief that the soul quits the body in the form of a bird. The soul is supposed to be absent at sleep. The soul of a sleeper is supposed to wander away from his body, and actually to visit the places, to see the persons, and to perform the acts of which he dreams. For example, when an Indian of Brazil, of Guiana, wakes up from a sound sleep, he is firmly convinced that his soul has really been away hunting, fishing, felly trees, whatever else he has dreamed of doing, while all the time his body has been lying motionless in his hammock. And while Bororo village has been thrown into a panic, and nearly deserted because somebody has dreamed that he saw enemies stealthily approaching it. A Makusi Indian in weak health, who dreamed that his employer had made him haul the canoe up a series of difficult cataracts, bitterly reproached his master the next morning, for this want of consideration, and thus making a poor invalid grad and tall during the night. The Indians of the Grand Chaco are often heard to relate the most incredible stories as things which they have themselves seen and heard. Hence traders who do not know them intimately say in their haste that these Indians are liars. The point of fact the Indians are firmly convinced of the truth of what they relate, for these wonderful adventures are simply their dreams, which they do not distinguish from waking realities. The soul absent in sleep may be prevented from returning to the body. Now the absence of the soul in sleep has its dangers, for if any cause the soul should be permanently detained away from the body, the person thus deprived of the vital principle must die. There is a German belief that the soul escapes from a sleeper's mouth in the form of a white mouse or a little bird, and that to prevent the return of the bird or animal would be fatal to the sleeper. Hence in Transylvania, they say that you should not let a child sleep with its mouth open, or its soul will slip out in the shape of a mouse, and the child will never wake. Many causes may detain the sleeper's soul. Thus his soul may meet the soul of another sleeper, and the two souls may fight. If a guinea negro wakes with sore bones in the morning, he thinks that his soul has been thrashed by another soul in sleep. Or it may meet the soul of a person just deceased and be carried off by it. Hence the Yaru Islands, the inmates of a house, will not sleep the night after a death has taken place in it, because the soul of the deceased is supposed to be still in the house and they fear to meet it in a dream. Similarly, among the upper Thompson Indians of British Columbia, the friends and neighbours who gathered in a house after a death and remained there till the burial was over were not allowed to sleep, lest their souls should be drawn away by the ghost 
of the deceased or by his guardian spirit. The Lengua Indians of the Grand Chuckle hold that the vagrant spirits of the dead may come to life again, if only they can take possession of a sleeper's body during the absence of his soul and dreams. Hence, when the shades of night have fallen, the ghosts that departed gather round the villages, watching for a chance to pound on the bodies of dreamers and to enter into them through the gateway of the breast. Again, the soul of the sleeper may be prevented by an accident or by physical force from returning to his body. When a dyak dreams of falling into the water, he supposes that this accident has really befallen his spirit, and he sends for the wizard, who fishes for the spirit with a hand net in a basin of water till he catches it and restores it to his owner. The Santels tell how a man fell asleep, and growing very thirsty, his soul in the form of a lizard left his body and entered a pitcher of water to drink. Just then the owner of the pitcher happened to cover it, so the soul could not return to the body and the man died. While his friends were preparing to burn the body, someone uncovered the pitcher to get water. The lizard thus escaped and returned to the body, which immediately revived. So the man rose up and asked his friends why they were weeping. They told him they thought he was dead and were about to burn his body. He said he had been down a well to get water, but had found it hard to get out and had just returned. So they saw it all. A similar story is reported from Transylvania as follows. In the account of witch's trial at Malbach, in the 18th century, it is said that a woman had engaged two men to work in her vineyard. Afternoon they all lay down to rest as usual. An hour later the men got up and tried to waken the woman, but could not. She lay motionless with her mouth wide open. They came back at sunset and still she lay like a corpse. Just at the moment a big fly came buzzing past, which one of the men caught and shut up in his leathern pouch. Then they tried again to awaken the woman, but could not. Afterwards they let out the fly, if they straightened the woman's mouth, and she awoke. On seeing this, the men had no further doubt that she was a witch. Danger of awakening a sleeper suddenly before his soul has time to return. It is a common rule with primitive people not to awaken a sleeper, because his soul is away and might not have time to get back. So if the man wakened without his soul... He would fall sick. If it is absolutely necessary to rouse a sleeper, it must be done very gradually to allow the soul time to return. A Fijian Imatuku, suddenly wakened from a nap by somebody treading on his foot, has been heard bawling after his soul and imploring it to return. He had just been dreaming that he was far away in Tonga, and great was his alarm on suddenly awakening to find his body in Matuku. Death stared him in the face unless his soul could be induced to speed at once across the sea and reanimate its deserted tenement. The man would probably have died of fright if a missionary had not been at hand to allay his terror. Some Brazilian Indians explain the headache from which a man somehow suffers after a broken sleep by saying that his soul is tired with the exertions it made to return quickly to the body. A Highland story told to Hugh Miller on the picturesque shores of Loch Shin well illustrates the haste made by the soul to regain its body when the sleeper has been prematurely roused by an indiscreet friend. Two young men had been spending the early part of a warm summer day in the open air and sat down on a mossy bank to rest. Hard by was an ancient ruin separated from the bank on which they sat only by a slender runnel, across which there lay, immediately over a miniature cascade, a few withered stalks of grass. Overcome by the heat of the day, one of the young men fell asleep. His companion watched drowsily beside him, when all at once the watcher was aroused to attention by seeing a little indiscreet form, scarcely larger than a humble bee, issue from the mouth of the sleeping man, and leaping upon the moss, moved downwards to the runnel, where it crossed under the withered grass stalks, and then disappeared among the indices of the ruin. Alarmed by what he saw, the watcher hastily shook his companion by the shoulder and awoke him. Though with all his haste, the little cloud-like creature, still more rapid in its movements, issued from the interstices into which it had gone, and flying across the runnel, instead of creeping along the grass stalks, and over the sward, as before it re-entered the mouth of the sleeper, just as he was in the act of awakening. "'What is the matter with you?' said the watcher, greatly alarmed. "'What ails you?' "'Nothing ails me,' replied the other. "'But you have brought me a most delightful dream.' "'I dreamed I was walking through a fine, rich country,' and came at length to the shores of a noble river, and just where the river water was thundering 
down a precipice, there was a bridge, all of silver, which I crossed, and then entering a noble palace on the opposite side, I saw great heaps of gold and jewels, and I was just going to load myself with treasure when you really awoke me, and I lost all. Danger of moving a sleeper or alerting his appearance. Still more dangerous is it, in the opinion of primitive man, to move a sleeper or alter his appearance. If this were done, the soul on its return might not be able to find or recognize its body, and so the person would die. The men and cabellers of Sumatra deem it highly improper to blacken or dirty the face of a sleeper, lest the absent soul should shrink from re entering a body thus disfigured. Bretani Malays fancy that if a person's face be painted while he sleeps, the soul which has gone out of him will not recognize him, and he will not sleep on till his face is washed. In Bombay, it is thought equivalent to murder to change the aspect of a sleeper, as by painting his face in fantastic colors or giving moustaches to a sleeping woman. For when the soul returns, it will not know its own body, and the person will die. The Koreans are of opinion that in sleep the soul goes out of the body, and that if a piece of paper is put over the face of the sleeper, he will surely die, for his soul cannot find his way back into him again. The Servians believe that the soul of a sleeping witch often leaves her body in the form of a butterfly. If during its absence her body be turned round, so that her feet are placed where her head was before, the butterfly's soul will not find its way back into her body through the mouth, and the witch will die. Danger of moving the body of a sleeper The Estonians of the island of Oeso think that the gusts would sweep up all kinds of trivials from the ground and whirl them along other souls of old women have gone out in this shape to seek what they can find. Meantime, the beldame's body lies as still as a stone, and if you turn it round, her soul will never be able to enter it again, until you have replaced the body in its original position. You can hear the soul whining and whimpering until it has found the right aperture. Similarly, Ilivonia, they think that when the soul of a werewolf is out on his hateful business, his body lies like dead, and if meanwhile the body were accidentally moved, the soul would never find its way into it, but would remain in the body of a wolf till death. In the picturesque but little-known black mountain of southern France, which forms a sort of link between the Pyrenees and the Savines, they tell how a woman, who has long been suspect of being a witch, one day fell asleep at noon among the reapers in the field, resolved to put her to the test. The reapers carried her, while she slept, to another part of the field, leaving a large pitcher on the spot from which they had moved her. When her soul returned, it entered the pitcher, and cunningly rolled it over and over, till the vessel lay beside her body, of which the soul thereupon took possession. The soul may quit the body in waking hours, thereby causing sickness, insanity, or death. But in order that a man's soul should quit his body, it is not necessary that he should be asleep. It may quit him in his waking hours, and then sickness, insanity, or death will be the result. Thus a man, of the Wurundjeri tribe in Victoria, lay at his last gasp because his spirit, Merup, had departed from him. A medicine man went in pursuit and caught the spirit by the middle, just as it was about to plunge into the sunset glow, which is a light cast by the souls of the dead as they pass in and out of the underworld, where the sun goes to rest. Recalling Traunt Souls in Australia, Burma, China, and Sarawak Having captured the vagrant spirit, the doctor brought it back under his opossum rug, laid himself down on the dying man, and put the soul back into him, so that after a time he revived. The Karens of Burma are perpetually anxious about their souls, lest these should go roving from their bodies, leaving their owners to die. When a man has reason to fear that his soul is about to take this fatal step, a ceremony is performed to retain or recall it, in which the whole family must take part. A meal is prepared consisting of a cock and a hen, a special kind of rice and a bunch of bananas. Then the head of the family takes a bowl which is used to skim rice, and knocking with it thrice on the top of the house ladder says, Prue, come back, soul, do not tarry outside. If it rains, you will be wet. If the sun shines, you will be hot. The gnats will sting you. The leeches will bite you. The tigers will devour you. The thunder will crush you. Prue, come back, soul. Here it will be well with you, you shall want for nothing. Come and eat under shelter from the wind and the storm. 
After that, the family partakes of the meal, and the ceremony ends with everybody tying their right wrist with a string, which has been charmed by a sorcerer. Similarly, the Lulus, an Aboriginal tribe of Western China, believe that the soul leaves the body in a chronic illness. In that case, they read a sort of elaborate litany, calling on the soul by name, and beseeching it to return from the hills, the vales, the rivers, the forests, the fields, or from wherever it may be staying. At the same time, cups of water, wine and rice are set at the door for the refreshment of the weary wandering spirit. When the ceremony is over, they tie a red cord round the arm of the sick man to tether the soul, and this cord is worn by him until it decays and drops off. So among the Kenyas of Sarawak, a medicine man has been known to recall the stray soul of a child and to fasten that firmly in his body by tying a string round the child's right wrist and smearing its little arm with the blood of a fowl. Recalling Torrance Souls in Luzon and Mongolia The Urukanes of Luzon think that a man may lose his soul in the woods or gardens, and that he who has thus lost his soul loses all his senses, and so before they quit the woods or the fields they call to their soul, let us go, let us go lest they should loiter behind or go astray. And when a man becomes crazed or mad, they take him to the place where he is supposed to have lost his soul and invite the truant spirit to return to his body. The Mongols sometimes explain sickness by supposing that the patient's soul is absent, either does not care to return to its body or cannot find the way back. To secure the return of the soul, it is therefore necessary, on the one hand, to make its body as attractive as possible, and on the other hand, to show the soul the way home. To make the body attractive, all the sick man's best clothes and most valued possessions are placed beside him. He is washed, incensed, and made as comfortable as may be, and all his friends march thrice round the hut, calling out the sick man's name and coaxing his soul to return. To help the wanderer to find its way back, a coloured cord is stretched from the patient's head to the door of the hut. The priest in his robes reads a list of the horrors of hell and the dangers incurred by souls which willfully absent themselves from their bodies. Then turning to the assembled friends and the patient, he asks, Is it come? All answer yes, and bowing to the returning soul, throws seed over the sick man. The cord which guided the soul back is then rolled up and placed around the patient's neck, who must wear it for seven days without taking it off. No one may fight or not hurt him, lest his soul, not yet familiar with its body, should again take flight. Recalling Torrent Souls in Africa and America some of the Congo tribes believe that when a man is ill, his soul has left his body and is wandering at large. The aid of the sorcerers and called in to capture the vagrant spirit and restore it to the invalid. Generally, the physician declares that he has successfully chased the soul into the branch of a tree. The whole town thereupon turns out and accompanies the doctor to the tree, where the strongest men are deputed to break off the branch to which the soul of the sick man is supposed to be lodged. This they do and carry the branch back to the town, insinuating by their gestures that the burden is heavy and hard to bear. When the branch has been brought to the sick man's hut, he is placed in an upright position by its side, and the sorcerer performs the enchantments by which the soul is believed to be restored to its owner. The soul or shade of a din, or tine, Indian, in the old days generally remained invisible, but appeared wandering about in one form or another whenever disease or death was imminent. All the efforts of the sufferer's friends were thereupon concentrated on catching the roving shade. The method adopted was simple. They stuffed the patient's moccasins with down and hung them up. Even next morning the down was warm, they made sure that the lost soul was in the boots, with which, accordingly, they carefully and silently shod their suffering friend. Nothing more could reasonably be demanded for a perfect cure. An Ottawa medicine man has been known to catch a stray soul in a little box which he brought back and inserted in the patient's mouth. Recalling Torrance Souls in Sumatra Pinning, sickness, great fright and death are ascribed by the Batas or Bataks of Sumatra to the absence of the soul, Tendi, from the body. At first they tried to beckon the wanderer back and to lure him, like a fowl, by stewing rice. Then the following form of words is commonly repeated. Come back, O soul, whether thou art lingering in the wood, or on the hills, or in the dale. See, I call thee with Tiomba Braz, with an egg of the foul Raja Molija, with the eleven healing leaves. Detain it not. Let it come straight here. 
detain not, neither in the wood, nor on the hill, nor in the dale. That may not be. O oh, come straight home. Sometimes the means adopted by the batters to procure the return of a sick person's soul are more elaborate. A procession sets out from the village to the tuck of drum to find and bring home the straight soul. First goes a person bearing a basket which contains casks of rice meal, rice dyed yellow, and a boiled fowl's egg. The sorcerer follows carrying a chicken, and behind him walks a man with a black, red, and white flag. A crowd of sympathizers brings up the rear. Orishing the spot where the lost soul was supposed to tarry, they set up a small bamboo altar, and the sorcerer offers on it the chicken to the spirit of the place. The drum is beating all the time. Then waving his shawl to attract the soul of the sick man, he says, Come hither, the soul of so-and-so, whether thou sittest among the stones or in the mud. In the house is thy place. We have besought the spirit and let thee go. After that, the procession reforms and marches back to the village, to the roll of drums and the clash of cymbals. On reaching the door of the house, the sorcerer calls out to the inmates. As they come, and a voice from within answers, He is here, good sorcerer. At evening, the drums beat again. A number of plants, including rice, a species of fig and garlic, are supposed by the batters to possess soul-compelling virtue and are accordingly made use of by them in rites for the recovery of lost souls. When the child is sick, the mother calmly wears a cloth to beckon home its wandering spirit. When a cock crows or a hen cackles in the yard, she knows that the prodigal has returned. And the little sufferer persists in being ill in spite of these favourable omens. The mother will hang a bag of rice at the head of her bed when she goes to sleep. And the next morning, on getting up, she measures the rice. If the rice has increased in volume during the night, as it may do in a moisture laden atmosphere, she is confident that the lost soul has indeed come home to stay. Recalling Trant Souls in Borneo The Cayans of Borneo fasten packers of rice, flesh, and fish to the widow in the roof through which the wandering soul of a sick man is expected to return home. The doctor sits cross-legged on a mat under the open window, with a display of pretty things spread out temptingly before him as baits to entice a spirit back to its deserted tabernacle. From the window hangs a string of precious corals of pearls to serve the returning prodigal as a ladder and to facilitate his descent into the house. The lower end of the string is attached to a bundle composed of wooden hooks, a fowl's feather, little packets of rice, and so forth. Chanting his spells, the doctor strokes the soul down the string into the bundle, which he then deposits in a basket and hides in a corner till the dusk of the evening. When darkness has fallen, he blows the captured souls back into the patient's head, and strokes the sufferer's arm downwards with a point of an old spear in order to settle the soul firmly in his body. Once when a popular traveller was leaving a canyon village, the mothers, fearing that their children's souls might follow him on his journey, brought him the boards on which they carry their infants, and begged him to pray that the souls of the little ones would return to their familiar boards and not go away with him into the far country. To each board was fastened a looped string for the purpose of tethering the vagrant spirits, and through the loop each baby was made to pass a chubby finger to make sure that its tiny soul would not wander away. When a dyak is dangerously ill, the medicine man may say that his soul has escaped far away, perhaps to the river. Then they will wave a garment or cloth about to imitate the casting of a net, signifying thereby that they are catching the soul like a fish in a net. Or they may give out that the soul has escaped into the jungle, and then they will rush out of the house to circumvent and secure it there. Or again, they may allege that it has been carried away overseas to some unknown land, and then they will play at paddling a boat to follow it across the great water. But more commonly, their mode of treatment is as follows. A spear is set up in the middle of the veranda, with a few leaves tied to it, and the medicine boxes of the medicine men laid at its foot. Round this the doctors run at full speed, chanting the while till one of them falls down and lies motionless. The bystanders cover him with a blanket and wait while his spirit hies away after the errant soul and brings it back. Presently he comes to himself, stares vacantly about like a man awakening from sleep, then rises, holding the soul in his clenched right hand. He then returns it to the patient through the crown of his head, while he mutters a spell. Recalling Trient Souls in Borneo and Salibs among the Dayaks of the Kayan and Lower Malawi districts, you will often see, in houses where there are children, a basket of a peculiar shape, 
with shells and dried fruits attached to it. These shells contain the remains of the children's navel strings, and the basket to which they are fastened is commonly hung beside the place where the children sleep. When a child is frightened, for example by being bathed, or by the bursting of a thunderstorm, its soul flees from its body and nestles beside its old familiar friend, the navel string in the basket, for which the mother easily induces it to return by shaking the basket and pressing it to the child's body. The Tobungus of Central Salives believe that sickness in general is caused by the departure of the soul. To recover the wanderer, a spirit will set out food in the courtyard of the sufferer's house and then invoke the soul, promising it many fine things it would only come back. When he thinks it has complied with his request, he catches it in a cloth which he keeps ready for the purpose. This cloth he with claps on the sick man's head, thereby restoring him to his lost soul. Wandering Souls and Popular Tales In an Indian story, a king conveys his soul into the dead body of a Brahmin, and a hunchback conveys his soul into the deserted body of the king. The hunchback is now king, and the king is a Brahmin. However, the hunchback is induced to show his skill by transferring his soul to the dead body of a parrot, and the king seizes the opportunity to regain possession of his own body. A tale of the same type, with variations of detail, reappears among the Malays. A king has incautiously transferred his soul to an ape, upon which the vizier adroitly inserts his own soul into the king's body, and so takes possession of the queen and the kingdom, while the true king languishes at court in the outward semblance of an ape. But one day the false king, who plays for high stakes, was watching a combat of arms, and it happened that the animal on which he had laid his money fell down dead. All efforts to restore animation proved unavailing, till the false king, with the instinct of a true sportsman, transferred his own soul to the body of the deceased ram, and thus renewed the fray. The real king, in the body of an ape, saw his chance, and with great presence of mind, darted back into his own body, which the vizier had rashly vacated. So he came to his own again, and the usurper in the ram's body met with the fate he richly deserved. In another Indian story, a Brahmin reanimates the dead body of a king by conveying his own soul into it. Meantime, the Brahmin's body has been burnt and his soul is obliged to remain in the body of the king. In a Chinese story, we read of a monk in a Buddhist monastery who used from time to time to send his soul away out of himself. Whenever he was thus absent from the body, he took the precaution of locking the door of his cell. On one of these occasions, an envoy from the north arrived and put up at the monastery, where there was no cell for him to pass the night in. He then looked into the cell of the brother whose soul was not at home, and seeing his body lying there motionless, he battered the door in and said, I will lodge here. The man is dead. Take the body and burn it. His servants obeyed his orders, the monks being powerless to interfere. That very night the soul came back, only to find its body reduced to ashes. Every night it could be heard crying, Where shall I settle? Those who knew him then opened the window, saying, Here I am. So the soul came in and united itself with their body, and the result was that they became much cleverer than before. Similarly, the Greeks told how the soul of Hermotimus of Clozomene used to quit his body and roam far and wide, bringing back intelligence of what he had seen on his rambles to his friends at home, until one day when his spirit was abroad, his enemies contrived to seize his deserted body and committed it to the flames. It is said that during the last seven years of his life, Sultan Bayezid ate nothing that had life and blood in it. One day, being seized with a great longing for sheep's trotters, he struggled long in this glorious contest with his soul, till at last, a savoury dish of trotters being set before him, he said unto his soul, My soul, the trotters are before thee. If thou wishest to enjoy them, leave the body and feed on them. Hardly had he uttered these words when a living creature was seen to issue from his mouth and drink of the juice in the dish, after which he endeavoured to return whence it came. But the austere sultan, determined to mortify his carnal appetite, prevented it with his hand from entering his mouth, and when it fell to the ground, commanded that it should be beaten. The pages kicked it to death, and after this murder of the soul, the sultan remained in gloomy seclusion, taking no part or interest in the affairs of government. The wandering soul may be detained by ghosts. The departure of the soul is not always voluntary. It may be extricated from the body against its will by ghosts, demons, or sorcerers. Hence, when a funeral is passing in the house, 
The Karens of Burma tie their children with a special kind of string to a particular part of the house. This is so as the children should leave their bodies and go into the corpse which is passing. The children are kept tied in this way until the corpse is out of sight, and after the corpse has been laid in the grave, but before the earth has been shoveled in. The mourners and friends arrange themselves around the grave, each with a bamboo split lengthwise in one hand and a little stick in the other. Each man thrusts his bamboo into the grave and drawing the stick along the groove of the bamboo points out to his soul that in this way he may easily climb up out of the tomb. When the earth has been shoveled in, the bamboos are kept out of the way, lest the soul should be in them, and so should be inadvertently buried with the earth as it has been thrown into the grave. And when the people leave the spot, they carry away the bamboos, begging their souls to come with them. Further, on returning from the grave, each Karen provides himself with three little hooks made of branches of trees, and calling his spirit to follow him at short intervals as he returns, he makes a motion as if hooking it, and then thrusts the hook into the ground. This is done to prevent the soul of the living from staying behind with the soul of the dead. On the return of a Burmese or Shan family from a burial, old men tie up the wrists of each member of the family with string to prevent his or her butterfly or soul from escaping and this string remains till it is worn out and falls off. When a mother dies leaving a young baby, the Burmese think that the butterfly, or the soul of the baby, follows that of the mother, and that if it is not recovered, the child must die. So a wise woman is called in to get back the baby's soul. She places a mirror near the corpse, and on the mirror, a piece of feathery cotton down. Holding a cloth in her open hands at the foot of the mirror, she, with wild words, entreats the mother not to take with her the butterfly or soul of her child, but to send it back. As the gossamer down slips from the face of the mirror, she catches it in the cloth and tenderly places it on the baby's breast. The same ceremony is sometimes observed when one of two children that have played together dies and is thought to be lured away, the soul of its playmate, to the spirit land. It is sometimes performed also for a bereaved husband or wife. The Bayonars of Eastern Chekon China think that when a man is sick of a fever, his soul has gone away with the ghost of the tombs. At sunset, a sorcerer attempts to lure the soul back by offering it sugar cane, bananas and other fruits, while he sings an incantation inviting the wanderer to return from among the dead to the land of the living. He pretends to catch the truant soul in a piece of cotton, which he then lays on the patient's head. When the Karobataks of Sumatra have buried somebody and are filling in the grave, a sorceress runs about beating the air with a stick. This she does in order to drive away the souls of the survivors, for if one of these souls happens to slip into the grave and to be covered up with earth, its owner will die. Among some of the Dayak tribes of southeastern Borneo, as soon as the coffin is carried to the place of burial, the house in which the death occurred is sprinkled with water, and the father of the family calls out the names of all his children and the other members of his household. For they think that the ghost loves to decoy away the souls of his kinfolk, but that his designs upon them can be defeated by calling out their names, which has the effect of bringing back the souls to their owners. The same ceremony is repeated on the return of the burial. It is a rule with the Quikutog Indians of British Columbia that a corpse must not be coffined in the house, or the souls of the other inmates would enter the coffin, and they too would die. The body is taken out either through the roof or through the hole made in one of the walls, and is then coffined inside the house. In the East Indian island of Kesar, it is deemed imprudent to go near a grave at night, lest the ghost should catch and keep the soul of the passerby. The K islanders believe that the spirits of their forefathers, angry at not receiving food, make people sick by detaining their souls, so that they offer them some food on the grave and beg their ancestors to allow the soul of the sick to return or to drive it home speedily, if it should be lingering by the way. Attempts to rescue the lost soul from the spirits of the dead who were detaining it. In Bolan Mangondo, a district in the west of Salibs, all sickness is ascribed to the ancestral spirits who have carried off the patient's soul. The object, therefore, is to bring back the soul of the sufferer and restore it to him. An eyewitness has thus described the attendant cure of a sick boy. The priestesses, who at his physicians, made a doll of cloth and fastened it to the point of a spear, which an old woman held upright. Round this doll, the priestesses danced, uttering charms and chirping as when one calls a dog. The old woman lowered the point of the spear a little, 
so the priestesses could reach the doll. By this time the soul of the sick boy was supposed to be in the doll, have been brought into it by the incantations. So the priestesses approached it cautiously on tiptoe and caught the soul in the many coloured cloths which they had been waving in the air. Then laid the soul on the boy's head, that is, there emptied his head in the cloth in which the soul was supposed to be, and stood for some moments with great gravity, holding their hands on the patient's head. Suddenly there was a jerk. The priestesses whispered and shook their heads, and the cloth was taken off. The soul had escaped. The priestesses gave chase to it, running round and round the house, clucking and gesticulating as if they were driving hens into a poultry yard. At last they recaptured the soul at the foot of the stair and restored it to its owner as before. Much in the same way, an Australian medicine man will sometimes bring the lost soul of a sick man into a puppet and restore it to the patient by pressing the puppet to his breast. In Uia, one of the loyalty islands, the soul of the dead seemed to have been credited with the power of stealing the souls of the living. For when a man was sick, the soul doctor would go with a large troop of men and women to the graveyard. Here the men played on flutes, and the women whistled softly to lure the soul home. After this had gone on for some time, they formed in procession and moved homewards, the flutes playing and the women whistling all the way, while they led back the wandering soul and drove it gently along the open palms. On entering the patient's dwelling, they commanded the soul in a loud voice to enter his body. In Madagascar, when a man was sick or a lunatic in consequence of the loss of his soul, his friends dispatched a wizard in haste to fetch him a soul from the graveyard. The emissary repaired by night to the spot and having made a hole in the wooden house which served as a tomb, begged the spirit of the patient's father to bestow a soul on his son or daughter, who had none. So saying, he applied a bonnet to the hole, then folded up, and rushed back to the house of the sufferer, saying he had a soul for him. With that he clapped the bonnet on the head of the invalid, who had once said he felt much better, and had recovered the soul which he had lost. Rescuing the Soul from the Dead in Borneo and Melanesia when a Diago Malay of some of the western tribes or districts of Borneo is taken ill, with vomiting and profuse sweating as the only symptoms, he thinks that one of his deceased kinsfolk or ancestors is at the bottom of it. To discover which of them is a culprit, a wise man or woman pulls a lock of hair on the crown of the sufferer's head, calling out the names of all his dead relations. The name of which the lock gives forth a sound is the name of the guilty party. If the patient's hair is too short to be tugged with effect, he knocks his forehead seven times against the forehead of a kinsman who has long hair. The hair of the latter is then tugged instead of that of the patient, and answers to the test quite as well. When the blame is thus being satisfactorily laid at the door of the ghost, who is responsible for the sickness, the physician who, as in other countries, is often an old woman, remonstrates with him on his ill behaviour. Go back, says she, to your grave. What do you come here for? The soul of the sick man does not choose to be called by you, and will remain yet a long time in its body. Then she puts some ashes from the hearth in a winnowing fan, and moulds out of them a small figure or image in human likeness. Seven times she moves the basket with a little ashen figure up and down before the patient, taking care not to obliterate the figure, while at the same time she says, Sickness settle in the head, belly, hands, etc., they quickly pass into the corresponding part of the image. Whereupon the patient spits on the ashen image and pushes it from him with his left hand. Next the bell dam lights a candle and goes to the grave of the person whose ghost is doing all the mischief. On the grave she throws a figure of ashes calling out, Ghost, plague the sick man no longer, and stay in your grave, that he may see you no more. On her return she asks the anxious relations in the house, Has his soul come back? and they must answer quickly, yes, the soul of the sick man has come back. As she stands beside the patient, blows out the candle, which has lighted the returning soul on its way, and strews yellow-coloured rice on the head of the convalescent, saying, cluck, soul, cluck, soul, cluck, soul. Last of all, she fastens on his right wrist a bracelet or ring which he must wear for three days. In this case, we see that the saving of the soul was combined with a vicarious sacrifice to the ghost who receives a puppet on which to work his will instead of the poor soul. In San Cristobal, one of the Malaysian islands, the vicarious sacrifice takes the form of a pig or a fish. A malignant ghost of the name of Tapia is supposed to have seized on the sick man's soul and tied it up to a banyan tree. 
Accordingly, a man who has influence with Tapia takes a pig or fish to the holy place where the ghost resides and offers it to him, saying, This is what you eat in place of that man. Eat this, don't kill him. This satisfies a ghost. The soul is loosened from the tree and carried back to the sufferer who naturally recovers. A regular part of the stock in trade of a direct medicine man is a crystal into which he gazes to detect the hiding place of a lost soul or to identify the demon who is causing the sickness. In one of the new Hebrides, a ghost will sometimes impound the souls of trespassers with a magic fence in his garden and only consent to pull up the fence and let the soul out on receiving an unqualified apology and a satisfactory assurance that no personal disrespect was intended. In Motlav, another Melanesian island, it is enough to call the sick man's name in the sacred place where he rashly intruded, and then when the cry of the kingfisher or some other bird is heard, to shout, Come back, to the soul of the sick man, and run back with it to the house. Boreak Mulder recovering a lost soul from the netherworld. It is a comparatively easy matter to save a soul which is merely tied up to a tree, or detained as a vagrant in a pound, but it is a far harder task to fetch it up from the netherworld if it once gets down there. When a buryat shaman is called in to attend a patient, the first thing he does is to ascertain where exactly the soul of the invalid is, for it may have strayed, or been stolen, or been languishing in the prison of the gloomy Erlik, lord of the world below. If it is anywhere in the neighbourhood, the shaman soon catches it and places it in the patient's body. If it is far away, he searches the wide world till he finds it, ransacking the deep woods, the lonely steppes, and the bottom of the sea, not to be thrown off the scent even through the cunning soul runs to the sheep walks in the hope that its footprints will be lost among the tracks of the sheep. But when the whole world has been searched in vain for the errant soul, the shaman knows that there is nothing for it but to go down to hell and seek the lost one among the spirits in prison. At the stern call of duty, he does not flinch, though he knows that the journey is toilsome, and that the travelling expenses, which are naturally defrayed by the patient, are very heavy. Sometimes the lord of the internal regions will only agree to release the soul on condition of receiving another instead, and that one, the soul of the sick man's dearest friend. If the patient consents to the substitution, the shaman turns himself into a hawk, pounces upon the soul of the friend as a source from his slumbering body in the form of a lark, and hands over the fluttering Australian thing to the grim warden of the dead, who thereupon sets the soul of the sick man at liberty, so the sick man recovers and his friend dies. American Indian modes are recovering a lost soul from the land of the dead. When a shaman declares that the soul of a sick Thompson Indian has been carried off by the dead, the good physician, who is the shaman himself, puts on a conical mask and sets off in pursuit. He now acts as if on a journey, jumping rivers and such like obstacles, searching, talking and sometimes engaging in a tussle for the possession of the soul. His first step is to repair to the old trail by which the soul of Heathen Thompsons went to the spirit land, for nowadays the souls of Christian Thompsons travel by a new road. If he fails to find the tracks of the lost soul there, he searches all the graveyards, one after the other, and almost always discovers it in one of them. Sometimes he succeeds in heading off the departing soul by taking a shortcut to the other world. A shaman can only stay a short time there. So as soon as he lays hands on the soul he is after, he bolts with it. The other souls give chase, but he stamps with his foot, on which he wears a rattle made of deer's hoofs. At the rattle of the hoofs, the ghost retreat and he hurries on. A bolder shaman will sometimes ask the ghosts for the soul, and if they refuse to give it, he will wrest it from them. They attack him, but he clubs them and brings away the soul by force. When he comes back to the world, he takes off his mask and shows his club all bloody. Then the people know he had a desperate struggle. If he sees that the harrowing of hell is likely to prove a tough job, he increases the number of wooden pins in the mask. The rescued soul is placed by him on the patient's head and so returned to his body. Among the Twana Indians of Washington State, the descent of the medicine man into the netherworld to rescue lost souls is represented in pantomime before the eyes of the spectators, who include women and children as well as men. The service of the ground is often broken to facilitate the descent of the rescue party. Where the adventurous band is supposed to have reached the bottom, they journey along, cross at least one stream, and travel till they come to the abode of the spirits. These a surprise, 
and after a desperate struggle, sustained with great ardour and a prodigious noise, they succeeded in rescuing the poor souls, and so wrapping them up in cloth, they made the best of their way back to the upper world, and restored the recovered souls to their owners, who have been seen to cry heartily for joy at receiving them back. End of section 2《Section 3 of the Golden Bell — The Study of Magic and Religion — Part 2 — Taboo and the Perils of the Soul by Sir James George Fraser This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 2 — The Perils of the Soul — Section 2 — Absence and Recall of the Soul — Part 2 Abduction of Souls by Demons in Anam, Cochin, China, and China Often the abduction of a man's soul is set down to demons. The Anamites believe that when a man meets a demon and speaks to him, the demon inhales a man's breath and soul. The souls of the Banlars of eastern Cochin, China are apt to be carried off by evil spirits, and the modes of recovering them are various. If a man suffers from a colic, the sorcerer may say that in planting sugar cane maize or what not, he has pierced the stomach of a certain god who lives like a mole on the ground, and that the injured deity has punished him by abstracting his soul and burying it under a plant. Hence a cure for the colic is to pull up the plant and water the hole with millet wine and the blood of a fowl, a goat, or a pig. Again, if a child falls ill in the forest or in the fields, it is because some devil has made off with its soul. To retrieve this spiritual loss, the sorcerer constructs an apparatus which comprises an eggshell in an egg holder, a little waxen image of the sick child, and a small bamboo full of millet wine. This apparatus he sets up at a crossroad, praying the devil to drink the wine and surrender the stolen soul by depositing it in the eggshell. Then he returns to the house, and putting a little cotton to the child's head, restores the soul to its owner. Sometimes the also lays a trap for the thievish demon, the bait consisting of the liver of a pig or a fowl, and the blood-smeared handle of a little mattock. At nightfall he sets the trap at a crossroad and lies in wait hard by. While the devil is licking the blood and munching the liver, the artful sorcerer pounces out on him, and after a severe struggle, wrests the soul from its clutches, returning to the village victorious, but breathless and bleeding from his terrific encounter with the enemy of souls. Fits and convulsions are generally set down by the Chinese to the agency of certain mischievous spirits who love to draw men's souls out of their bodies. At Amoy, the spirits who serve babies and children in this way rejoice in the highest sounding titles of celestial agencies bestriding galloping horses and literary graduates reciting halfway up in the sky. When an infant is writhing in convulsions, the frightened mother hastens to the roof of the house and waving about a bamboo pole to which one of the child's garments is attached, cries out several times, My child, so-and-so, come back, return home. Meantime, another inmate of the house bangs away on a gong in the hope of attracting the attention of the strayed soul, which is supposed to recognise the familiar garment, and to slip into it. If the garment containing the soul is then placed on or beside the child, and if the child does not die, recovery is sure to follow sooner or later. Similarly, we saw that some Indians catch a man's lost soul in his boots and restore it to his body by putting his feet into them. Abduction of Souls by Demons in the East Indies If Galeries mariners are sailing past certain rocks or come to a river where they never were before, they must wash their faces or otherwise the spirits of the rocks or the river would snatch away their souls. When a dog is about to leave a forest through which he has been walking alone, he never forgets to ask the demons to give him back his soul, for it may be that some forest devil has carried it off. For the abduction of a soul may take place without its owner being aware of his loss, and it may happen either while he is awake or asleep. The Papuans of Gilvink Bay in New Guinea are apt to think that the mists which sometimes hang about the tops of tall trees in their tropical forests envelope a spirit or god called Narbrui, who draws away the breath or soul of those whom he loves, thus causing them to languish and die. Accordingly, when a man lies sick, a friend or relation will go to one of these miscapped trees and endeavour to recover the lost soul. 
At the foot of the tree, he makes a peculiar sound to attract the attention of the spirit and lights a cigar. In his curling smoke, his fancy discerns the fair and youthful form of Narui himself, who, decked with flowers, appears and informs the anxious inquirer whether the soul of his sick friend is with him or not. If it is, the man asks, has he done anything wrong? Oh no, the spirit answers, I love him, and therefore I have taken him to myself. So the man laid down an offering at the foot of the tree, and goes home with the soul of the sufferer in a straw bag. Arrived at the house, he empties a bag with his precious contents over the sick man's head, rubs his arms and hands with ginger root, which he at first chewed small, and then ties a bandage around one of the patient's wrists. If the bandage bursts, it is a sign that Narubi has repented of his bargain, and is drawing away the sufferer once more to himself. Abduction of Souls by Demons in the Moloccas in the Moloccas, when a man is unwell, it is thought that some devil has carried away his soul to the tree, mountain, or hill where he, the devil, resides. A sorcerer having pointed out the devil's abode, the friends of the patient carry thither cooked rice, fruit, fish, raw eggs, a hen, a chicken, a silken robe, gold, armlets, and so forth. Having set out the food in order, they pray, saying, We come to offer you, O devil, this offering of food, clothes, gold, and so on. Take it and release the soul of the patient for whom we pray. Let it return to his body, and he who now is sick shall be made whole. Then they eat a little and let the hen loose as a ransom for the soul of the patient, whilst they put down the raw eggs, but the silken rope, the gold, and the armlets they take home with them. As soon as they come to the house, they place a flat bowl containing the offerings which have been brought back to the sick man's head, and say to him, Now is your soul released? and you shall farewell and live to grey hairs on the earth. A more modern account of the same region describes how the friend of the patient, after depositing his offerings on the spot where the missing soul is supposed to be, calls out thrice the name of the sick person, adding, Come with me, come with me. Then he returns, making a notion with a cloth, as if he had caught the soul in it. He must not look to right or left, or speak a word to anyone he meets, but must go straight to the patient's house. At the door he stands, and calling out the sick person's name, asks whether he is returned. Being answered from within that he is returned, he enters and lays the cloth in which he has caught the soul on the patient's throat, saying, Now you are returned to the house. Sometimes a substitute is provided, a doll dressed up in gay clothing and tinsel is offered to the demon in exchange for the patient's soul with these words, Give us back the ugly one which you have taken away, and receive this pretty one instead. Abduction of Souls by Demons in Salives and Siberia Among the Alfuras, or Torajas of Pozo, and central Salives, a wooden puppet is offered to the demon as a substitute for the soul which he has abstracted, and the patient much touched the puppet in order to identify himself with it. The effigy is then hung on a bamboo pole, which is planted at the place of sacrifice outside the house. Here, too, are deposited offerings of rice, an egg, a little wood, which is afterwards kindled, a shred of a broken cooking pot, and so forth. A long rattan extends from the place of sacrifice to the sufferer, who grasps one end of it firmly. For long it, his lost soul will return when the devil has kindly released it. All being ready, the priestess informs the demon that he has come to the wrong place, and that there are no doubt much better quarters where he could reside. Then the father of the patient, standing beside the offerings, takes up his parable as follows. O oh, demon, we forgot to sacrifice to you. You have visited us with this sickness. Will you now go away from us to some other place? We have made ready provisions for you on the journey. So here is a cooking pot. Here are rice, fire, and a fowl. O oh, demon, go away from us. With that, the priestess stews rice towards a bamboo pole to lure back the wandering soul, and the fowl promised to the devil is thrown in the same direction, but is instantly jerked back again by a string which, in a spirit of intelligent economy, has been previously attached to its leg. The demon is now supposed to accept the puppet, which hangs from the pole, and to release the soul, which, sliding down the pole and along the rattan, returns to its proper owner. Unless the evil spirit should repent of the butter which has just been affected, all communication with him is broken off by cutting down the pole. Similarly, the Mongols make up a horse of birch bark and a doll, and invite the demon to take the doll instead of the patient and to ride away on the horse. A Yakut shaman, rigged out in his professional costume, 
with his drum in his hand, will boldly descend into the little world and haggle with a demon who has carried off a sick man's soul. Not uncommonly, the demon proves amenable to reason, and in consideration of the narrow circumstance of the patient's family, will accept a more moderate ransom than he at first demanded. For instance, he may be brought up with the skin of an arctic hare or arctic fox instead of a foal or steer. The bargain being struck, the shaman hurries back to the sufferer's bedside, from which, to them, merely carnal eye he has never stirred, and informs the anxious relatives of the success of his mission, then turn gladly hasten to provide the ransom. Souls rescued from demons at a house warming in Minahaza. Demons are especially feared by persons who have just entered a new house. Hence at a house warming among the Alfours of Minahasa and Salibs, the priest performs a ceremony for the purpose of restoring their souls to the inmates. He hangs up a bag at the place of sacrifice, then goes through a list of the gods. There are so many of them, this takes him the whole night through without stopping. In the morning he offers the gods an egg and some rice. By this time the souls of the household are supposed to be gathered in the bag. So the priest takes the bag, and holding it onto the head of the master of the house, says, Here you have your soul. Go, soul, tomorrow away again. He then does the same, saying the same words to the housewife and all the members of the family. Amongst the same alfours, one way of recovering a sick man's soul is to let down a bowl by a belt out of the window, and fish for the soul till it is caught in the bowl and hauled up. And among the same people when a priest is bringing back a sick man's soul, which he has caught in a cloth. He is preceded by a girl holding a large leaf of a certain palm over his head as an umbrella to keep him and the soul from getting wet, in case it should rain, and he is followed by a man brandishing a sword to deter other souls from any attempt at rescuing the captured spirit. Souls carried off by the sun and other gods. In Nias, when a man dreams that a pig is fastened under a neighbor's house, it is a sign that someone in that house will die. They think that the sun god is drawing away the shadows or souls of that household from this world of shadows to his own bright world of radiant light, and a ceremony must needs be performed to win back these passing souls to earth. Accordingly, while it is still night, the priest begins to drum and pray, and he continues his orisons till about nine o'clock next morning. Then he takes his stand at the opening in the roof, which he can behold the sun, and spreading out a cloth, waits till the beams of the morning sun fall full upon it. In the sunbeams, he thinks the wandering souls have come back again, so he wraps the cloth up tightly, and, quitting the opening in the roof, hastens with his precious charge to the expectant household. Before each member of it, he stops, and dipping his fingers into the cloth, takes out his or her soul and restores it to the owner by touching the person on the forehead. The Thompson Indians of British Columbia think that the setting sun draws the souls of men away towards it. Hence, they will never sleep with their heads to the sunset. The Samoans tell how two young wizards, passing a house where a chief lay very sick, saw a company of gods from the mountains sitting in the doorway. They were handling from one to another the soul of the dying chief. It was wrapped in a leaf, and had been passed from the gods inside the house to those sitting in the doorway. One of the gods handed the soul to one of the wizards, taking him from a god in the dark, for it was night. Then all the gods rose up and went away, but the wizard kept the chief's soul. In the morning some women went with a present of fine mats to fetch a famous physician. The wizards were sitting on the shore as the women passed, and they said to the women, Give us the mats and we will heal him. So they went to the chief's house. He was very ill, his jaw hung down, and his end seemed near. But the wizards undid the leaf and let the soul into him again, and forthwith he brightened up and lived. Lost Souls Extracted from a Fowl The Batas, or Bataks of Sumatra, believe that the soul of a living man may transmigrate to the body of an animal. Hence, for example, the doctor is sometimes desired to extract the patient's soul from the body of a fowl, in which it has been hidden away by an evil spirit. Lost souls brought back into a visible form. Sometimes a lost soul is brought back into a visible shape. In Melanesia, a woman, knowing that her neighbour was at the point of death, heard a rustling in her house, as of a moth fluttering, just at the moment when the noise of weeping and lamentation told her that the soul was flown. She caught the fluttering thing between her hands and ran with it, 
crying out that she had caught the soul. But though she opened her hands above the mouth of the corpse, it did not revive. In Lepra's Island, one of the new Hebrides, for ten days after her birth, the father was careful not to exert himself, or the baby would suffer for it. If during this time he goes away to any distance, he will bring back with him, on his return, a little stone representing the infant's soul. Arriving at home, he cries, Come hither, and puts down the stone in the house. Then he waits till the child sneezes, at which he cries, Here it is. For now he knows that the little soul has not been lost after all. The Salish or flathead Indians of Oregon believe that a man's soul may be separated for a time from his body without causing death and without the man being aware of his loss. It is necessary, however, that the lost soul should be soon found and restored to its owner or he will die. The name of the man who has lost his soul is revealed in a dream to the medicine man who hastens to inform the sufferer of his loss. Generally, a number of men have sustained a like loss at the same time. All their names are revealed to the medicine man and all employ him to recover their souls. The whole night long, these soulless men go about the village from lodge to lodge, dancing and singing. Towards daybreak, they go into a separate lodge, which is closed up so as to be totally dark. A small hole is then made in the roof, through which the medicine man with a bunch of feathers brushes in the soles, in the shape of bits of bone and the like, which he receives on a piece of matting. A fire is next kindled by the light, of which the medicine man sorts out the souls. First he puts aside the soul of dead people, of which there are usually several, for if he were to give the soul of a dead person to a living man, the man would die instantly. Next he picks out the souls of all the persons present, and making them all sit down before him, he takes the soul of each, in the shape of a splinter of bone, wood or shell, and placing it on the owner's head, pats it with many prayers and contortions till it descends into the heart, and so resumes its proper place. In Embonya, the sorcerer, to recover a soul detained by demons, plucks a branch from a tree, and waving it to and fro, as if to catch something, calls out the sick man's name. Returning, he strikes the patient over the head and body with the branch, into which the lost soul is supposed to have passed, and from which he returns to the patient. In the Barbar Islands, offerings for evil spirits are laid at the root of a great tree, or kire, from which a leaf is plucked and pressed on the patient's forehead and breast. The lost soul, which is in the leaf, is thus restored to its owner. In some other islands of the same areas, when a man returns ill and speechless from the forest, it is inferred that the evil spirits which dwell in the great trees have caught and kept his soul. Offerings of food are therefore left under a tree, and the soul is brought home in a piece of wax. Amongst the Dayaks of Sarawak, the priest conjures the lost soul into a cup, where it is seen by the uninitiated as a lock of hair but by the initiated as a miniature human being. This the priest pokes back into the patient's body through an invisible hole in his skull. In Nias, the sick man's soul is restored to him in the shape of a firefly, visible only to the sorcerer who catches it in a cloth and places it on the forehead of the patient. Soul lost by a fall and recovered from the earth. Amongst the Indians of Santiago de Bocan, if a child has fallen from the arms of its bearer, and the illness has resulted from the fall, the parents will take the child's shirt, stretch it out on the spot where the little one fell, and say, Come, come, come back to the infant. Then they bring back a little of the earth, wrapped up in the shirt, and pull the shirt on the child. They say that in this manner the spirit is replaced in the child's body, and that he will recover. With this we may compare an Irish custom reported by Camden. When anyone happens to fall, he springs up again, and turning round thrice to the right, digs the earth with a sword or knife, and takes up a turf, because they say the earth restores his share to him. But if he falls sick within two or three days thereafter, a woman skilled in these matters is sent to the spot, and there says, I call thee so and so from the east and west, from the south and north, from the groves, woods, rivers, marshes, ferries, white, red, and black, and so forth. After uttering certain short prayers, she returns home to the sick person, and whispering in his ear another prayer, along with a pater noster, puts some burning coals into a cup of clean water, 
and so decides that her distemper has been inflicted by the fairies. Here, though Canham is not very explicit, and he probably did not quite understand the custom he describes, it seems plain that the shade or soul of a man who has fallen is conceived as adhering to the ground where he fell. Accordingly, he seeks to regain possession of it by digging up the earth, but if he fails to recover it, he sends a wise woman to the spot to win back his soul from the fairies who are detaining it. Recovery of the Soul in Ancient Egypt The ancient Egyptians held that a dead man is not in a state to enter on the life hereafter until his soul has been found restored to his mummified body. The vital spark has been commonly devoured by the malignant god Sid, who concealed his true form in the likeness of a horned beast, such as an ox or a gazelle. So the priests went in quest of the missing spirit, slaughtered the animal which had devoured it, and cutting open the carvers, found the soul still undigested in his stomach. Afterwards, the son of the deceased embraced the mummy with the image of his father, in order to restore his soul to him. Formerly, it was customary to place the skin of the slain beast on the dead man for the purpose of recruiting his strength with that of the animal. Souls stolen or detained by sorcerers in Fiji and Polynesia. Again, souls may be extracted from their bodies or detained on their wanderings, not only by ghosts and demons, but also by men, especially by sorcerers. In Fiji, if a criminal refuses to confess, the chief sent for a scarf with which to catch away the soul of the rogue. At the sight, or even at the mention of the scarf, the culprit generally made a clean breast. For if he did not, the scarf would be waved over his head till his soul was caught in it, and it would be carefully folded up and nailed to the end of a chief's canoe, and for want of his soul, the criminal would pine and die. The sorcerers of Danger Island used to set snares of souls. The snares were made of stout sinnet, about 15 to 30 feet long, with loops to either side of different sizes, to suit the different sizes of souls. For fat souls, there were large loops. For thin souls, there were small ones. When a man was sick against whom the sorcerers had a grudge, they set up these soul snares near his house and watched for the flight of his soul. If in the shape of a bird or insect, it was caught in the snare, the man would infallibly die. When a Polynesian mother desired that the child in her womb should grow up to be a great warrior or a great thief, she repaired to the temple of the war god Oro, or of the thief god Hiro. There the priest obligingly caught the spirit of the god in a snare made of coconut fibre, and then infused it into the woman. When the child was born, the mother took it to the temple and dedicated it to the god with whose divine spirit the infant was already possessed. The Algonquin Indians also used nets to catch souls, but only as a measure of defence. They feared lest passing souls, which had just quitted the bodies of dying people, should enter their huts and carry off the souls of the inmates to dead land. So they spread nets about their houses to catch and entangle these ghostly intruders in the measures. Detention of Souls by Sorcerers in Africa Among the Serdi Rares, of Senegaba, when a man wishes to revenge himself on his enemy, he goes to the Fituar, chief and priest of one, and prevails on him by presence to conjure the soul of his enemy into a large jar of red earthware, which is then deposited under a consecrated tree. The man whose soul is shut up in the jar soon dies. Among the Baals of the Ivory Coast, it happened once that a chief's soul was extracted by the magic of an enemy who succeeded in shutting it up in a box. To recover it, two men held a garment of the sick man, while the witch performed certain enchantments. After a time, she declared that the soul was now in the garment, which was accordingly rolled up and hastily wrapped about the invalid for the purpose of restoring his spirits to him. Some of the Congo Negroes think that enchanters can get possession of human souls and enclose them in tusks of ivory, sell them to the white man, who makes them work for him in his country under the sea. It is believed that very many of the coast labourers are men thus obtained. So when these people go to trade, they often look anxiously about for their dead relations. The man whose soul is thus sold into slavery will die, in due course, if not at the time. In some parts of West Africa, indeed, wizards are continually setting traps to catch souls that wander from their bodies in sleep, and when they have caught one, they are tied up over the fire, and as it shrivels in the heat, the owner sickens. 
This is done, not out of any grudge towards the sufferer, but purely as a matter of business. The wizard does not care whose soul he has captured, and will rarely restore it to its owner, if only he is paid for doing so. Some sorters keep regular systems of strayed souls, and anybody who has lost or mislaid his own soul can always have another one from the asylum on payment of the usual fee. No blame whatever attaches to men who keep these private asylums or set traps for passing souls. It is their profession, and in the exercise of it they are actuated by no harsh or unkindly feelings. But there are also wretches who, from pure spite or for the sake of lucre, set and bait traps with the deliberate purpose of catching the soul of a particular man. And in the bottom of the pot, hidden by the bait, are knives and sharp hooks which tear and rend the poor soul, either killing it outright or mauling it so as to impair the health of its owner when it succeeds in escape and returning to him. Miss Kingsley knew a crewman who became very anxious about his soul because of several nights he had smelt in his dreams the savoury smell of smoked crawfish seasoned with red pepper. Clearly some ill-wisher had set a trap, baited with this dainty for his dream soul, intended to do him grievous bodily or rather spiritual harm, and for the next few nights great pains were taken to keep his soul from straying abroad in his sleep. In the sweltering heat of the tropical night he lay sweating and snorting under a blanket, his nose and mouth tied up with a handkerchief to prevent the escape of his precious soul. Taking the souls of enemies first and their heads afterwards. When Dirks the upper Melloway are about to go out head-hunting, they take the precaution of securing the souls of their enemies before they attempt to kill their bodies. Calculate apparently that mere bodily death will soon follow the spiritual death or capture of the soul. With this intention they clear a small piece in the underwood of the forest and set up in the clearing one of those miniature houses in which it is customary to deposit the ashes of the dead. Food is placed in a little house which, though raised on four posts, is connected with the ground by a tiny inverted ladder of the sort set up which spirits are believed to swarm. When these preparations have been completed, the leader of the expedition comes and sits down a little way from the miniature house, and dressing the spirits of kinsmen who had the misfortune to be beheaded by their enemies, he says, O ghost of so-and-so, come speedily back to our village. We have rice in abundance. Our trees all bear ripe fruit. Our baskets are full to the brim. O oh, ghosts, come swiftly back, and forget not to bring your new friends and acquaintances with you. But by the new friends and acquaintances of the ghosts, he means the souls of the enemies against whom he is about to lead the expedition. Meantime, the other warriors have hidden themselves close by behind trees and bushes, and are listening with all their ears. When the cry of an animal is heard in the forest, or a humming sound seems to issue from the little house, it is a sign that the ghosts of their friends have come, bring with them the souls of their enemies, which are accordingly at their mercy. At that the lurking warriors leap forth from their ambush, and with brandished blades hew and slash at the souls of their foremen swarming unseen in the air. Taken completely by surprise, the panic-stricken souls flee in all directions, and are feigned to hide under every leaf and stone on the ground. But here there the retreat is cut off, for now the leader of the expedition is hard at work, grabbing up with his hands every stone and leaf to right and left, with thrusting and feverish haste into the basket, which he at once ties up securely. He now flatters himself that he has the souls of the enemy safe in his possession, and when in the course of the expedition the heads of the foe are severed from their bodies, he will pack them into the same basket in which their souls are already languishing in captivity. Injuries of various sorts done to captured souls by wizards. In Hawaii, there were sorcerers who caught souls of living people, shut them up in calabashes, and gave them to people to eat. By squeezing a captured soul in their hands, they discovered the place where people had been secretly buried. Amongst the Canadian Indians, when it was a wish to kill a man, he set out his familiar spirits, who brought him the victim's soul in the shape of a stone or the like. The wizard struck the soul with a sword or an axe till it bled profusely, and as it bled, the man to whom it belonged fell ill and died. In Mbonya, if a doctor is convinced that a patient's soul has been carried away by a demon beyond recovery, he seeks to supply its place with a soul abstracted from another man. For this purpose he goes by night to a house and asks, who's there? 
if an inmate is incruciate enough to answer the doctor takes up from the before the door a clod of earth into which the soul of the person who replied is thought to have passed this clod the doctor lays under the sick man's pillow and performs certain ceremonies by which the stolen soul is conveyed into the patient's body then as he goes home the doctor fires two shots to frighten the soul from returning to its proper owner a current whiz will catch the wandering soul of a sleeper and transfer it to the body of a dead man the latter therefore comes to life as the former dies but the friends of the sleeper in turn engage a wizard to steal the soul of another sleeper who dies as the first sleeper comes to life in this way an indefinite succession of deaths and resurrections is supposed to take place abduction of human souls by malay wizards nowhere perhaps is the art of abducting human souls more carefully cultivated or carried to high perfection than the malay peninsula here are the methods by which the wizard works his will are various and so too his motives sometimes he desires to destroy any enemy sometimes to win the love of a cold or bashful beauty some of the charms operate entirely without contact in others the receptacle into which the soul is to be lured has formed part of or at least touched the person of the victim thus to take an instance of the latter sort of charm the following are directions given for securing the soul of one whom he wished to render distraught take the soil from the middle of his footprint wrap it up in pieces of red black and yellow cloth taking care to keep the yellow outside and hang it from the center of the mosquito curtain with partly colored thread it will then become your victim's soul to complete the transubstantiation however it is needful to switch the packet with a birch composed of seven leaf ribs from a green coconut do this seven times at sunset at midnight and at sunrise saying it is not earth that i switch but the heart of so and so then bury it in the middle of a path where your victim is sure to step over it and he will unquestionably become distraught another way is to scrape the wood of the floor where your intended victim has been sitting mix the scrapings with earth from his or her footprint and knead the hole with wax from a deserted bee's comb into a likeness of him or her then fumigate the figure with incense and beckon to the soul every night for three nights successively by waving a cloth while you recite the appropriate spell in the following cases the charm takes effect without any contact whatever whether direct or indirect with the victim when the moon just risen looks red above the eastern horizon go out and standing in the moonlight with the big toe of your right foot on the big toe of your left make a speaking trumpet of your right hand and recite through it the following words om i lose my shaft i lose it and the moon clouds over i lose it and the sun is extinguished i lose it and the stars burn dim but it is not the sun moon and stars that i shoot at it is a stalk of the heart of that child of congregation so and so cluck cluck soul of so and so come and walk with me come and sit with me come and sleep and share my pillow cluck cluck soul repeat this thrice and after every repetition blow through your hollow fist or you may catch the soul in your turban thus go out on the night or the full moon and the two succeeding nights sit down on an ant hill facing the moon burn incense and recite the following incantation i bring you a bit of leaf to chew dab the line onto it prince ferocious for somebody prince distraction's daughter to chew somebody at sunrise be distraught for love of me somebody at sunset be distraught for love of me as you remember your parents remember me as you remember your house and house ladder remember me when thunder rumbles remember me when wind whistles remember me when the heavens rain remember me when cocks crow remember me when the dull bird tells its tales remember me when you look up at the sun remember me when you look up at the moon remember me when the self same moon i am there cluck cluck so will somebody come hither to me i do not mean to let you have my soul let your soul come hither to mine now i have the end of your turban towards the moon seven times each night go home and put it under your pillow and if you want to wear it in the daytime burn incense and say it is not a turban that i carry in my girdle but the soul of somebody athenian curse accompanied by the shaking of red cloths 
Perhaps the magical sermon has just described my help to explain a curious rite of immemorial antiquity which was performed on a very solemn occasion at Athens, on the eve of the sailing of the fleet for Syracuse, when all hearts beat high with hope, and visions of empire dazzled all eyes. Consternation suddenly fell on the people one May morning, when they rose and found that most of the images of Hermes in the city had been mysteriously mutilated in the night. The impious perpetrators of the sacrilege were unknown, but whoever they were, the priests and priestesses solemnly cursed them, according to the ancient ritual, standing with their faces to the west and shaking red cloths up and down. Perhaps these cloths, they were catching the souls of those at whom their curses were levelled, just as we have seen that Fijian chiefs used to catch the souls of criminals and scars and nail them to canoes. Extracting a patient's soul from the stomachs of his doctor the Indians of the Nass River in British Columbia are impressed with a belief that a physician may swallow his patient's soul by mistake. A doctor who is believed to have done so is made by the other members of the faculty to stand over the patient, while one of them thrusts his fingers down the doctor's throat, another knees him in the stomach with his knuckles, and a third slaps him on the back. If the soul is not in him at all, and the same process has been repeated upon all the medical men without success, it is concluded that the soul must be in the head doctor's box. A party of doctors, therefore, waits upon him in his house and requests him to produce his box. When he has done so and arranged its contents on a new mat, they take the votary of Aesculapius and hold him by the heels with his head in a hole in the floor. In this position they wash his head, and any remaining water from the ablution is taken and poured upon the sick man's head. Among the Kwakitl Indians of British Columbia, it is forbidden to pass behind the back of a shaman while he is eating, lest the shaman should invariably swallow the soul of the passerby. When that happens, both the shaman and the person whose soul he has swallowed fall down in a swoon. Blood flows from the shaman's mouth because the soul is too large for him and is tearing his inside. Then the clan of the person whose soul is doing this mischief must assemble and sing the song of the shaman. In time, the suffering sorcerer vomits out the soul which he exhibits in the shape of a small body ball in the open palms of his hands. He restores it to its owner, who is lying prostrate on a mat, by throwing it at him and then blowing on his head. The man whose soul was swallowed has very naturally to pay for the damage he did to the shaman, as well as for his own cure. End of section 3《ซ็กชันฟอร์ออฟเดอะโกลเด้นบาวอะสตูดิอินแมจิกแอนด์เรลิจินพาร์ทสองทับูในเพลสของเดอะโซลบายเซอร์เจมส์จอร์จเฟรเซอร์นี่คือ LibriVox Recording All LibriVox Recordings from the Public Domain For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 2 The Perils of the Soul Section 3 The Soul as a Shadow and a Reflection A man's soul can see to this shadow, so that to injure the shadow is to injure the man. But the spiritual dangers I have enumerated are not the only ones which beset the savage. Often he regards his shadow or reflection as his soul, or at all events, as a vital part of himself, and as such is necessary a source of danger to him, for it is trampled upon, struck or stabbed, he will feel the injury as it were done to his person, and if it is detached from him entirely, as he believes that it may be, he will die. In the island of Watar, there are magicians who can make a man ill by stabbing his shadow with a pike or hacking it with a sword. After Sankara had destroyed the Buddhist India, it is said that he journeyed to Nepal, where he had some difference of opinion with the Grand Lama. To prove his supernatural powers, he soared into the air. But as he mounted up, the Grand Lama, perceiving his shadow swaying and wavering on the ground, struck his knife into it, and down fell Sankara and broke his neck. In the Baba Islands, the demons get power over man's soul by holding fast his shadow, or by striking and wounding it. Among the Talindus of Central Zalibs, to tread on a man's shadow is an offence, because it is supposed to make the owner sick. And for the same reason, the Tongblos of that region forbid their children to play with their shadows. The Ottawa Indians thought they could kill a man by making certain figures on his shadow. The Banganda of Central Africa regarded a man's shadow as his ghost, 
hence they used to kill or injure their enemies by stabbing or treading on their shadows. Among the Bavili of West Africa, it used to be considered a crime to trample on or even to cross the shadow of another, especially the shadow were that of a married woman. Some Kafirs are very unwilling to let anybody stand on their shadow, believing that they can be influenced for evil through it. A person's soul conceived as a shadow, so that to injure the shadow is to injure him or her. They think that a sick man's shadow dwindles in intensity when he is about to die, for it has such an intimate relation to the man that it suffers with him. The Jailua tribes of Cabarondo, to the east of Lake Victoria, Nyanza, tell of the ancestor of all men, a Potho by name, who descended to earth from above, bringing with him cattle, fowls, and seeds. When he was old, the Jailua plotted to kill him, but for a long time they did not dare to attack him. At last, hearing that he was sick, they thought their chance had come, and sent a girl to see how he was. She took a small horn, used for cupping blood in her hand, and while she talked with him, she placed the cupping horn on his shadow. To her surprise, it drew blood. So she returned and told her friends that if they wished to kill a potho, they must not touch his body, but spear his shadow. They did so, and he died and turned into a rock which has ever since possessed the property of sharpening spears unusually well. In a Chinese book, we read of a sage who examined human shadows by lamplight in order to discover the fate of their owners. A man's shadow, he said, ought to be deep, for if so, he will attain honourable positions and a great age. Shadows are averse to being reflected in water, or in walls, or in washing basins. It is on such grounds that the ancients avoided shadows, and that in old days, Ku Siu Tuan Hu and other shadow-treading vermin caused injury by hitting the shadows of men. In recent times there have been men versed in the art of cauterizing the shadows of their patients. Another sapient Chinese writer observes, I have heard that if the shadow of a bird is hit with a piece of wood that was struck by thunder, the bird falls to the ground immediately. I never tried it, but on account of the matter stated above, I consider the thing certain. The natives of Naeus tremble at the sight of a rainbow because they think it is a net spread by a powerful spirit to catch their shadows. Danger to a person letting his shadow fall on certain things. In the Banks Islands, Melanesia, there are certain stones of a remarkably long shape which go by the name of Tomate Gorgon or Eating Ghosts because certain powerful and dangerous ghosts are believed to lodge in them. If a man's shadow falls on one of these stones, the ghost will draw his soul out from him, and that he will die. Such stones, therefore, are set in a house to guard it, and a messenger is sent to a house. By the absent owner will call out the name of the sender, lest the watchful ghost in the stone should fancy that he came with evil intent and should do him a mischief. In Florida, one of the Solomon Islands, there are places sacred to ghosts, some in the village, some in the gardens, and some in the bush. No man would pass one of these places where the sun was so low as to cast his shadow into it, for then the ghost would draw it from him. The Indian tribes of the lower Fraser River believe that man has four souls, of which the shadow is one, though not the principal, and that sickness is caused by the absence of one of the souls. Hence no one will let his shadow fall on a sick shaman, lest the latter should purloin it to replace his own lost soul. At a funeral in China, when the lid is about to be placed on the coffin, most of the bystanders, with the exception of the nearest kin, retire a few steps or even retreat to another room, for a person's self is believed to be endangered by allowing his shadow to be enclosed in a coffin. And when the coffin is about to be lowered into the grave, most of the spectators recoil to a little distance, lest their shadow should fall into the grave, and harm should thus be done to their persons. The geomancer and his assistants stand on the side of the grave which is turned away from the sun, and the grave diggers and coffin bearers attach their shadows firmly to their persons by tying a strip of cloth tightly round their waists. In the Nicobar Islands, burial usually takes place at sundown, before midnight or early dawn. In no case can an interment be carried out at noon or within an hour of it, lest the shadows of the bearers who lower the body into the earth or of the mourners taking their last look at the shrouded figure should fall into the grave, for that would cause them to be sick or die. And when the dead has been laid in his last home, but before the earth is shoveled in upon him, 
the leaves of a certain jungle tree are waved over the grave, and a lighted torch is brandished inside it to disperse the souls of the sorrowing bystanders that may be lingering with their departed friend in his narrow bed. Then the signal is given, and the earth or sand is rapidly shoveled in by a party of young men who have been standing in readiness to perform the duty. When the Malays are building a house, and the central post has been set up, the greatest precautions are taken to prevent the shadow of any of the workers from falling either on the post or on the whole dug to receive it, for otherwise they think that sickness and trouble will be sure to follow. When members of some Victorian tribes were performing magical ceremonies for the purpose of bringing disease and misfortune on their enemies, they took care not to let their shadows fall on the object by which the evil influence was supposed to be wafted to the foe. The Darfur people think that they can do an enemy to death by burying a certain root in the earth on the spot where the shadow of his head happens to fall. A man whose shadow is thus tampered with loses consciousness at once and will die if the proper antidote is not administered. In like manner, they can paralyze any limb, as a hand or leg, by planting a particular root in the earth in the shadow of the limb they desire to maim. Animals also may be injured through their shadows. Nor is it human beings alone who are thus liable to be injured by means of their shadows. Animals are to some extent in the same predicament. A small snail, which frequents the neighbourhood of the limestone hills in Perek, is believed to suck the blood of cattle through their shadows. Hence the beasts grow lean and sometimes die from loss of blood. The ancients suppose that in Arabia, if a hyena trod on a man's shadow, it deprived him of the power of speech and motion, and that if a dog standing on a roof in the moonlight, cast a shadow on the ground, and I hear no trot on it. The dog would fall down as if dragged with a rope. Clearly in these cases the shadow, if not equivalent to the soul, is at least regarded as a living part of the man or the animal, so that injury done to the shadow is felt by the person or animal as it were done to his body. Even the shadows of trees are supposed by the Kaffirs to be sensitive. Hence when a Kaffir doctor seeks to pluck the leaves of a tree for medicinal purposes, he takes care to run up quickly, and avoid touching the shadow, lest it should inform the tree of the danger, and so give the tree time to withdraw the medicinal properties from its extremities into the safety of the inaccessible trunk. The shadow of the tree is said to feel the touch of the man's feet. Danger of being overshadowed by certain birds or people Conversely, if the shadow is a vital part of a man or an animal, it may, under certain circumstances, be as hazardous to be touched by it as if it would be to come into contact with the person or animal. Thus, in the northwest provinces of India, people believe that if the shadow of the goat sucker a bird falls on an ox or a cow, but especially on a cow buffalo, the beast will soon die. The remedy is for someone to kill the bird, rub his hands or a stick in the blood, and then wave the stick over the animal. There are certain men who are noted for their powers in this respect, all over the district. The Kadish of Central Australia hold that if the shadow of a brown hawk falls on the breast of a woman who is suckling a child, the breast will swell up and burst. Hence, a woman sees one of these birds in these circumstances. She runs away in fear. In the central provinces of India, a pregnant woman avoids the shadow of a man, believing that, if it fell on her, the child will take after him in features, though not in character. In Shoah, any obstinate disorder for which no remedy is known, such as insanity, epilepsy, delirium, hysteria, as in Vitus's dance, is traced either to possession by a demon or to the shadowed enemy which has fallen on the sufferer. The bushman is most careful not to let his shadow fall on the dead game, as he thinks this would bring bad luck. Among the Kafirs, to overshadow the king by standing in his presence was an offence worthy of instant death, and it is a Kafra superstition that if the shadow of a man who is protected by a certain charm falls on the shadow of a man who is not so protected, the unprotected person will fall down, overcome by the power of the charm which is transmitted through the shadow. In the Punjab, some people believe that if the shadow of a pregnant woman fell on a snake, it would blind the creature instantly. The shadows of certain persons are regarded as peculiarly dangerous. Hence a seven makes it a rule to shun the shadow of certain persons, whom for various reasons he regards as sources of dangerous influence. 
Among the dangerous classes, he commonly ranks mourners and women in general, but especially his mother-in-law. The Shuswap Indians of British Columbia think that the shadow of a mourner falling upon a person would make him sick. Amongst the Kurnay tribe of Victoria, novices and initiation were cautioned not to let a woman's shadow fall across them, as this would make them thin, lazy and stupid. The Savage's Dread of His Mother-in-Law An Australian native is said to have once nearly died of fright because the shadow of his mother-in-law fell on his legs as he lay asleep under a tree. The awe and dread with which the untutored savage contemplates his mother-in-law are amongst the most familiar facts of anthropology. In the Yuin tribes of New South Wales, the rule which forbade a man to hold any communication with his wife's mother was very strict. He might not look at her, or even in her direction. It was a ground of divorce if his shadow happened to fall on his mother-in-law. In that case, he had to leave his wife, and she returned to her parents. In the Hunter River tribes of New South Wales, it was formerly death for a man to speak to his mother-in-law. However, in later times, the wretch who had committed this heinous crime was suffered to live, but he was severely reprimanded and banished for a time from the camp. In the Kulin tribe, it was thought that if a woman looked at or spoke to her mother-in-law or even his brother, her hair would turn white. The same result, it was supposed, would fall if she ate of game which had been presented to her husband by her son-in-law. But she could obviate this ill consequence by blackening her face and especially her mouth with charcoal, for then her hair would not turn white. Similarly, in the Kurne tribe of Victoria, a woman is not permitted to see her daughter's husband in camp or elsewhere. When he is present, she keeps her head covered with an opossum rug. The camp of the mother-in-law faces in a different direction to that of her son-in-law. A screen of high bushes is erected between both huts, so that no one can see over from either. When the mother-in-law goes for firewood, she crouches down as she goes out or in, with her head covered. In Uganda, a man may not see his mother-in-law, nor speak to her face to face. Should they meet by accident, she must turn aside and cover her head with her clothes, or if her garments are too scanty for that, she may squat on her haunches and hide her face in her hands. If he wishes to hold any communication with her, it must be done through a third person, or through a wall or closed door. Were he to break these rules, he would certainly be seized with a shaking of the hands and general debility. Amongst some tribes of Eastern Africa, which formerly acknowledged a suzerainty of the Sultan of Zanzibar, before a young couple had children, they might meet neither their father-in-law nor their mother-in-law. To avoid them, they must take a long roundabout. But if they could not do that, they must throw themselves on the ground and hide their faces till the father or mother-in-law had passed by. Among the Masutos, a man may never meet his wife's mother, nor speak to her, nor see her. If his wife is ill and a mother comes to nurse her, he must flee the house so long as she is in it. Sentinels are posted to warn him of her departure. In New Britain, the native imagination fails to conceive the extent and nature of the calamities which would result from a man's accidentally speaking to his wife's mother. Suicide of one or both would probably be the only course open to them. The most solemn form of oath a New Briton can take is, Sir, if I am not telling the truth, I hope I may shake hands with my mother-in-law. At Vanuai Lava, in the Banks Islands, a man would not so much follow his mother-in-law along the beach until the rising tide had washed out her footprints in the sand. To avoid meeting his mother-in-law face to face, a very desperate departure Indian, one of the bravest of the brave, has been seen to clamber along the brink of a precipice at the risk of his life. Hanging on the rocks from which he had fallen, he would have been dashed to pieces, or at least have broken several of his limbs. Still more curious and difficult to explain is the rule which forbids certain African kings, after the coronation ceremonies have been completed, ever to see their own mothers again. This restriction was imposed on the kings of Benin and Uganda, yet the queen mothers lived in a regal state with a court and lands of their own. In Uganda it was thought that if the king were to see his mother again, some evil and probably death would surely befall him. A man's health and strength supposed to vary with the length of his shadow. Where the shadow is regarded as so intimately bound up with the life of the man, that its loss entails debility or death, 
it is natural to expect that its diminution should be regarded with solicitude and apprehension, as betokening a corresponding decrease in the vital energy of its owner. An elegant Greek rhetorician has compared the man who lives only for fame to one who should set all his heart on his shadow, puffed up and boasted when it lengthened, sad and dejected when it shortened, wasted and penning away when it dwindled to nothing. The spirits of such as one, he goes on, would necessarily be volatile, since they must rise or fall with every passing hour of the day. In the morning, when the level sun, just risen above the eastern horizon, stretched out his shadow to enormous length, rivaling the shadows cast by the cypresses and the towers on the city wall, how blithe and exultant would he be, fancying that in stature he had become a match for the fabled giants of old. With what a lofty port he would then strut and show himself in the streets and the marketplace, and wherever men congregated, that he might be seen and admired of all. But as the day wore on, his countenance would change, and he would sink back crestfallen to his house. At noon, when his once towering shadow had shrunk to his feet, he would shut himself up and refuse to stir abroad, ashamed to look his fellow townsmen in the face. But in the afternoon his drooping spirits would revive, and as the day declined his joy and pride would swell again with the length of the evening shadows. The rhetorician who thus sought to expose the vanity of fame as an object of human ambition by likening it to an ever-changing shadow little dreamed that in real life there would be men who set almost as much store by their shadows as the fool whom he had conjured up in his imagination to point to moral. So hard is it for the straining wings of fancy to outstrip the folly of mankind. In Ambonia and Uliès, two islands near the equator, where necessarily there is little or no shadow cast at noon, the people make it a rule not to go out of their house at midday, because they fancy that by doing so, a man may lose the shadow of his soul. The Mangaeans tell of a mighty warrior, Tukatawa, whose strength waxed and waned with the length of his shadow. In the morning when his shadow fell longest, his strength was greatest. But, as the shadow shortened towards noon, his strength ebbed with it, till exactly at noon it reached its lowest point. Then, as the shadow stretched out in the afternoon, his strength returned. A certain hero discovered the secret of Tukitawa's strength and slew him at noon. The savage Basisis of the Malay Peninsula feared to bury their dead at noon because they fancied that the shortness of their shadows at that hour would sympathetically shorten their own lives. The beginner of Central Africa used to judge of a man's health by the length of his shadow. They say, so and so is going to die, his shadow is very small, or he is in good health, his shadow is large. Similarly, the Kafirs of South Africa think that a man's shadow grows very small or vanishes at death. When a husband is away at the wars, a woman hangs up his sleeping mat. If the shadow grows less, she says that her husband is killed. If it remains unchanged, she says he is unscathed. Fear of the loss of the shadow It is possible that even in lands outside the tropics, the observation of the diminished shadow at noon may have contributed, even if it did not give rise to the superstitious dread with which that hour has been viewed by many peoples, as by the Greeks, ancient and modern, the Britons, the Russians, the Romanians of Transylvania, and the Indians of Santiago de Bucan. In this observation, too, we may perhaps detect the reason why noon was chosen by the Greeks as the hour for sacrificing to the shadowless dead. The loss of the shadow real or apparent, has often been regarded as a cause or precursor of death. Whoever entered the sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Lysias in Arcadia was believed to lose his shadow and to die within the year. In Low Austria, on the evening of St. Sylvester's Day, the last day of the year, the company seated round the table mark whose shadow is not cast on the wall and believe that the seemingly shadowless person will die next year. Similar presages are drawn in Germany both on St. Sylvester's Day and on Christmas Eve. Fear of the resemblance of a child to its parents The Galileans fancy that if a child resembles his father, they will not both live long, for the child has taken away his father's likeness or shadow, and consequently the father must soon die. Similarly, among some tribes of the lower Congo, if the child is like its mother, father or uncle, they think it has the spirit to the person it resembles, and that that person will soon die, as the parent will resent it if you say that the baby is like him or her. 
The shadows of people built into foundations to strengthen the edifices. Nowhere perhaps does the equivalence of the shadow to the life or soul come out more clearly than in some customs practiced to this day in southeastern Europe. In modern Greece, when the foundation of a new building has been laid, it is a custom to kill a cock, a ram, or a lamb, and to let its blood flow on the foundation stone under which the animal is afterwards buried. The object of the sacrifice is to give strength and stability to the building, but sometimes instead of killing an animal, the builder entices a man to the foundation stone, secretly measures his body, or a part of it, or his shadow, and buries the measure under the foundation stone, or he lays the foundation stone upon the man's shadow. It is believed that the man will die within the year. In the island of Lesbos, it is deemed enough if the builder merely casts a stone at the shadow of a passerby. The man whose shadow is thus struck will die, but the building will be solid. A Bulgarian mason measures the shadow of a man with a string, places the string in a box, and then builds a box into the wall of the edifice. Within forty days thereafter, the man whose shadow is measured will be dead, and his soul will be in the box beside the string but often will come forth and appear in its former shape to persons who were born on a Saturday. If a Bulgarian builder cannot obtain a human shadow for this purpose, he will content himself with measuring the shadow of the first animal that comes that way. The Romanians of Transylvania think that he whose shadow is thus immured will die within forty days, so persons passing by a building which is in course of erection may hear a warning cry, Beware lest they take thy shadow. Not long ago, there were still shadow traders whose business it was to provide architects with the shadows necessary for securing their walls. In these cases, the measure of the shadow is looked on as equivalent to the shadow itself, and to bury it is to bury the life or soul of the man who, deprived of it, must die. Living people built into foundations to serve as guardian spirits. Thus the custom is a substitute for the old practice of immuring a living person in the walls or crush him under the foundation stone of a new building in order to give strength and durability to the structure, or more definitely, in order that the angry ghost may haunt the place and guard it against the intrusion of enemies. Thus, when a new gate was made, or an old gate was repaired in the walls of Bangkok, it used to be customary to crush three men to death under enormous beam in a pit at the gateway. Before they were led to their doom, they were regaled at a splendid banquet. The whole court came to salute them, and the king himself charged them straightly to guard well the gate that was to be committed to their care, and to warn him if enemies or rebels came to assault the city. The next moment the ropes were cut and the beam descended on them. The Siamese believed that these unfortunates were transformed into the genie, which they called Fi. It is said that when the massive teak posts in the gateways of Maladay were set up, a man was bound and placed under each post and crushed to death. The Burmese believe that men who die a violent death turn into nuts or demons and haunt the spot where they were killed, doing a mischief to such as attempt to molest the place. Thus their spirits became guardians of the gates. This theory would explain why such sacrifices appear to be offered most commonly at thoroughfares such as gates and bridges where ghostly warders may be deemed especially serviceable in keeping watch on the multitudes that go to and fro. In Bima, a district of the East Indian island of Sambawa, the custom is marked by some peculiar features which deserve to be mentioned. When a new flagpole is set up at the Sultan's palace, a woman is crushed to death under it, but she must be pregnant. If the destined victim should be brought to bed before her execution, she goes free. The notion may be that the ghost of such a woman will be more than usually fierce and vigilant. Again, when the wooden doors are set up at the palace, it is customary to bury a child under each of the doorposts. For these purposes, officers are sent to scale the country for a pregnant woman or little children, as the case may be, and if they come back empty-handed, they must give up their own wives or children to serve as victims. When the gates are set up, the children are killed, their bodies stripped of flesh, and their bones laid in the holes, in which the doorposts are erected, and the flesh is boiled with horse's flesh and served up to the officers. Any officer who refuses to eat of it is at once cut down. The intention of this last practice is perhaps to secure the fidelity of the officers 
but compelling them to enter into a covenant of the most solemn and binding nature with the ghosts of the murdered children who are to guard the gates. Deification of a measuring tape The practice of burying the measure of a man's shadow as a substitute for the man himself under the foundation stone of a building may perhaps throw light on the singular deity who in the people of Kisser, an East Indian island, choose to guard their houses and villages. The god in question is nothing more or less than the measuring tape which was used to measure the foundations of the house or of the village temple. After it has served this usual purpose, the tape is wound about a stick shaped like a paddle and is then deposited in the thatch of the roof of the house where food is offered to it on all special occasions. The deified measuring tape of the whole village is that which was used to measure the foundations of the first house or of the village temple. The handle of the paddle-like stick on which it is wound is carved into the figure of a person squatting in the usual posture, and the whole is kept in a rough wooden box along with one or two figures to act as its guards. It is possible, though perhaps highly probable, that these tastes may be thought to contain the souls of men whose shadows may be measured at the foundation ceremony. The soul sometimes supposed to be in the reflection. As some peoples believe a man's soul to be in his shadow, so other, or the same peoples believe it to be in his reflection in water or a mirror. Thus the Anamanes do not regard their shadows but their reflections in any mirror as their souls. According to one account, some of the Fijians thought that man has two souls, a light one and a dark one. The dark one goes to haze the light one in his reflection in water or a mirror. When the Motumotu of New Guinea first saw their likeness in a looking glass, they thought that their reflections were their souls. In New Caledonia, the old men are of opinion that a person's reflection in water or a mirror is his soul, but the younger men, taught by the Catholic priests, maintain that it is a reflection and nothing more, just like the reflection of palm trees in the water. Dangers to which the reflection soul is exposed The reflection soul, being external to the man, is exposed to much the same dangers as the shadow soul. Among the gay Louis, half-grown lads and girls may not look at themselves in a mirror, for they say that the mirror takes away their bloom and leaves them ugly. And as the shadow may be stabbed, so may the reflection. As an Aztec mode of keeping sorcerers from the house was to leave a vessel of water with a knife in it before the door. When a sorcerer entered, he was so much alarmed at seeing his reflection in the water transfixed by a knife that he turned and fled. In Cordes, a district of the Auvergne, a cow's milk had dried up through the malficient spells of a neighbouring witch, so a sorcerer was called in to help. He made the woman whose cow was bewitched sit in front of the pail of water with a knife in her hand till she thought she saw the image of the witch in the water, whereupon he made her stab the image with the knife. They say that if the knife strikes the image fair in the eye, the person whose likeness it will suffer, a corresponding injury to his or her eye. This procedure, we are informed, has been successful in restoring milk to the udders of a cow when even holy water had been tried in vain. The Zulus will not look into a dark pool because they think there is a beast in it which will take away their reflections so that they die. The Basudus say that crocodiles have the power of thus killing a man by dragging his reflection under water. When one of them dies suddenly and from no apparent cause, his relatives will allege that a crocodile must have taken his shadow some time when he crossed a stream. In Saddle Island, Melanesia, there is a pool into which anyone who looks, he dies. The malignant spirit takes hold upon his life by means of his reflection on the water. Dread of looking at one's reflection in water. We can now understand why it was a maxim, both in ancient India and ancient Greece, not to look at one's reflection in water, and why the Greeks regarded it as an omen of death that the man dreamed of seeing himself so reflected. They feared that the water spirits would drag the person's reflection or soul under water, leaving him soulless to perish. This is probably the origin of the classical story of the beautiful Narcissus, who languished and died through seeing his reflection in the water. The explanation that he died for love of his own fair image was probably devised later, after the old meaning of the story was forgotten. The same ancient belief lingers in a faded form in the English superstition that whoever sees a water fairy must pine and die. Alas, the moon should ever be, to show what man should never see. A swarm maiden on a stream 
and fair was she. I stayed to watch a little space, her parted lips, if she would sing. The waters closed above her face, with many a ring. I know my life will fade away, I know that I must faintly pine, for I am made of mortal clay, but she is divine. Reason for covering our mirrors or turning them to the wall after death. Further, we can now explain the widespread custom of covering up mirrors or turning them to the wall after a death has taken place in the house. It is feared that the soul, projected out of the person in the shape of his reflection in the mirror, may be carried off by the ghost of the departed, which is commonly supposed to linger about the house till the burial. The custom is thus exactly parallel to the rude custom of not sleeping in a house after death for fear that the soul, projected out of the body in a dream, may meet the ghost and be carried off by it. In Oldenburg, it is thought that if a person sees his image in a mirror after a death, he will die himself. So all the mirrors in the house are covered up with white cloth. In some parts of Germany and Belgium, after death, not only the mirrors but everything that shines or glitters, windows, cloths, etc., is covered up, doubtless because they might reflect a person's image. The same custom of covering up mirrors or turning them to the wall after death prevails in England, Scotland, Madagascar, and among the Karaites, a Jewish sect in the Crimea. The Sunni Mohammedans of Bombay cover with a cloth the mirror in the room of a dying man and do not remove it until the corpse is carried out for burial. They also cover the looking glasses in their bedroom before retiring to rest at night. The reason why sick people should not see themselves in a mirror, and why the mirror in a sick room is therefore covered up is also plain. In time of sickness, when the soul might take flight so easily, it is particularly dangerous to project it out of the body by means of the reflection in a mirror. The rule is therefore precisely parallel to the rule observed by some peoples of not allowing sick people to sleep. For in sleep, the soul is projected out of the body, and there is always a risk that it may not return. In the opinion of the rascal Nicks, a mirror is an accursed thing invented by the devil, perhaps on account of the mirror's supposed power of drawing out the soul in the reflection, and so facilitating its capture. The soul is sometimes supposed to be in the portrait. As with shadows and reflections, so with portraits, they often believe to contain the soul of the person portrayed. People hold this belief and naturally loath to have their likeness taken, for the portrait is the soul, or at least a vital part of the person portrayed. Whoever possesses the portrait will be able to exercise a fatal influence over the original of it. This belief among the Eskimos and the American Indians. Thus the Eskimos of Bering Strait believe that persons dealing in witchcraft have the power of stealing a man's inua or shade, so that without it he will pine away and die. Once a village on Lower Yukon River, an explorer had set up his camera to get a picture of the people as they were moving about among their houses. While he was focusing the instrument, the headman of the village came up and insisted on peeping under the cloth. Being able to do so, he gazed intently for a minute at the moving figures on the ground glass, then suddenly withdrew his head and bawled at the top of his voice to the people, He has all of your shades in this box. A panic ensued among this group, and in an instant they disappeared, helter skelter into their houses. The Dakotas hold that every man has several wanagi, or apparitions, of which after death one remains at the grave, while another goes to the place of the departed. For many years, no young Tong Dakota would consent to have his picture taken, lest one of his apparitions should remain after death in the picture instead of going to the spirit land. An Indian whose portrait of the Prince of Wade wished to get refused to let himself be drawn because he believed it would cause his death. The Mandan Indians also thought that they would soon die if their portraits were in the hands of another. They wished to at least have the artist's picture as a kind of hostage. The Tepehuanes of Mexico stood in mortal terror of the camera and five days' persuasion was necessary to induce them to pose for it. When at last they consented, they looked like criminals about to be executed. They believed that by photographing people, the artist could carry off their souls and devour them at his leisure moments. They said that when the pictures reached this country, they would die, or some other evil would befall them. The Catalans Indians of Ecuador think that their soul is carried away in their picture. Two of them who have been photographed were also alarmed that they came back next day on purpose to ask if it were really true that their souls had been taken away. 
Similar motions are entertained by the Aymara Indians of Peru and Bolivia. The Araucanians of Chile are unwilling to have their borders drawn, for they fancy that he who has their portraits in his possession could, by means of magic, injure or destroy themselves. The same belief in Africa. The Yaos, a tribe of British Central Africa, in the neighbourhood of Lake Nyasa, believe that every human being has a Lisoka, a soul shade or spirit which they appear to associate with a shadow or picture of the person. Some of them have been known to refuse to enter a room where pictures were hung on the walls, because the Masoka saw in them. The camera was at first an object of dread to them, and when it was turned on a group of natives, they scattered in all directions with shrieks of terror. They said that the European was about to take away their shadows, and that they would die. The transference of the shadow or portrait, for the yaw word, for the two is the same, to wit, chiwu lili, to the photographic plate would involve the disease or death of the shadeless body. The yaw chief, after much difficulty, allowed himself to be photographed on condition that the picture should be shown to none of his subjects, but sent out of the country as soon as possible. He feared lest some ill-wisher might use it to bewitch him. Some time afterwards he fell ill, and his attendants attributed the illness to some accident which had performed the photographic plate in England. The Nagoni of the same region entertained a similar belief, and formally exhibited a similar trait of sitting to a photographer, lest by doing so they should yield up their shades or spirits to him, and they should die. When Joseph Thompson attempted to photograph some of the white titia in Eastern Africa, they imagined that he was a magician trying to obtain possession of their souls, and that, if he got their likeness, they themselves would be entirely at his mercy. When Dr. Katat and some companions were exploring the Barra country on the west coast of Madagascar, the people suddenly became hostile. The day before the travellers, not without difficulty, had photographed the royal family, and now found themselves accused of taking the souls of the natives for the purpose of selling them when they returned to France. Denial was vain. In compliance with the custom of the country, they were obliged to catch the souls, which were then put into a basket and ordered by Dr. Katat to turn their respective owners. The same belief in Asia. Some villagers in Sikkim betrayed a lively horror and hid away whenever the lens of a camera, or the evil eye of the box, as they called it, was turned on them. They thought it took away their souls of their pictures, and so put it in the power of the owner of the pictures to cast spells on them and they alleged that a photograph of the scenery blighted the landscape. Until the reign of the late king of Sam, no Siamese coins were ever stamped with the image of the king. For at that time there was a strong prejudice against the making of portraits in any medium. Europeans who travel into the jungle have, even at the present time, only to point a camera at a crowd to procure its dispersion. When a copy of the face of a person is made and taken away from him, a portion of his life goes with the picture. Unless the sovereign has been blessed with the ears of Methuselah, he could scarcely have permitted his life to be distributed in small pieces together with the coins of the realm. Similarly, in Korea, the effigy of the king is not struck on the coins. Only a few Chinese characters are put on them. They would deem it an insult to the king to put his sacred face on objects which pass into the most vulgar hands and often roll on the ground in the dust or the mud. When the French ships arrived the first time in Korea, the Mandarin who was sent on board to communicate with them was dreadfully shocked to see the levity with which these western barbarians treated the face of their sovereign, reproduced on the coins, and the recklessness with which they put it in the hands of the first comer, without troubling themselves in the least whether or not he would show it due respect. The same belief in the East Indies. In Minahasa, a district of Salibs, Many chiefs are reluctant to be photographed, believing that if they were done, they would soon die. For they imagined that were the photograph lost by its owner and found by somebody else, whatever injury the finder chose to do to the portrait would equally affect the person whom it represented. Mortal terror was depicted on the faces of the batas, upon whom von Brenner turned the lens of his camera. They thought he wished to carry off their shadows or spirits in a little box. When Dr. Newenhorst attempted to photograph the Cayans or Bahoas of central Borneo. They were much alarmed, fearing that their souls would follow their photographs into the far country and that their deserted bodies would fall sick. 
Further, they imagined that, possessing their likeness, the explorer would be able by magic art to work on the originals at a distance. The same belief in Europe. Beliefs of the same sort still linger in various parts of Europe. Not very many years ago, some old women in the Greek island of Carpathus were very angry at having their likenesses drawn, thinking that in consequence they would pie and die. It is a German superstition that if you have your portrait painted, you will die. Some people in Russia object to having their silhouettes taken, fearing that if this is done, they will die before the year is out. In Albania, Mr. Kevin sketched an old man who boasted of being a hundred and ten years old. When everyone recognized the likeness, a look of great anxiety came over the patriarch's face, and most earnestly he besought the artist never to destroy the sketch, for he was certain the moment the sketch was drawn, he would drop down dead. An artist in England once vainly attempted to sketch a gypsy girl. I won't have her drawn out, said the girl's aunt. I told her I would make her scrawl the earth before me, if ever she let herself be drawn out again. Why, what harm can there be? I know that there's a fizz, a charm in it. There was my youngest, that the gorger drawed out on Newmarket Heath. She never held her head up, but was washed away and died, and she's buried in March churchyard. There are persons in west of Scotland who refuse to have their likeness taken, lest it prove unlucky, and give us instances the cases of several of their friends who never had a day's health after being photographed. End of section 4section five of the golden bough a study in magic and religion part two to in the perils of the soul by sir james george fraser this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter three tabooed acts section one taboos on intercourse with strangers Primitive conceptions of the soul helped to mould early kingships by dictating rules to be observed by their king for his soul's salvation. So much for the primitive conceptions of the soul and the dangers to which it is exposed. These conceptions are not limited to one people or country. With variations of detail, they are found all over the world and survive, as we have seen in modern Europe. Beliefs so deep-seated and so widespread must necessarily have contributed to shape the mould in which the early kingship was cast. For if every person was at such pains to save his own soul from the perils which threatened it on so many sides, how much more carefully must he have been guarded upon whose life hung the welfare, and even the existence of the whole people, and whom therefore it was a common interest of all to preserve. Therefore we should expect to find the king's life protected by a system of precautions or safeguards, still more numerous and minute than those which, in primitive society, every man adopts the safety of his own soul. Now, in point of fact, the life of the early kings is regulated, as we have seen, and shall see more fully presently, by a very exact code of rules. We may not then conjecture that these rules are, in fact, the very safeguards which we should expect to find adopted for the protection of the king's life. An examination of the rules themselves confirms this conjecture. For from this, it appears that some of the rules observed by the kings are identical to those observed by private persons out of regard for the safety of their souls, and even of those which seem peculiar to the king. Many, if not all, are most readily explained on the hypothesis that they are nothing but safeguards or lifeguards of the king. I will not enumerate some of these royal rules or taboos, offering each of them such comments and explanations as may serve to set the original intention of the rule in its proper light. The general effect of these rules is to isolate the king, especially from strangers. As the object of the royal taboos is to isolate the king from all sources of danger, their general effect is to compel him to live in a state of seclusion, more or less complete, according to the number and stringency of the rules he observes. The savage fears the magic arts of strangers and hence guards himself against them. Now of all sources of danger, None are more dreaded by the savage than magic and witchcraft, and he suspects all strangers of practising these black arts. To guard against the baneful influence exerted voluntarily or involuntarily by strangers, 
is therefore an elementary dictate of savage prudence. Various modes of disenchanting strangers. Hence, before strangers are allowed to enter a district, or at least before they are permitted to mingle freely with the inhabitants, certain ceremonies are often performed by the natives of the country for the purpose of disarming the strangers of their magical powers, of counteracting the baneful influence which is believed to emanate from them, of disinfecting, so to speak, the tainted atmosphere by which they are supposed to be surrounded. Thus, when the ambassadors sent by Justin II, Emperor of the East, to conclude a peace with the Turks, had reached their destination, they were received by shamans, who subjected them to a ceremonial purification for the purpose of exercising all harmful influence. Having deposited the goods brought by the ambassadors in an open place, these wizards carried burning branches of incense round them, while they rang a bell and beat on a tambourine, snorting and falling into a state of frenzy in their efforts to dispel the powers of evil. Afterwards, they purified the ambassadors themselves by leading them through the flames. In the island of Nanumia, South Pacific, strangers from ships or from other islands are not allowed to communicate with the people until they all, or a few as representatives of the rest, had been taken to each of the four temples in the island, and prayers of it that the god would avert any disease or treachery which these strangers might have brought with them. Made offerings were also laid upon the altars, accompanied by songs and dances in honour of the god. While these ceremonies were going on, all the people except the priests and their attendants kept out of sight. On returning from an attempted ascent to the great African mountain Kilimanjaro, which is believed by the neighbouring tribes to be tenanted by dangerous demons, Mr. New and his party, as soon as they reached the border of the inhabited country, were disenchanted by the inhabitants, being sprinkled with a professionally prepared liquor supposed to possess the potency of neutralising evil influences and removing the spell of wicked spirits. In the interior of Yoruba, West Africa, the sentinels at the gates of towns often oblige European travellers to wait till nightfall before they admit them, fearing that if the strangers were admitted by day, the devil would enter behind them. The whole Malafale country of Madagascar used to be taboo to strangers of the white race. The natives imagining that the intrusion of a white man would immediately cause the death of their king. The traveller bastard had the greatest difficulty in overcoming the reluctance of the natives to allow him to enter their land, and especially to visit their holy city. Amongst the Ot Damons of Borneo, it is the custom that strangers entering the territory should pay the natives a certain sum, which is spent in the sacrifice of buffaloes or pigs to the spirits of the land and water, in order to reconcile them to the presence of the strangers, and to induce them not to withdraw their favour from the people of the country, but to bless the rice harvest, and so forth. The men of a certain district in Borneo, fearing to look upon a European traveller, lest he should make them ill, warned their wives and children not to go near him. Those who could not restrain their curiosity killed towels to appease evil spirits and smeared themselves with the blood. More dreaded, says a traveller in central Borneo, than the evil spirits of the neighbourhood are the evil spirits from a distance which accompany travellers. When accompanied from the middle Mahakam River, visited me among the Blue Cayans in the year 1897, no woman showed herself outside her house without burning a bundle of bleheading bark, the stinking smoke of which drives away evil spirits. In Laos, before a stranger can be accorded hospitality, the master of the house must offer sacrifice to the ancestral spirits, otherwise the spirits would be offended, and would send a disease on the inmates. When Madame Fether arrived at the village of Halle Bonar among the Batas of Sumatra, a buffalo was killed and the liver offered to her. Then a ceremony was performed to propitiate the evil spirits. Two young men danced, and one of them in dancing sprinkled water from a buffalo's horn on the visitor and the spectators. In the Mentawi Islands, when a stranger enters a house where there are children, the father or other member of the family takes the ornament which the children wear in their hair and hands it to the stranger, who holds it in his hands for a while and gives it back to him. This is thought to protect the children from the evil effect which the sight of a stranger might have upon them. When a Dutch steamship was approaching their villages, the people of Bayak, an island of the north coast of New Guinea, shook and knocked their idols about in order to ward off ill luck. At Shepherd's Isle, Captain Mosby had to be disenchanted before he was allowed to land his boat's crew. 
When he leaped ashore, a devil man seized his right hand and waved a bunch of palm leaves over the captain's head. Then he placed the leaves in my left hand, putting a small green twig in his mouth, still holding me fast. Then, as if with great effort, drew the twig from his mouth. Then he placed the leaves in my left hand, putting a small green twig into his mouth, still holding me fast, and then, as if with great effort, drew the twig from his mouth. This was extracting the evil spirit, out of which he blew violently, as if to speed it away. I now held a twig between my teeth, and he went through the same process. Then the two raced round a couple of sticks fixed on the ground, and bent to an angle at the top, which had leaves tied to it. Out of some more ceremonies, the devil man concluded by leaping to the level of Captain Moresby's shoulders, his hand resting on the captain's shoulders several times, as if to show that he had conquered the devil, and was now trampling him into the earth. North American Indians have an idea that strangers, particularly white strangers, are oftentimes accompanied by evil spirits. Of these they have great dread, as creating and delighting in mischief. One of the duties of the medicine chief is to exercise his spirits. I have sometimes ridden to or through a camp where I was unknown or unexpected, to be confronted by a tall, half-naked savage, standing in the middle of the circle of lodges, and yelling in a sing-song, nasal tone, a string of unintelligible words. Disenchantment affected by means of stinging ants and pungent spices. When Creveaux was travelling in South America, he entered a village of the Apali Indians. A few moments after his arrival, some of the Indians brought him a number of large black ants, a species whose bite is painful, fastened to palm leaves. Then all the people of the village, without distinction of age or sex, presented themselves to him, and he had to sting then more with the ants on their faces, thighs, and other parts of their bodies. Sometimes when he applied the ants too tenderly, they called out, More, more, and were not satisfied till their skin was thickly studded with tiny swellings, like what might have been produced by whipping them with metals. The object of this ceremony is made plain by the custom observed in Abonia and Uliers, of sprinkling sick people with pungent spices, such as ginger and cloves, chewed fine in order by the prickling sensation to drive away the demon of disease which may be clinging to their persons. In Java, a popular cure for grout or rheumatism is to rub Spanish pepper into the nails of the fingers and toes of the sufferer. The potency of the pepper is supposed to be too much for the gout or rheumatism, who accordingly departs in haste. So on the slave coast of Africa, the mother of a sick child sometimes believes that an evil spirit has taken possession of the child's body in order to drive him out. She makes small cuts in the body of the little sufferer and inserts green peppers or spices into the wounds, believing that she will thereby hurt the evil spirit and force him to be gone. The poor child naturally screams with pain, but the mother hardens her heart in the belief that the demon is suffering equally. In Hawaii, a patient is sometimes pricked with bamboo needles for the sake of hurting and expelling a refractory demon who is lurking in the sufferer's body and making him ill. Disenchantment averted by cuts of knives. Dayak sorceresses in southeastern Borneo will sometimes slash the body of a sick man with sharp knives in order to set to allow the demon of disease to escape through the cuts. But perhaps the notion rather is to make the present quarters of the spirit too hot for him. With a similar intention, some of the natives of Borneo and Salib sprinkled rice upon the head or body of a person supposed to be infested by dangerous spirits. A fowl is in board, which, by picking up the rice from the person's head or body, removes along with it the spirit or ghost which is clinging like a bird to his skin. This is done, for example, to persons who have attended a funeral, and who may therefore be supposed to be infested by the ghost of the deceased. Similarly, basutos, who have carried a corpse to the grave, have their hands scratched with a knife from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the forefinger, and magic stuff is rubbed into the wound. For this purpose, no doubt, of removing the ghost, which may be adhering to their skin. Among the Barots of southeastern Africa, a few days after a funeral, the sorcerer makes an incision in the forehead of each surviving member of the family, and fills it with medicine, in order to ward off contagion, and the effect of the sorcery which caused the death. When elephant hunters in East Africa have killed an elephant, they get upon its carcass, make little cuts in their toes, a rub gunpowder into the cuts. This is done with the double intention of counteracting any evil influence that may emanate from the dead elephant, 
and of acquiring thereby the fleetness of foot possessed by the animal in its life. The people of Nias carefully scrub and scour the weapons and clothes which they buy, in order to efface all connection between the things and the persons from whom they bought them. Ceremonies observed at the reception of strangers may sometimes be intended to counteract their enchantments. It is probable that the same dread of strangers, rather than any desire to do them honour, is a motive of certain ceremonies which are sometimes observed at their reception, but of which the intention is not directly stated. In the Ongtong Java Islands, which are inhabited by Polynesians and lie a little to the north of the Solomon Islands, the priests, or sorcerers, seem to wield great influence. The main business is to summon or exercise spirits for the purpose of averting or dispelling sickness, and of procuring favourable winds, a good catch of fish, and so on. When strangers land on the islands, they are first of all received by the sorcerers, sprinkled with water, anointed with oil, and girded with dried pandanos leaves. At the same time, sand and water are freely thrown about in all directions, and the newcomer and his boat are wiped with green leaves. Of this ceremony, the strangers are introduced by the sorcerers to the chief. In Afghanistan and in some parts of Persia, the traveller, before he enters a village, is frequently received with a sacrifice of animal life for food, or of fire and incense. The Afghan boundary mission, in passing by villages in Afghanistan, was often met with fire and incense. Sometimes a tray of lighted embers is thrown under the hoofs of the traveller's horse, with the words, You are welcome. On entering a village in Central Africa, Amin Pasha was received with the sacrifice of two goats. Their blood was sprinkled on the path, and the chief stepped over the blood to greet Amin. Before strangers entered the country or city of Benin, custom compelled them to have their feet washed. Sunrise of Samaria was performed in a sacred place amongst the Eskimos of Cumberland Inlet. When a stranger arrived at an encampment, the sorcerer goes out to meet him. The stranger folds his arms and inclines his head to one side so as to expose his cheek, upon which the magician deals a terrible blow, sometimes felling him to the ground. Next, the sorcerer in his turn presents his check to the smitter and receives a buffet from the stranger. Then they kiss each other, the ceremony is over, and the stranger is hospitably received by all. Sometimes the dread of strangers and their magic is too great to allow for their reception on any terms. Thus, when Speck arrived at a certain village, the natives shut their doors against him because they had never seen before a white man, nor the tin boxes that the men were carrying. Who knows, they said, but that these very boxes are the plundering Watuta transformed and come to kill us. You cannot be admitted. No persuasion could avail with them, and the party had to proceed to the next village. Ceremony is observed at entering a strange land it is enchanted. The fear thus entertained of alien visitors is often mutual. Entering a strange land, the savage feels that he is treading enchanted ground, and he takes steps to guard against the demons that haunt it, and the magical arts of its inhabitants. Thus on going to a strange land, the Maoris performed certain ceremonies to make it Noah, common, lest it might have been previously tapu, sacred. When the Baron Mikluko Maclay was approaching a village on the Maclay coast of New Guinea, one of the natives who accompanied him broke a branch from a tree and coming aside and whispered to it for a while, then stepped up to each member of the party, one after another. He spat something upon his back and gave him some blows with the branch. Lastly, he went into the forest and buried the branch under withered leaves in the thickest part of the jungle. This ceremony was believed to protect the party against all treachery and danger in the village they were approaching. The idea probably was that the malignant influences were drawn off from the persons into the branch and buried with it in the depths of the forest. Before Stolman and his companions entered the territory of the Wanyamesi in Central Africa, one of his men killed a white cock and buried it in a pot just at the boundary. In Australia, when a strange tribe has been invited into a district and is approaching the encampment of the tribe which owns the land, the strangers carry lighted bark or burning sticks in their hands, for the purpose, they say, of clearing and purifying the air. On the coast of Victoria, there is a tract of country between the Latrobe River and the Yarra River, which some of the Aborigines call the Bad Country. It was supposed to act injuriously on strangers. Hence, when a man of another clan entered it, he needed some of the natives to look after him, and if his guardian went away from the camp, he deputed another to take his place. 
ceremonies at entering a strange land are disenchanted or to propitiate the local spirits. During his first visit, before he became, as it were, acclimatized, visitor did nothing for himself as to food, drinking water or lodging. He was painted with a band of white pipe clay across the face below the eyes, and to learn the new lit language before going further. He slept on a thick layer of leaves so that he should not touch the ground, and was fed with flesh meat from the point of a burnt stick, which he removed with his teeth, not with his lips. His drinking water was drawn from a small hole in the ground by his entertainers, and they made it muddy by stirring it with a stick. It might only take three mouthfuls at a time, each of which he had to let slowly trickle down his throat. If he did otherwise, his throat would close up. The Kenyans and Kenyas of Borneo think it well to conciliate the spirit of the land when they enter a strange country. The old men, indeed, trusting to the protection afforded by omens, are in little need of further aid. But when young boys are brought into a new river of importance, the hospitality of the local demons is invoked. The Kayans make an offering of fowl's eggs, which must not be bought on the spot, but are carried from the house, sometimes for distances so long that the devotion of the travellers is more apparent than their presence to the spirit of the land. Each boy takes an egg and puts it in a bamboo, split at the end into four, while one of the older men calls upon the hills, rocks, trees, and streams to hear him and to witness the offering. Careful to disguise the true nature of the gift, he speaks of it as Ove, a yam using a form of words fixed by usage. Omen bird, he shouts into the air, we have brought you these boys. It is on their account only that we have prepared this feast. Harm them not, make things go pleasantly, and they give you the usual offerings of a yam. I give this to the country. The little ceremonies performed behind the hut where the night is spent, and the boys wait about it for the charm to take effect. The custom of the Kenyas shows the same feeling for the unknown and unseen spirits that are supposed to abound. A fowl's feathers, one for each boy, are held by an old man, while the youngsters touch his arm. The invocation is quite a powerful example of native rhetoric. Smooth away trouble, ye mystic mountains, hills, valleys, soil, rocks, trees. Shield the lives of the children who have come hither. When the Torajas of central Salibs are on a head-hunting expedition, and have entered the enemy's country, they may not eat any fruits which the foe has planted, nor any animal which he has reared, until they have first commented an act of hostility, as by burning a house or killing a man. They think that if they broke this rule, they would receive something of the soul or spiritual essence of the enemy into themselves, which would destroy the mystic virtue of their talismans. It is said that just before Greek armies advanced to the shock of battle, a man bearing a lighted torch stepped out from either side and threw his torch into the space between the hosts. Then they retired unmolested, for they were thought to be sacred to Ares and inviolable. Now some peoples fancy that when they advance to battle, the spirits of their fathers hold them in the van. Hence fire thrown out in front of the line of battle may be meant to disperse these shadowy combatants, leaving the issue of the fight to be determined by more substantial weapons than ghosts can wield. Similarly, the fire which is sometimes borne at the head of an army is perhaps in some cases intended to dissipate the evil influences, whether magical or spiritual, with which the air of the enemy's country may be conceived to teem. Purifactory Ceremonies Observed on the Return from a Journey Again it is thought that a man who has been on a journey may have contracted some magic evil from the strangers with whom he has been brought into contact. Hence, on returning home, before he is readmitted to the society of his tribe and friends, he has to undergo certain purifactory ceremonies. Thus the Bekoanas cleanse or purify themselves after journeys by shaving their heads, etc., lest they should have contracted from strangers some evil by witchcraft or sorcery. In some parts of Western Africa, when a man returns home after a long absence, before he is allowed to visit his wife, he must wash his person with a particular fluid, and receive from the sorcerer a certain mark on his forehead, in order to counteract any magic spell which a stranger and woman may have cast on him in his absence, and which might be communicated through him to the women of his village. Every year about one-third of the men of the Wanyamwezi tribe make journeys to the east coast of Africa 
either as porters or as traffickers. Before he sets out, the husband smears his cheeks with a sort of meal porridge, and during his absence his wife may eat no flesh, and must keep for him the sediment of the porridge in the pot. On their return from the coast, the men sprinkle meal every day on all the paths leading to the camp, from the purpose, it is supposed, of keeping evil spirits off. And when they reach their homes, the men again smear porridge on their faces, while the women who have stayed at home strew ashes on their heads. In Uganda, when a man returns from a journey, his wife takes some of the bark clothes from the bed of one of his children and lays them on her husband's bed. And as he enters the house, he jumps over one of his wives, who has children by him, or over one of his children. If he neglects to do this, one of his children or one of his wives will die. When Damaras return home after a long absence, they are given a small portion of the fat of particular animals, which is supposed to possess certain virtues. A story is told of an Avajo Indian, who after long wanderings returned to his own people when he came within sight of his house. His people made him stop and told him not to approach nearer till they had summoned a shaman. When the shaman was come, ceremonies were performed over the returned wanderer, and he was washed from head to foot and dried with cornmeal. For thus do the Navajo treat all who return to their homes from captivity with another tribe, in order that all alien substances and influences may be removed from them. When he has thus been purified, he entered the house, and his people embraced him and wept over him. Two Hindu ambassadors, who had been sent to England by a native prince, and returned to India, were considered to have so polluted themselves by contract with strangers that nothing but being born again could restore them to purity. For the purpose of regeneration, it is directed to make an image of pure gold of the female power of nature, in the shape of either a woman or of a cow. In this statue, the person to be regenerated is enclosed and dragged through the usual channel. As a statue of pure gold and of proper dimensions will be too expensive, it is sufficient to make an image of the sacred yoni through which the person to be regenerated is to pass. Such an image of pure gold was made at the prince's command. His ambassadors were born again by being dragged through it. In some of the Malakas, when a brother or young blood relation returns from a long journey, a young girl awaits him at a door, with a kaladi leaf in her hand, and water in the leaf. She throws the water over his face and bids him welcome. Among the Kayans of Borneo, men who have been absent on a long journey are secluded for four days in a small hut made especially for the purpose before they are allowed to enter their own house. The natives of Savage Island, South Pacific, invariably killed not only all strangers in distress who were drifted to their shores, but also any of their own people who had gone away in a ship and returned home. This was done out of dread of disease. Long after they began to venture out to ships, they would not immediately use the things they obtained from them, but hung them in quarantine for weeks in the bush. Special precautions taken to guard the king against the magic of strangers. When precautions like these are taken on behalf of the people in general against the malignant influence supposed to be exercised by strangers, it is no wonder that special measures are adopted to protect the king from the same insidious danger. In the Middle Ages, the envoys who visited the Tartar Khan were obliged to pass between two fires before they were admitted to his presence, and the gifts they brought were also carried between the fires. The reason assigned for the custom was that the fire purged away any magic influence which the strangers might mean to exercise over the Khan. When the subject chiefs came with their retinues to visit Kalama, the most powerful chief of the Bashalange in the Congo Basin, for the first time or after being rebellious, they have to bathe, men and women together, in two brooks on two successive days, passing the night under the open sky in the marketplace. After the second bath, they proceeded entirely naked to the house of Columba, which makes a long white mark on the breast and forehead of each of them. Then they return to the marketplace and dress, after which they undergo the pepper ordeal. Pepper is dropped into the eyes of each of them, and while this is being done, the sufferer has to make a confession of all his sins, to answer all questions that may be put to him, and to take certain vows. This ends the ceremony and the strangers are now free to take up their quarters in the town for as long as they choose to remain. Before strangers were admitted to the presence of Lobingula, king of the Matabels, they had to be treated with a sticky green medicine, which was profusely sprinkled over them by means of a cow's tail. 
At Kalema, in eastern Africa, when a stranger arrives, a medicine is made out of a certain plant, or a tree fetched from a distance mixed with the blood of a sheep or goat. With this mixture, the stranger is besmeared or besprinkled before he is admitted to the presence of the king. The king of Monomontapa in southeast Africa might not wear any foreign stuffs for fear of their being poisoned. The king of Kakongo in West Africa might not possess or even touch European goods except metals, arms, and articles made of wood or ivory. Persons wearing foreign stuffs wear a very cow or keep it at a distance from his person, lest they should touch him. The king of Leongo might not look upon the house of a white man. We have already seen how the native king of Fernando Po dwells secluded from all contact with the whites in the depths of an extinct volcano, shunning the very sight of a pale face which, in the belief of his subjects, would be instantly fatal to him. In a wild mountainous district of Java, to the south of Bantam, there is this small Aboriginal race who have been described as a living antiquity. These are the Baduis, who about the year 1443 fled from Bantam to escape conversion to Islam, and that mountain fastness, holding aloof from their neighbours, still cleave to the quaint and primitive ways of their heathen forefathers. Their villages are perched in spots which deep ravines, lofty precipices, raging torrents, and impenetrable forests combine to render almost inaccessible. Their hereditary ruler bears the title of Girang Pu An, and unites with his hands the temporal and spiritual power. He must never quit the capital, and none, even of his subjects who live outside the town, are ever allowed to see him. Where an alien has set foot in his dwelling, the place would be desecrated and abandoned. In former times, the representatives of the Dutch government and the region of Jama once paid a visit to the capital of Batuiz. That very night, all the people fled the place and never returned. Section 2. Taboos on Eating and Drinking Spiritual Dangers of Eating and Drinking and Precautions Taken Against Them In the opinion of savages, the act of eating and drinking are attempted with special danger, for at these times a soul may escape from the mouth or be extracted by the magic arts of an enemy present. Among the Uwe-speaking peoples of the slave coast, the common belief seems to be that the indwelling spirit leaves the body and returns to it through the mouth. Hence, should it have gone out, it behoves a man to be careful about opening his mouth, lest a homeless spirit should take advantage of the opportunity and enter his body. This, it appears, is considered most likely to take place while the man is eating. Precautions are therefore taken to guard against these dangers. Thus, of the Batas of Sumatra, it is said that since the soul can leave the body, they always take care to prevent their soul from straying on occasions when they have most need of it but it is only possible to prevent the soul from straying when one is in the house. At feasts one may find the whole house shut up in order that the soul, Tondi, may stay and enjoy the good things set before it. The Zafi Manilo in Madagascar lock their doors when they eat, and hardly anyone ever sees them eating. In Shoa, one of the southern provinces of Abyssinia, the doors of the house are scrupulously barred at meals to exclude the eye, and a fire is invariably lighted else devils would enter, and there would be no blessing on the meat. Every time an Abyssinian of rank drinks, a servant holds a cloth before his master to guard him from the evil eye. The Warura will not allow any one to see the meeting and drinking, being doubly particular that no person of the opposite sex shall see them doing so. I had to pay a man to let me see him drink. I could not make a man let a woman see him drink. When offered a drink of pombe, they often ask that a cloth may be held up to hide them whilst drinking. Further, every man and woman must cook for themselves. Each person must have his own fire. The Tuaregs of the Shahara never eat nor drink in presence of anyone else. The Thompson Indians of British Columbia thought that a shaman could bewitch them most easily when they were eating, drinking or smoking. Hence, they avoided doing any of these things in presence of an unknown shaman. In Fiji, Persons who suspected others of plotting against them avoided eating in their presence, or were careful to leave no fragment of food behind. Seclusion of kings and their meals If these are the ordinary precautions taken by common people, the precautions taken by kings are extraordinary. The king of 
Loango may not be seen eating or drinking by a man or beast under pain of death. A favourite dog having broken into the room where the king was dining, the king ordered to be killed on the spot. Once the king's own son, a boy of twelve years old, inadvertently saw the king drink. Immediately the king ordered him to be finally apparelled and feasted, after which he commanded him to be cut in quarters and carried about the city with the proclamation that he had seen the king drink. When the king has a mind to drink, he has a cup of wine brought. He that brings it has a bell in his hand, and as soon as he has delivered the cup to the king, he turns his face from him and rings the bell, on which all present fall down with their faces to the ground, and continue so till the king has drank. His eating is much in the same style, for which he has a house on purpose, where his victuals are set upon a benser or table, which he goes to and shuts the door. When he has done, he knocks and comes out so that none ever see the king eat or drink, for it is believed that, if any one should, the king shall immediately die. The remnants of his food are buried, doubtless to prevent them from falling into the hands of sorcerers, who by means of these fragments might cast a fatal spell over the monarch. The rules observed by the neighbouring king of Kekongo were similar, who saw that the king would die if any of his subjects were to see him drink. It is a capital offence to see the king of Dahomey at his meals. When he drinks in public, as he does on extraordinary occasions, he hides himself behind a curtain, or handkerchiefs are held up round his head, nor the people show themselves with their faces to the earth. Anyone who saw the Matua Jamwa, a great potentate in the Congo Basin, eating or drinking, would certainly be put to death. When the king, Mawata, or Kazama, raises his glass to his mouth to drink, all who are present prostrate themselves and avert their faces in such a manner as to not see him drinking. At Asaba, on the lower Niger, where the kings or chiefs number fully four hundred, no one is allowed to prepare the royal dishes. The chiefs act as their own cooks, and eat in the strictest privacy. The kings and royal family of Wallo, on the Senegal, never take their meals in public. It is expressly forbidden to see them eating. Among the Monbutu of Central Africa, the king invariably takes his meals in private. No one may see the contents of his dish and all that he leaves is carefully thrown to a pit set apart for that purpose. Everything that the king has handled is held sacred and may not be touched. When the king of Anyoro in Central Africa went to drink milk in the dairy, every man must leave the royal enclosure, and all the women had to cover their heads till the king returned. No one might see him drink. One wife accompanied him to the dairy and handed him the milk pot, but she turned away her face while he drained it. The king of Susa, a region in the south of Abyssinia, presides daily at the feast in a long banqueting hall, but is hidden from the gaze of his subjects by a curtain. Among the Uwe-speaking peoples of the slave coast, the person of the king is sacred, and if he drinks in public, everyone must turn away the head so as not to see him, while some of the women of the court hold up a cloth before him as a screen. He never eats in public, and the people pretend to believe that he neither eats nor sleeps. It is criminal to say the contrary. When the king of Tonga ate, all the people turned their backs to him. In the palace of the Persian kings, there were two dining rooms opposite each other. In one of them the king dined, in the other his guests. He could see them through the curtain on the door, but they could not see him. Generally the king took his meals alone, but sometimes his wife or some of his sons dined with him. Section 3. Taboos on Showing the Face Faces Veiled to Avert Evil Influences In some of the preceding cases, the intention of eating and drinking in strict seclusion may perhaps be to hinder evil influences from entering the body rather than to prevent the escape of the soul. This certainly is the motive of some drinking customs observed by natives of the Congo region. Thus we are told of these people, that there is hardly a native who would dare to swallow a liquid without first conjuring the spirits. One of them rings the bell all the time he is drinking. Another crouches down and places his left hand on the earth. Another veils his head. Another puts a stalk of grass or a leaf in his hair, or marks his forehead with a line of clay. This fetish custom assumes very varied forms. To explain them, the black is satisfied to say that they are an energetic mode of conjuring spirits. In this part of the world, a chief will commonly ring a bell at each draught of beer, which he swallows, 
and at the same moment a lead station in front of him brandishes a spear to keep at bay the spirits which might try to sneak into the old chief's body by the same road as a masanga beer the same mode of awarding off evil spirits probably explains the custom observed by some african sultans of veiling their faces the sultan of darfur wraps up his face with a piece of white muslin which goes round his head several times covering his mouth and nose first and then his forehead so that only his eyes are visible the same custom of veiling the face as a mark of sovereignty is said to be observed in other parts of central africa the sultan of wadi always speaks from behind a curtain no one sees his face except his intimates and a few favoured persons similarly the sultan of borno never showed himself to his people and only spoke to them from behind a curtain kings not to be seen by their subjects the king of chonga a town on the right bank of the niger above the aga may not be seen by his subjects nor by strangers at an interview he sits in his palace concealed by a mat which hangs like a curtain and from behind it he converses with his visitor the maiska indians of colombia had such a respect for their chiefs that they dared not lift their eyes on them but always turned their backs when they had to address them if a thief after repeated punishments proved incorrigible they took him to the chief and one of the nobles turned the culprit round said to him since you think yourself so great a lord that you have the right to break the laws you had the right to look at the chief from that moment the criminal was regarded as infamous nobody would have anything to do with him or even speak to him and he died an outcast montezuma was revered by his subjects as a god and he set so much store on their reverence that if on going out of the city he saw a man lift up his eyes on him he had the rash gazer put to death he generally lived in the retirement of his palace seldom showing himself on the days when he went to visit his gardens he was carried on a litter through a street which was enclosed by walls none but his bearers had the right to pass along the street it was a law of the medes that their king should be seen by nobody the king of jebu on the slave coast of west africa is surrounded by a great deal of mystery until lately his face could not be seen even by his own subjects and if circumstances compelled him to communicate with them he did so through a screen which concealed him from view now though his face may be seen it is customary to hide his body and at audiences a cloth is held before him so as to conceal him from the neck downwards and is raised so as to cover him altogether whenever he coughs sneezes spits or takes snuff his face is partially hidden by a conical cap with hanging strings of beads faces and especially mouths fail to avert evil influences amongst the tall rigs of the sahara all the men but not the women keep the lower part of their face especially the mouth veiled constantly the veil is never put off not even in eating or sleeping among the arabs men remarkable for their good looks have been known to veil their faces especially at festivals and markets in order to protect themselves against the evil eye the same reason may explain the custom of muffling their faces which had been observed by arab women from the earliest times and by the women of Boeotian thebes in antiquity in samoa a man whose family god was the turtle might not eat a turtle and if he helped a neighbour to cut up and cook one yet to wear a bandage tied over his mouth lest an embryo turtle should slip down his throat grow up and be his death in west timor a speaker holds his right hand before his mouth in speaking lest a demon should enter his body and lest the person with whom he converses should harm the speaker's soul by magic in new south wales for some time after his initiation into the tribal mysteries a young black fellow whose soul at this time is in a critical state must always cover his mouth with a rug when a woman is present we have already seen how common is the notion that a life or soul may escape by the mouth or nostrils Section 4. Taboos on quitting the house. Kings forbidden to leave their palaces or to be seen abroad by their subjects. By an extension of the like precaution, kings are sometimes forbidden ever to leave their palaces, or if they are allowed to do so, their subjects are forbidden to see them abroad. We have seen that the priestly king at Shara Point, West Africa, may never quit his house or even his chair in which he is obliged to sleep sitting and that the king of fernando po whom no white man may see is abhorred to be confined in his house with shackles on his legs 
the fetish king of Benin, who was worshipped as a deity by his subjects, might not quit his palace. After his coronation, the king of Leongo is confined to his palace, which he may not leave. The king of Onicha, on the Niger, does not step out of his house into the town unless a human sacrifice is made to propitiate the gods. On this account, he never goes out beyond the precincts of his premises. Indeed, we are told that he may not quit his palace under pain of death or of giving up one or more slaves to be executed in his presence. As the wealth of the country is measured in slaves, the king takes good care not to infringe the law. One day the monarch, charmed by some presents which he had received from a French officer, politely attended his visit to the gate, and a moment of forgiveness was about to break bounds, when his chamberlain, seizing his majesty by his legs, and his wives, friends and servants, rushing up, prevented him from taking so fatal a step. Yet once a year at the Feast of Yams, the king is allowed, even required by custom to dance before his people outside the high mud wall of the palace. In dancing he carries a great weight, generally a sack of earth, on his back to prove that he is still able to support the burden and care of his state. Were he unable to discharge this duty, he would be immediately deposed and perhaps stoned. The Thomas or Haves, a hardy race of mountaineers who inhabit Mount Bandigara in Nigeria. Rivera, a great fetish doctor called Ogon, who is not suffered to quit his house on any pretext. Among the natives of the Cross River in southern Nigeria, the sacred chiefs of certain villages are confined to their compounds, that is, to the enclosures in which their houses are built. Such chiefs may be confined for years within these narrow bounds. Among these primitive people, the head chief is often looked upon as half divine, the human representative of their ancestral god. He regulates their religious rights, and is by some tribes believed to have the power of making rain fall when they are acquired, and of bringing them good harvests. So being of such value to the community, he is not permitted, except on very rare occasions, to go outside his compound, lest evil should befall him, and the whole town have to suffer. The kings of Ethiopia were worshipped as gods, who were mostly kept shut up in their palaces. On the mountainous coast of Pontus, there dwelt in antiquity a rude and warlike people named the Mosini, or Mosinoiki, through whose rugged country the ten thousand marched on their famous retreat from Asia to Europe. These barbarians kept their king in close custody at the top of a high tower, from which after his election he was never more allowed to descend. Here he dispensed justice to his people, but if he offended them, they punished him by stopping his rations for a whole day, or even starving him to death. The kings of Sabika, or Sheba, the spice country of Arabia, were not allowed to go out of their palaces, and they did so, the mob stoned them to death. By the top of the palace there was a window with a chain attached to it. If any man damned he had suffered wrong, he pulled the chain, and the king perceived him and called him in, and gave judgment. So down to recent times, the kings of Korea, whose persons were sacred and received honours almost divine, were shut up in their palace from the age of twelve or fifteen. And if a suitor wished to obtain justice of the king, he sometimes lit a great bonfire on a mountain facing the palace. The king saw the fire and informed himself of the case. The emperor of China seldom quits his palace, and when he does so, no one may look at him. Even the guards who line the road must turn their backs. The king of Tonquin was permitted to appear abroad twice or thrice a year for the performance of certain religious ceremonies, but the people were not allowed to look at him. The day before he came forth, notice was given to all the inhabitants of the city and country to keep from the way the king was to go. The women were obliged to remain in their houses and durst not show themselves under pain of death, a penalty which was carried out on the spot if anyone disobeyed the order, even through ignorance. Thus the king was invisible to all but his troops and the officers of his suit. In Mandalay, a stout lattice paling, six feet high and carefully kept in repair, lined every street in the walled city, and all those streets in the suburbs through which the king was likely at any time to pass. Behind this paling, which stood two feet or so from the houses, all the people had to stay when the king or any of the queens went out, and any one who was caught outside it by the beadles after the procession had started was severely handled, and might think himself lucky if he got off with a beating. Nobody was supposed to peep through the holes in the lattice work, which were besides partially stopped up with flowering shrubs. Section 5 
Taboos on leaving food over. Magical harm done, a man through the remains of his food or the dishes he has eaten out of. Again, magic mischief may be wrought upon a man through the remains of the food he has partaken of or the dishes out of which he has eaten. On the principles of sympathetic magic, a real connection continues to subsist between the food which a man has in his stomach and the refuse of it which he has left untouched, and hence by injuring the refuse, you can simultaneously injure the eater. Ideas and Customs of the Narinieri of South Australia Among the Narinieri of South Australia, every adult is constantly on the lookout for bones of beasts, birds or fish, of which the flesh has been eaten by somebody, in order to construct a deadly charm out of them. Every one is therefore careful to burn the bones of the animals which he has eaten, lest they should fall into the hands of a sorcerer. Too often, however, the sorcerer succeeds in getting hold of such a bone, and when he does so, he believes that he has the power of life and death over the man, woman, or child who ate the flesh of the animal. Toward the charm and operation, he makes a paste of red ochre and fish oil, inserts it in the eye of a cod, and a small piece of the flesh of a corpse, and having rolled the compound into a ball, sticks it on the top of the bone. After being left for some time in the bosom of a dead body, in order that they may derive a deadly potency by contact with corruption. The magical implement is set up in the ground near the fire, and as the ball melts, so the person against whom the charm is directed wastes with disease. If the ball is melted quite away, the victim will die. When the bewitched man learns of the spell that is being cast upon him, he endeavours to buy the bone from the sorcerer, and if he obtains it, he breaks the charm by throwing the bone into a river or lake. Further, the Naran Yeri think that if a man eats of the totem animal of his tribe, and the enemy obtains a portion of the flesh, the latter can make it grow in the inside of the eater, and so cause his death. Therefore, when a man partakes of his totem, he is careful either to eat it all, or else to conceal or destroy the refuse. In the Encounter Bay tribe of South Australia, when a man cannot get the bone of an animal which his enemy has eaten, he cooks a bird, beast, or fish, and keeping back one of the creature's bones, offers a rest under the guise of friendship to his enemy. If the man is simple enough to partake of the preferred food, he is at the mercy of his perfidious foe, who can kill him by placing the abstracted bone near the fire. Ideas and Customs as to the Leavings of Food in Melanesia and New Guinea Ideas and practices of the same sort prevail, or used to prevail in Melanesia. All that was needed to injure a man was to bring the leavings of his food into contact with a malignant ghost or spirit. Hence, in the island of Florida, when a scrap of an enemy's dinner was secreted and thrown into a haunted place, the man was supposed to fall ill, and the new had brides and a snake of a certain sort carried away a fragment of food to a spot sacred to a spirit. The man who had eaten the food would sicken as the fragment decayed. In Aurora, the refuse is made up by the wizard with certain leaves. As these rot and stink, the man dies. Hence it is or was a constant care with the Melanesians to prevent the remains of their meals from falling to the hands of persons who bore them a grudge. For this reason, they regularly gave the refuse of food to the pigs. In Tana, one of the new Hebrides, people bury or throw into the sea the leavings of their food, lest they should fall into the hands of the disease makers. For if a disease maker finds the remnants of a meal, say the skin of a banana, he picks it up and burns it slowly in the fire. As it burns, the person who ate the banana falls ill and sends to the disease maker, offering him presents if he will stop burning the banana skin. In German New Guinea, the natives take the utmost care to destroy or conceal the husks and other remains of their food, lest he should be found by their enemies and used by them for injury or destruction of the eaters. Hence they burn their leavings, throw them into the sea, or otherwise put them out of harm's way. To such an extent does this fear influence them that many people dare not stir beyond the territory of their own village, lest they should leave behind them, on the land of their neighbours, something by means of which a hostile sorcerer might do them a mischief. Similar fears have led to similar customs in New Britain and the other islands of what is now called the Bismarck Archipelago of the north coast of New Guinea. There also the natives bury, burn, or throw into the sea the remains of their males, to prevent them from falling into the hands of magicians. There also, the more superstitious of them, 
will not eat in another village because they dread the use which a sorcerer might make of their leaving when the back is turned. This theory has led to a non-practical result. All the cats in the islands of the archipelago go about with stumpy tails. The reason for this peculiarity is this. The natives sometimes roast and eat their cats, and unscrupulous persons might be tempted to steal a neighbor's cat in order to furnish a meal. Accordingly, in the interests of the higher morality people, remove this stumbling block from the path of their weaker brothers by docking their cats of a piece of their tails and keeping the severed portions in a secret place. If now a cat is stolen and eaten, the lawful owner of the animal has it in his power to avenge the crime. He need only bury the piece of tail with certain spells in the ground, and the thief will fall ill. Hence a man will hardly dare to steal and eat a cat with a stumpy tail, knowing the righteous retribution that would sooner or later overtake him for so doing. Ideas and Customs as to the Leavings of Food in Africa, Salives, India, and Ancient Rome from a like fear, no doubt, of sorcery, no one may touch the food which the king of Loango leaves upon his plate. It is buried in a hole in the ground, and no one may drink out of the king's vessel. Similarly, no man may drink out of the same cup or glass with the king of Fida, Waida, of Guinea. He hath always one kept particularly for himself, and that which hath but once touched another's lips, he never uses more. They were to be made of metal, that may be cleansed by fire. Amongst the other fours of Salibs, there is a priest called the Lenin, whose duty appears to be to make the rice grow. His functions begin about a month before the rice is sown, and end after the crop is housed. During this time, he has to observe certain taboos, amongst others he may not eat or drink with anyone else, and he may not drink out of no vessel but his own. An ancient Indian way of injuring an enemy was to offer him a meal of rice, and afterwards throw the remains of the rice into a fish pond. If the fish swarm up in large numbers to devour the grains, the man's fate was sealed. In antiquity, the Romans had used immediately to break the shells of eggs and of snails which they had eaten in order to prevent enemies from making magic with them. The common practice still observed among us of breaking egg shells after the eggs have been eaten may very well have originated in the same superstition. The fear of the magical evil which may be done a man through this food has had beneficial effects in fostering habits of cleanliness and in strengthening the ties of hospitality. The superstitious fear of the magic that may be wrought on a man through the leavings of his food has had the beneficial effect of inducing many savages to destroy refuse, which, if left to rot, might through its corruption have proved a real, not a merely imaginary source of disease and death. Nor is it only the sanitary condition of a tribe which is benefited by this superstition. Curiously enough, the same baseless dread, the same false notion of causation, has indirectly strengthened the moral bonds of hospitality, honour and good faith among men who entertain it. For it is obvious that no one who intends to harm a man by working magic on the refuse of his food will himself partake of that food, because if he did so, he would, on the principles of sympathetic magic, suffer equally with his enemy from any injury done to the refuse. This is the idea which in primitive society lends sanctity to the bond produced by eating together. By participation in the same food, two men give, as it were, hostages of their good behaviour. Each guarantees the other that he will devise no mischief against him, since being physically united with him by the common food in their stomachs, any harm he might do to his fellow would recoil on his own head with precisely the same force with which it fell on the head of his victim. In strict logic, however, the sympathetic bond lasts only so long as the food is in the stomach of each of the parties. As the covenant formed by eating together is less solemn and durable than the covenant formed by transfusing the blood of the covenanting parties into each other's veins, for this transfusion seems to knit them together for life. End of section 5《セクション6オブ・デ・ゴールデン・バウ》《A Study in Magic and Religion》Part 2 Taboo in the Perils of the Soul by Sir James George Fraser This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey 
Chapter 4. Part 1. Tabooed Persons. Section 1. Chiefs and Kings Tabooed. Disastrous results supposed to follow from using the dishes of the Mikado or of a Fijian chief. We have seen that the Mikado's food was cooked every day in new pots and served up in new dishes. Both pots and dishes were of common clay, in order that they might be broken or laid aside after they had been once used. They were generally broken, for it was believed that if anyone else ate the food out of these sacred dishes, his mouth and throat would become swollen and inflamed. The same ill effect was thought to be experienced by anyone who should wear the Mikado's clothes without his leave. He would have swellings and pains all over his body. In Fiji, there is a special name, Kana Lama, for the disease supposed to be caused by eating out of a chief's dishes or wearing his clothes. The throat and body swell, and the impious person dies. I had a fine mate given to me by a man who durst not use it because Thakambao's eldest son had sat upon it. There was always a family or clan of commoners who were exempt from this danger. I was talking about this once to Thakambao. Oh yes, he said, here is so-and-so, come and scratch my back. The man scratched. He was one of those who could do it with impunity. The name of the men thus highly privileged was Nanluduka Ni, or the dirt of the chief. Sacred persons are a source of danger to others. The divinity burns like a fire, what it touches. In the evil effects thus supposed to follow upon the use of the vessels or clothes of the Mikado and a Fijian chief, we see that other side of the God-man's character to which attention has been already called. The divine person is a source of danger as well as of blessing. He must not only be guarded, he must also be guarded against. His sacred organism, so delicate to a touch, may disorder it. It is also, as it were, electrically charged with a powerful magical or spiritual force which may discharge itself of fatal effect on whatever comes in contact with it. Accordingly, the isolation of the man-god is quite as necessary for the safety of others as for his own. His magical virtue is in the strictest sense of the word contagious. His divinity is a fire which, under proper restraints, confers endless blessings, but if rashly touched or allowed to break bounds, burns and destroys what it touches. Hence the disastrous effects supposed would tend to breach taboo. The offender has thrust his hand into the divine fire which shrivels up and consumes him on the spot. African Examples The Nubas, for example, who inhabit the wooded and fertile range of Jebel Nuba in eastern Africa, believe that they would die if they entered the house of their priestly king. However, they can evade the penalty of their intrusion by barring the left shoulder and getting the king to lay his hand on it. And were any man to sit on a throne which the king has consecrated to his own use, the transgressor would die within the year. The Kazems, in the interior of Angola, regard their king, the Manta or Mambo, as so holy that no one can touch him without being killed by the magical power which pervades his sacred person. But since contact with him is sometimes unavoidable, they have devised a means whereby the sinner can escape with his life. Kneeling down before the king, he touches the back of the royal hand with the back of his own, then snaps his fingers. Afterwards, he lays the palm of his hand on the palm of the king's hand, then snaps his fingers again. The ceremony is repeated four or five times and averts the imminent danger of death. The Taboo of Chiefs and Kings in Tonga in Tonga, it was believed that if anyone fed himself with his own hands after touching the sacred person of a superior chief or anything that belonged to him, he would swell up and die. The sanctity of the chief, like a virulent poison, infected the hands of his inferior and be communicated through them to the food. A commoner who had incurred this danger could disinfect himself by performing a certain ceremony which consisted in touching the sole of a chief's foot with the palm and back of each of his hands and afterwards rinsing his hands in water. If there was no water near, he rubbed his hands with the juicy stem of a plantation or banana. After that, he was freed to feed himself with his own hands without danger of being attacked by the malady which would otherwise follow from eating with tabooed or sanctified hands. But until the ceremony of expiation or disinfection had been performed, 
he wished to eat, he had either to get someone to feed him, or else to go down on his knees and pick up the food from the ground with his mouth like a beast. He might not even use a toothpick himself, but might guide the hand of another person holding the toothpick. The Tongans were subject to induration of the liver and certain forms of scrofula, which they often attributed to a failure to perform the requisite expiation after having inadvertently touched a chief or his belongings. Hence they often went through the ceremony as a precaution, without knowing that they had done anything to call for it. The king of Tonga could not refuse to play his part in the rite by presenting his foot to such as desired to touch it, even when they applied to him at the inconvenient time. A fat, unworldly king who perceived his subjects approaching with this intention while he chanced to be taking his walks abroad, had been sometimes seen to waddle as far as his legs could carry him out of their way, in order to escape the importunate and not wholly disinterested expression of their homage. If any one fancied he might have already unwittingly eaten with tabooed hands, he sat down before the chief, and taking the chief's foot, pressed it against his own stomach, that the food in his belly might not injure him, and that he might not swell up and die. The king's evil cured by the king's touch. Since scrofula was regarded by the Tongans as a result of eating with tabooed hands, we may conjecture that persons who suffered from it among them often resorted to the touch or pressure of the king's foot as a cure for their malady. The analogy of the custom with the old English practice of bringing scrofula's patients to the king to be healed by his touch is sufficiently obvious, and suggests, as I have already pointed out elsewhere, that among our own remote ancestors, Scrofiel may have obtained its name of the king's evil from a belief like that of the Tongans, that it was caused as well as cured by contact with the divine majesty of kings. Fatal Effects of Contact with Sacred Chiefs in New Zealand In New Zealand, the dread of the sanctity of chiefs was at least as great as in Tonga. Their ghostly power, derived from an ancestral spirit, or actua, diffused itself by contagion over everything they touched, and could strike dead all who rashly or unwittingly meddled with it. For instance, it once happened that a New Zealand chief of high rank and great sanctity had left the remains of his dinner by the wayside. A slave, a stout hungry fellow, coming up after the chief had gone, saw the unfinished dinner, and ate it up without asking questions. Hardly had he finished when he was informed by a horror-stricken spectator that the food of which he had eaten was the chief's. I knew the unfortunate delinquent well. He was remarkable for courage, and had signalised himself in the wars of the tribe. But no sooner did he hear the fatal news than he was seized by the most extraordinary convulsions and cramp in the stomach, which never ceased till he died, about sundown the same day. He was a strong man in the prime of life, and if any Pacha, European, free thinker, should have said he was not killed by the tapu of the chief, which had been communicated to the food by contact. He would have been listened to with feelings of contempt for his ignorance and inability to understand plain and direct evidence. This is not a solitary case. A married woman having eaten of some fruit, and being afterwards told that the fruit had been taken from a tabooed place, exclaimed that the spirit of the chief, whose sanctity had been thus profaned, would kill her. This was in the afternoon, and next day by twelve o'clock she was dead. An observer who knows the marriage well says, Taboo, taboo, is an awful weapon. I have seen a strong young man die in the same day he was tabooed. The victims die under it, though their strength ran out as water. A Maori chief's tinder box was once the means of killing several persons, for have been lost by him and found by some men who used it to light their pipes. They died of fright on learning to whom it had belonged. So too, the garments of a high New Zealander chief will kill anyone that also wears them. A chief was observed by a missionary to throw down a precipice, a blanket, which he had found too heavy to carry. Been asked by the missionary why he did not leave it on a tree for the use of a future traveller, the chief replied that it was the fear of its being taken by another which caused him to throw it where he did, for if it were worn, his tapu that is, his spiritual power communicated by contact with the blanket and through the blanket to the man, would kill the person. For a similar reason, a married chief would not blow a fire with his mouth, for his sacred breath would communicate its sanctity to the fire, which would pass it on to the pot on the fire, 
which would pass it on to the meat in the pot, which would pass it on to the man who ate the meat, which was in the pot, which stood on the fire, which was breathed on by the chief. So the eater, infected by the chief's breath, conveyed through these intermediaries, would surely die. Examples of the fatal effects of imagination in other parts of the world. Thus in the Polynesian race, to which the Marys belong, superstition erected round the persons of sacred chiefs a real, though at the same time purely imaginary barrier, to transgress, which actually entailed the death of the transgressor whenever he became aware of what he had done. This fatal power of the imagination, working through superstitious terrors, is by no means confined to one race. It appears to be common among savages. For example, among the Aborigines of Australia, a native will die after the infliction of even the most superficial wound, if only he believes that the weapon which inflicted the wound had been sung over and thus endowed with magical virtue. He simply lies down, refuses food and pines away. Similarly, among some of the Indian tribes of Brazil, if the medicine man predicted the death of any one who had offended him, the wretch took to his hammock instantly, in such full expectation of dying, that he would neither eat nor drink, and the prediction was a sentence which faith effectually executed. Speaking of certain African races, Major Leonard observes, I have seen more than one hardened old hussar soldier dying steadily, and by inches, because he believed himself to be bewitched, so that no nourishment or medicines that were given to him had the slightest effect either to check the mischief or to improve his condition in any way, and nothing was able to divert him from a fate which he considered inevitable. In the same way, and under very similar conditions, I have seen crew men and others die, in spite of every effort that was made to save them, simply because they had made up their minds. Not, as we thought at the time to die, for that being in the clutch of malignant demons, they were bound to die. The Capuchin missionary Marola de Sorrento, who travelled in the West African Kingdom of Congo in the latter part of the 17th century, has described a remarkable case of death wrought purely by superstitious fear. He says, It is a custom that either the parents or the wizards give certain rules to be inviolably observed by the young people, and which they call chagila. These are to abstain from eating either some sorts of poultry, the flesh of some kinds of wild beasts, such and such fruits, roots, either raw or boiled, after this or another manner, with several other ridiculous injunctions of the like nature, too many to be enumerated here. You would wonder with what religious observance these commands are obeyed. These young people who sooner choose to fast several days together than to taste the least bit of what had been forbidden them, and it sometimes happened that the chigula had been neglected to have been given them by their parents, they think they shall presently die unless they go immediately to receive it from the wizards. A certain young negro, being upon a journey, lodged in a friend's house by the way. His friend, before he went out the next morning, had got a wild hen ready for his breakfast. They had been much better than the tame ones. The negro hereupon demanded, If it were a wild hen, his host answered, No. Then he fell on heartily, and afterwards proceeded on his journey. About four years after, these two met together again, and the four said, Negro, being not yet married, his old friend asked him if he would eat a wild hen, to which he answered that he had received the chigilla, and therefore could not. Hereat the host began immediately to laugh, inquiring of him what had made him refuse it now, when he had eaten one at his table about four years ago. At the hearing of this, the negro merely fell a-trembling, and suffered himself to be so far possessed with the effects of imagination that he died in less than twenty-four hours after. Section 2. Mourners Tabooed The taboos observed by sacred kings resemble those imposed on persons who are commonly regarded as unclean, such as menstruous women, homicides, and so forth. Thus regarding his sacred chiefs and kings as charged with a mysterious spiritual force, which, so to say, explodes a contact, the savage naturally ranks them among the dangerous classes of society, and imposes upon them the same sort of restraints that he lays on manslayers, menstruous women, and other persons whom he looks upon with a certain fear and horror. For example, sacred kings and priests in Polynesia were not allowed to touch food with their hands, and had therefore to be fed by others. And as we have just seen, their vessels, garments, and other property 
will not be used by others on pain of disease and death. Now precisely the same observances are accepted by some savages from girls at their first menstruation, women after childbirth, homicides, mourners, and all persons who have come into contact with the dead. Taboos laid on persons who have been in contact with the dead in New Zealand. Thus, for example, to begin with the last class of persons, among the Maoris, any one who had handled a corpse, helped convey it to the grave, or touched a dead man's bones, was cut off from all intercourse and almost all communication with mankind. He could not enter any house, or come into contact with any person or thing, without utterly bedeviling them. He might not even touch food with his hands, which had become so frightfully tabooed or unclean as to be quite useless. Food would be set for him on the ground, and he would then sit or kneel down, with his hands carefully held behind his back, would gnaw at it as best he could. In some cases, he would be fed by another person, who, with outstretched arm, contrived to do it without touching the tabooed man. But the feeder was himself subjected to many severe restrictions, little less onerous than those which were imposed upon the other. In almost every populous village there lived a degraded wretch, the lowest of the low, who earned a sorry pittance by thus waiting upon the defiled, clad in rags, daubed from head to foot with red ochre and stinking shark oil, always solitary and silent, generally old, haggard and wizened, often half crazed, he might be seen sitting motionless all day apart from the common path or thoroughfare of the village, gazing with lacklustre eyes on the busy doings in which he might never take a part. Twice a day a dole of food may be thrown on the ground, before him to munch as well as he could without the use of his hands, and at night, huddling his greasy tatters about him, he would crawl into some miserable lair of leaves and refuse, where, dirty, cold, and hungry, he passed in broken ghost hoarded slumbers, a wretched night as a prelude to another wretched day. Such was the only human being deemed fit to associate arm's length with one who had paid the last offices of respect and friendship to the dead. And when the dismal term of his seclusion being over, the mourner was about to mix with his fellows once more. All the dishes he had used in his seclusion were diligently smashed, and all the garments he had worn were carefully thrown away, lest they should spread the contagion of his defilement, among others. Just as the vessels and clothes of sacred kings and chiefs are destroyed or cast away for a similar reason, so complete in these respects is the analogy with the savage traces between the spiritual influences that emanate from divinities and from the dead, between the odour of sanctity and the stench of corruption. That all which forbids the persons who have been in contact with a corpse to touch food with their hands seems to have been universal in Polynesia. The rule which forbids persons who have been in contact with the dead to touch food with their hands would seem to have been universal in Polynesia. Thus in Samoa, those who attended the deceased were most careful not to handle food, and for days were fed by others as if they were helpless infants. Baldness and the loss of teeth were supposed to be the punishment, inflicted by a household god if they had violated the rule. Again in Tonga, no person can touch a dead chief without being tabooed for ten lunar months, except chiefs, who were only tabooed for three, four or five months, according to the superiority of the dead chief, except again it to be the body of Tuitonga, the great divine chief, and then even the greatest chief would be tabooed ten months, as was the case with Fano's wife above mentioned. During the time a man is tabooed, he must not feed himself with his own hands, but must be fed by somebody else. He must not even use a toothpick himself, but must guide another person's hand holding the toothpick. If he is hungry, and there is no one to feed him, he must go down upon his hands and knees, and pick up his victuals with his mouth. And if he infringes upon any of these rules, it is firmly expected that he will swell up and die. And this belief is so strong, that Mr. Mariner thinks no native ever made an experiment to prove the contrary. He often saw him feed himself with his hands, after having touched dead chiefs, and not observing his health to decline. They attribute to his being a foreigner, and be governed by different gods. Again, in Wallace Island, contact with the corpse subjects the hands to the law of taboo till they are washed, which is not done for several weeks. Until the purification has taken place, the tabooed persons may not themselves put food to their mouths. Other people render them that service. A rule of the same sort is observed in Melanesia and Africa. A rule of the same sort is or was observed in various parts of Melanesia. Thus in Fiji, the taboo for handling a dead chief lasted from one to ten months, according to his rank. 
for a comrade and lasted not more than four days. It was commonly resorted to by the lazy and idle, for during the time of their seclusion they were not only provided with food, but were actually fed by attendants or ate their food from the ground. Similarly, in the Motu tribe of New Guinea, a man is tabooed, generally, for three days after handling a corpse, and while the taboo lasts he may not touch food with his hands. At the end of the time he bathes and the taboo is over. So in New Caledonia, the two men who were charged with the duty of burying and cutting a corpse had to remain in seclusion and observe a number of rules of abstinence. They live apart from their wives. They may not shave or cut their hair. Their food is laid for them on leaves, and they take it up with their mouth or a stick. But oftener, an attendant feeds them, just as he might feed a man whose limbs were palsied. So among the Nante of British East Africa, persons who have handled a corpse bathe in a river, anoint their bodies with fat, partially shave their heads, and live in the hut of the deceased for four days. All these days, they may not be seen by boys or women. They may not drink milk, and they may not touch food with their hands, but must eat it with the help of a pot's head or chip of a gourd. Similarly, in the Bay Pedi and Bay Thonga tribes of South Africa, men who have dug a grave may not touch food with their fingers till the rites of their purification are accomplished. Meantime, they ate with the help of special spoons. If they broke this rule, it is thought they would be consumptive. So, in the Nagario tribe of New South Wales, a novice who has just passed through the ceremony of initiation has to go away to the mountains and stay there for a while, sometimes for more than six months, under charge of one or more old men. All the time of his absence, among the mountains, he may not touch cooked food with his hands. The food is put into his mouth by the man who looks after him. Taboos lead on mourners among the Indian tribes in North America. Among the Shaswap of British Columbia, widows and widowers in mourning are secluded and forbidden to touch their own head or body. The cups and cooking vessels which they use may be used by no one else. They must build a sweat house beside a creek, sweat there all night and bathe regularly, at which they must rub their bodies with branches of spruce. The branches may not be used more than once, and when they have served their purpose they are struck into the ground all round the hut. No hunter would come near such mourners, for their presence is unlucky. If their shadow were to fall on any one, he would be taken all at once. They employ thorn bushes for bed and pillow in order to keep away the ghost of the deceased, and thorn bushes are also laid all around their beds. This last precaution shows clearly what the spiritual danger is when it leads to the exclusion of such persons from ordinary society. It is simply a fear of the ghost who is supposed to be hovering near them. Among the Thompson Indians of British Columbia, the persons who handled a corpse and dug the grave were secluded for four days. They fastened till the body was buried, out of which they were given food apart from other people. They would not touch the food with their hands, but was put in their mouths with sharp pointed sticks. They ate off a small mat and drank out of birch bark cups, which together with the mat were thrown away at the end of the four days. The first four mouthfuls of food, as well as of water, had to be spit into the fire. During their seclusion, they bathed in the stream and might not sleep with their wives. Widows and widowers were obliged to observe rules of a similar kind. Immediately after death, they went out and passed through a patch of rose bushes four times, probably in order to rid themselves of the ghost, who might be supposed to stick on a thorn. For a year, they had to sleep on a bed of fir boughs, on which sticks of rose bushes were laid. Many wore twigs of rose bush, and juniper and a piece of buckskin on their persons. The first four days, they might not touch their food, but ate with sharp pointed sticks and spat out the first four mouthfuls of each meal, and the first four of water into the fire. A widower might not fish at another man's fishing place or another man's net. If he did it, he would make the place and then it useless for the season. If he transplanted a trout into another lake before releasing it, he blew on the head of the fish, and after chewing deer fat, he spat some of the grease on its head in order to remove the baneful effect of his touch. Then he let the trout go, bidding it farewell and asking it to propagate its kind in plenty. Any grass or branches that a widow or widower sat or lay down on withered up. If widow should break sticks or boughs, her hands or arms would also break. She might not pick berries for a year, else the whole crop of berries would fall off the bushes or wither up. She might not cook food or fetch water for her children, nor let them lie down on her bed. 
nor should she lie or sit where they slept. Sometimes a widow would wear a breech cloth made of dried bunch grass for several days to prevent her husband's ghost from having intercourse with her. Among the Tene or Dine Indians of Northwest America, all who have handled the corpse are subject to many restrictions and taboos. They are debarred for a certain period from eating any fresh meat. They may never use a knife to cut their food, but must tear it with their teeth. They may not drink out of a vessel in common use, but must employ a gourd which they carry about for the purpose. They may wear peeled willow wands about their arms and next to carry them in their hands as disinfectants to annul the evil consequences which are supposed to follow from handling the dead. Among the Indian tribes of Queen Charlotte Sound, a widow or widower goes into special mourning for a month. Among the Koskimos, the period of mourning is four months. During this time, he or she lives apart in a very small hut behind the house, eating and drinking alone, and using for that purpose dishes which are not employed by other members of the tribe. Seclusion of Widows and Widowers in the Philippines and New Guinea Among the Iguatinos, who inhabit Palawan, one of the Philippine Islands, a widow may not leave her hut for several or eight days after the death, and even then she may only go out at an hour when she is not likely to meet anybody, for whoever looks upon her dies a sudden death. To prevent this fatal catastrophe, the widow knocks with a wooden peg on the trees as she goes along, thus warning people of her dangerous proximity, and the very trees on which she knocks soon die. So poisonous is the atmosphere of death that surrounds those to whom the ghost of the departed may be thought to cleave. In the Makio district of British New Guinea, a widower loses all his civil rights and becomes a social outcast, an object of fear and horror shunned by all. He may not cultivate a garden, nor show himself in public, nor traverse the village, nor walk on the roads and paths. Like a wild beast, he must skulk in the long grass and the bushes, and if he sees or hears anyone coming, especially a woman, he must hide behind a tree or a thicket. If he wishes to fish or hunt, he must do it alone and at night. If he would consult anyone, even the missionary, he does so by stealth and at night. He seems to have lost his voice and speaks only in whispers. Were he to join a party of fishers or hunters, his presence would bring misfortune on them. A ghost of his dead wife would frighten away the fish or the game. He goes without everywhere, and at all times armed with a tomahawk to defend himself, not only against wild boars in the jungle, but against the dreaded spirit of his departed spouse, who would do him an ill turn if she could, for all the souls of the dead are malignant, and their only delight is to harm the living. Section 3 Women tabooed at menstruation and childbirth. Taboos imposed on women at menstruation. In general, we may say that the prohibition to use the vessels, garments, and so on of certain persons, and the effects supposed to follow an infraction of the rule, are exactly the same whether the persons to whom the things belong are sacred, or what we might call unclean and polluted. As the garments which have been touched by a sacred chief kill those who handle them, so do the things which have been touched by a menstruous woman. An Australian blackfellow who discovered that his wife had lain on his blanket at her menstrual period killed her and died of terror himself within a fortnight. Hence Australian women at these times are forbidden under pain of death to touch anything that men use, or even to walk on a path that any man frequents. They are also secluded at childbirth, and all vessels used by them during their seclusion are burned. In Uganda, the pots which a woman touches while the impurity of childbirth or of menstruation is on her should be destroyed. Spears and shields defiled by her touch are not destroyed, but only purified. No Eskimos of Alaska will willingly drink out of the same cup or eat out of the same dish that is being used by a woman in her confinement until it has been purified by certain incantations. Among some of the Indians of North America, Women and menstruation are forbidden to touch men's utensils, which would be so defiled by their touch that their subsequent use would be attended by certain mischief or misfortune. For instance, in some of the Tine or Dine tribes, girls verging on maturity take care that the dishes out of which they eat are used by no one else. When the first periodical sickness comes on, they are fed by their mothers or nearest kinswomen and will on no account touch their food with their own hands. At the same time, they abstain from touching their heads with their hands, and keep a small stick to scratch their heads with when they itch. 
They remain outside the house in a hut built for the purpose, and wear a skull cap made of skin to fit very tight, which they never lay aside till the first monthly infirmity is over. A fringe of shells, bones, and so on hangs down from their forehead so as to cover their eyes, lest any malicious sorcerer should harm them during this critical period. Among all the Dene and most other American tribes, hardly any other being was the object of so much dread as a menstruating woman. As soon as signs of that condition made themselves apparent in a young girl, she was carefully segregated from all but female company, and to live by herself in a small hut away from the gaze of the villagers or of the male member of the roving band. While in that awful state, she had to abstain from touching anything belonging to man, or the spoils of any version or other animal, lest she would thereby pollute the same, and condemn the hunters to failure owing to the anger of the game thus slighted. Dried fish formed her diet, and cold water, absorbed through a drinking tube, was her only beverage. Moreover, as the very sight of her was dangerous to society, a special skin bonnet, with fringes falling over her face down to her breast, hid her from the public gaze, even some time after she had recovered her normal state. Among the bribery Indians of Costa Rica, a menstruous woman is regarded as unclean. Bukuru. The only plates she may use for her food are banana leaves, which, when she has done with them, she throws away in some sequestered spot. For where a cow to find them and eat them, the animal would waste away and perish. And she drinks out of a special vessel for a like reason, because if any one drank out of the same cup after her, he would surely die. In the islands of Maybuag and Saibai, in Torres Straits, girls of the first menstruation are strictly secluded from the sight of them. In Maboeg, the seclusion lasts three months. In Sabay, about a fortnight. During the time of separation, the girl is forbidden to feed herself or to handle food, which is put into her mouth by women or girls told off to wait on her. Taboos imposed on women in childbed. Among many peoples, similar restrictions are imposed on women in childbed, and apparently for similar reasons. At such periods, women are supposed to be in a dangerous condition, which would infect any person or thing they might touch. Hence, they are put in a quarantine, until with the recovery of their health and strength, the imaginary danger has passed away. Thus, in Tahiti, a woman after childbirth was secluded for a fortnight or three weeks in a temporary hut erected on sacred ground. During the time of her seclusion, she was debarred from touching provisions and had to be fed by another. Further, if anyone else touched the chief at this period, he was subjected to the same restrictions as the mother until the ceremony of her purification had been performed. Similarly, in Manahigi, an island in the South Pacific, for ten days after her delivery, a woman was not allowed to handle food and had to be fed by some other person. In the Sinuagulu tribe of British New Guinea, for about a month after her confinement, a woman may not prepare or handle food. She may not even cook for herself, and when she is eating the food made ready for her by her friends, she must use a sharpened stick to transfer it to her mouth. Similarly, in the rural and Makuril districts of British New Guinea, a woman after childbirth becomes for a time taboo, obu, and any personal thing she may chance to touch becomes taboo also. Accordingly, during this time, she abstains from cooking, for were she to cook food, not only the victuals themselves, but the pot and the fire would be tabooed, so nobody could eat the victuals, or use the pot, or warm himself at the fire. Further at meals, she may not dip her hand into the dish and help herself, as the natives commonly do. She may use for the purpose a long fork, with which she takes up the bananas, sweet potatoes, yams, and so forth, in order not to contaminate the rest of the food in the vessel by the touch of her fingers. If she wishes to drink, a gourd is set before her, and wrapping up her hands in a cloth or coconut fibre, she pours the water into a small calabash for her to use, or she may pour the water directly into her mouth without letting the gourd touch her lips. If anything has to be handed to her, it is not given from hand to hand, but reached to her at the end of a long stick. Similarly, in the island of Kadiak, of Alaska, a woman about to be delivered retires to a miserable low hovel built of reeds, where she must remain for twenty days after the birth of a child, wherever the season may be, and she is considered so unclean that no one will touch her, and food is reached to her on sticks. 
In the barbed heady and Bartholomew tribes of South Africa, a woman in childbed may not touch her food with her hands all the time of her seclusion. She must eat with the help of a wooden spoon. They think that if she touched her victual, she might infect them with her bloody flux, and that having partaken of such tender food, she would fall into a consumption. The bribery Indians regard the pollution of childbed as much more dangerous even than that of menstruation. When a woman feels the time approaching, she informs her husband, who makes haste to build a hut for her in a lovely spot. There she must live alone, or in no converse of anybody save her mother or another woman. After her delivery, the medicine man purifies her by breathing on her and laying an animal. It matters not what upon her, but even this ceremony only mitigates her uncleanness into a state considered to be equivalent to that of a menstruous woman. And for a full lunar month, she must live apart from her housemates, observing the same rules with regard to eating and drinking as at her monthly periods. The case is still worse. The pollution is still more deadly if she has had a miscarriage or has been delivered of a stillborn child. In that case, she may not go near a living soul. The mere contact with things she has used is exceedingly dangerous. Her food is handled to her at the end of a long stick. This lasts generally for three weeks, at which she may go home subject only to the restrictions incident to an ordinary confinement. Among the Adivi or forest gollas of southern India, when a woman feels the first pains of labour, she is turned clean out of the village and must take up her quarters in a little hut made of leaves or mats about 200 yards away. In this hut she must bring forth her offspring unaided, lest a midwife can be fetched in time to be with her before the child is born. If the midwife arrives after the birth has taken place, she may not go near the woman. For ninety days, the mother lives in the hut by herself. If anyone touches her, he or she becomes, like the mother herself, an outcast and expelled from the village for three months. The woman's husband generally makes a little hut about fifty yards from hers and stays in it sometimes to watch over her, but he may not go near her on pain of being outcast for three months. Food is placed on the ground near the woman's hut, and she takes it. On the fourth day after the birth, a woman of the village goes to her and pours water on her, but may not come into contact with her. On the fifth day, the villagers clear away the stones and thorny bushes from a patch of ground about ten yards on the village side of the hut. And to this, clearing the woman removes her hut unaided. No one may help her do so. On the ninth, fifteenth, and thirtieth days, she again shifts her hut nearer and nearer to the village. And again, once in each of the two following months, she brings her hut still nearer. On the ninetieth day of her seclusion, the woman is called out from her hut. Wash, clad in clean clothes, that have been taken to the village temple, is conducted to her own house by a man of the caste who performs purifactory ceremonies. Dangers apprehended from women in childbed. These customs show that in the opinion of some primitive peoples, a woman at and after childbirth is pervaded by a certain dangerous influence which can affect anything in anybody she touches. So in the interest of the community, it becomes necessary to seclude her from society for a while until the virulence of the infection has passed away, when after submitting to certain rites of purification, she is again free to mingle with her fellows. This dread of lying in women appears to be widespread for the practice of shutting them up at such times in lonely huts away from the rest of the people is very common. Sometimes the nature of the danger of which is apprehended from them is explicitly stated. Thus the island of Tamlio, of German New Guinea, after the birth of her first child, a woman is shut up with her infant for five or eight days, during which no man, not even her husband, may see her, for the men think that, were they to see her, their bodies would swell up and they would die. Apparently their notion is that the sight of a woman who has just been big with child will, on the principle of homeopathic magic, make their bodies big also to bursting. The Sulco of New Britain imagine that, when a woman has been delivered of a child, the men become cowardly, weapons lose their force, and the slips which are to be planted out are deprived of their power of germinating. Hence they perform a ceremony which is intended to counteract this mysterious influence on men and plants. As soon as it is known that a woman has been brought to bed, all the male population of the village assembles in the men's clubhouse. Branches of a strong-smelling tree are fetched, 
and twigs are broken off, the leaves stripped off and put on the fire. All the men present then seize branches with young buds. One of them holds ginger in his hand, which, after reciting a spell over it, he distributes to the others. They chew it and spit out the twigs, and these twigs were afterwards laid on the shields and other weapons in the house, and also in the slips which are to be planted. Moreover, they are fastened on the roofs and over the doorways of the houses. In this way, they seek to annul the noxious infection of childbirth. Among the Abim of German New Guinea, when a birth has taken place in the village, all the inhabitants remain at home next morning, in order that the fruits of the field may not be spoiled. Apparently they fear that if they went out to their fields and gardens immediately after a woman had been brought to bed, they would carry with them a dangerous contagion which might blight the crops. When a Herrero woman has given birth to a child, her female companions hastily construct a special hut for her to which she is transferred. Both the hut and the woman are sacred, and for this reason, the men are not allowed to see the lying in woman until the nail string is separated from the child. Otherwise they will become weaklings. And when latter the Yambana, that is, go to war with spear and bow, they would be shot. Thus Herrero, like the Sulka, appear to imagine that the weakness of a lying in woman can, on the principles of homeopathic magic, infect any men who may chance to see her. Dangers apprehended from women in childbed by Indians and Eskimos. Among the Saragakos Indians of eastern Ecuador, as soon as the woman feels the travail pangs beginning, she retires into the forest to a distance of three or four leagues from her home, where she takes up her abode in a hut of leaves, which has been already prepared for her. This banishment, we are told, is a fruit of the superstition of the Indians, who persuaded that the spirit of evil would attach himself to their house if the woman were brought to bed in it. The Eskimos off Baffinland think that the body of a lying in woman exhales a vapour which would adhere to the souls of seals if she ate the flesh of any seals except such have been caught by her husband, by a boy, or by an aged man. Cases of premature birth require particularly careful treatment. The effect must be announced publicly, else dire results will follow. If a woman should conceal from the other people that she has had a premature birth, they might come near her, or even eat in her hut of the seals procured by her husband. The vapour rising from her would thus affect them, and they would be avoided by the seals. The transgression would also become attached to the soul of the seal, which would take it down to Setna, the mythical mother of the sea mammals, who lives in the lower world and controls the destinies of mankind. Dangers apprehended from women in childbed by Bantu tribes of South Africa. Some Bantu tribes of South Africa entertain even more exaggerated notions of the virulent infection spread by a woman who has had a miscarriage and has concealed it. An experienced observer of these people tells us that the blood of childbirth appears to the eyes of the South Africans to be tainted with a pollution still more dangerous than that of the menstrual fluid. The husband is excluded from the hut for eight days of the lying-in period, chiefly from fear that he might be contaminated by this secretion. He dare not take his child in his arms for the three first months after birth. Dangers apprehended from a concealed miscarriage But the secretion of childbed is particularly terrible when it is the product of a miscarriage, especially a concealed miscarriage. In this case, it is not merely the man who is threatened or killed. It is the whole country. It is the sky itself which suffers. By a curious association of ideas, a physiological fact causes cosmic troubles. Thus, for example, the Baipeti believe that a woman who has procured abortion can kill a man merely by lying with him. Her victim is poisoned, shrivels up, and dies within a week. As for the disastrous effect which a miscarriage may have on the whole country, I will quote the words of a medicine man and rainmaker of the Bar Petty tribe. When a woman has had a miscarriage, when she has allowed her blood to flow, and has hidden the child, it is enough to cause the burning winds to blow, and to parch the country with heat. The rain no longer falls, for the country is no longer in order. When the rain approaches the place where the blood is, it will not dare to approach. It will fear and remain at a distance. That woman has committed a great fault. She has spoiled the country of the chief, for she has hidden blood which had not yet been well congealed to fashion a man. That blood is taboo, Ila, 
it should never drip on the road. The chief will assemble his men and say to them, Are you in order? In your villages, someone will answer, Such and such a woman was pregnant, and we have not yet seen the child which she has given birth to. And they go and arrest the woman. They say to her, Show us where you have hidden it. They go and dig at the spot. They sprinkle the hole with a decoction of Membendua and the young gale, two sorts of roots, prepared in a special pot. They take a little of the earth for this grave. They throw it into the river, then they bring back water from the river and sprinkle it where she has shed her blood. She herself must wash every day with the medicine. Then the country will be moistened again by rain. Further, we, medicine men, summon the women of the country. We tell them to prepare a ball of the earth which contains the blood. They bring it to us one morning. If we wish to prepare medicine, we wish to sprinkle the whole country. We crumble this earth to powder. At the end of five days, we send little boys and little girls, girls that yet know nothing of women's affairs and have not yet had relations with men. We put the medicine in the horns of oxen, and these children go to all the fords, toward the entrances of the country. A little girl turns up the soil with her mattock. The others dip a branch in the horn and sprinkle the inside of the hole, saying, Rain, rain. So we remove the misfortune which the woman had brought on the roads. The rain will be able to come. The country is purified. Believe for the Bartonga that severe droughts result from the concealment of miscarriages by women. Similarly, the Bartonga, another Bantu tribe of South Africa in the valley of the Limpopo River, attribute severe droughts to the concealment of miscarriages by women, and they perform the following rites to remove the pollution and procure rain. A small clearing is made in a thick and thorny wood, and near a pot is buried in the ground, so that its mouth is flush with the surface. From the pot, four channels run in the form of a cross to the four cardinal points of the horizon. Then a black ox or a black ram, without a speck of white on it, is killed, and the pot is stuffed with the half-digested grass found in the animal's stomach. Next, little girls, still in the age of innocence, are sent to draw water, which they pour into the pot till it overflows into the four channels. After that, the women assemble, strip off their clothes, and covering their nakedness only with a scanty petticoat of grass, they dance, leap and sing. Rain, rain. Then they go and dig up the remains of the prematurely born infants and of twins buried in dry ground on a hill. These they collect in one place. No man may approach the spot. The women would beat any male who might be so indiscreet as to intrude on their privacy, and they would put riddles to him which he would have to answer in the most filthy language borrowed from the circumcision ceremonies were obscene words, which are usually forbidden, are customary, and legitimate on these occasions. The women pour water on the graves of the infants, and of twins in order to extinguish, to mula them. As the natives phrase it, which seems to imply that the graves are thought to be the source of the scorching heat which is blasting the country. After the fall of evening, they bury all the remains they have discovered, poking them away in the mud near a stream. Then the rain will be free to fall, in these ceremonies, the pouring of water into the channels, which run in the direction of the four corners of the heaven, is clearly a charm based on the principles of homeopathic magic to procure rain. The supposed influence of twins over the waters of heaven and the use of foul language at rain-making ceremonies have been illustrated in another part of this work. Dangers apprehended from women in childbed by some tribes of Anam Among the natives of the New and Swan Valley in Anam, during the first months after a woman has been delivered of a child, all the persons of the house are supposed to be affected with an evil destiny or ill luck called Fong Long. If a member of such a household enters another house, the inmates never fail to say to him, You bring me the Fong Long. Should a member of a family in which somebody is seriously ill have to enter a house infected by the Fong Long, on returning home, he always fumigates himself with tea leaves or some other plant in order to rid himself of the infection which he has contracted. For they fear that the blood of the woman who has been brought to bed may harm the patient. All the time the house is tainted with a fong long, a branch of cactus, euphorbia antiquorum, or pandanus is hung at the door. The same thing is done to a house infected by smallpox. It is a danger signal to warn people off. The fong long only disappears when the woman has gone to market for the first time after her delivery. A trace of a similar belief in the dangerous infection of childbirth may be seen in the rule of ancient Greek religion, 
which forbade persons who had handled a corpse or been in contact with a lying woman to enter a temple or approach an altar for a certain time, sometimes for two days. Taboos imposed on lads at initiation. Restrictions and taboos like those laid on menstruous and lying in women are imposed by some savages on lads at the initiatory rites which celebrate the attainment of puberty. Hence we may infer that at such times young men are supposed to be in a state like that of women at menstruation and in childbed. Thus among the Creek Indians, a lad at initiation had to abstain for twelve moons from picking his ears or scratching his head with his fingers. He had to use a small stick for these purposes. For four moons he must have a fire of his own to cook his food at, and a little girl, a virgin, might cook for him. During the fifth moon, any person might cook for him, but he must serve himself first, and use one spoon and pan. On the fifth day of the twelfth moon, he gathered corn cobs, burned them to ashes, and with the ashes rubbed his body all over. At the end of the twelfth moon, he sweated under blankets, and then bathed in water, which ended the ceremony. While the ceremonies lasted, he might touch no one, but lads who were undergoing a like course of initiation. Kaffir boys had circumcision, they secluded in a special hut, they are smeared from head to foot with white clay. They wear tall headdresses with horn-like projections and short skirts like those of ballet dancers. When their wounds are healed, all the vessels which they had used during their seclusion and the boyish mantles which they had hitherto worn are burned, together with the hut, and the boys rush away from the burning hut without looking back, lest the fearful curse should cling to them. After that they are bathed, anointed, and clad in new garments. Section 4. Warriors Tabooed. Taboos laid on warriors when they go forth to fight. Once more, warriors are conceived by the savage to move, so to say, in atmosphere of spiritual danger, which constrains them to practice a variety of superstitious observances quite different in their nature from those rational precautions, which, as a matter of course, they adopt against foes of flesh and blood. The general effect of these observances is to place the warrior both before and after victory in the same state of seclusion or spiritual quarantine in which for his own safety primitive man puts his human gods and other dangerous characters. Thus when the Maoris went out on the warpath they were sacred or taboo in the highest degree and they and their friends at home had to observe strictly many curious customs over and above the nearest taboos of ordinary life. They became in the irreverent language of Europeans who knew them in the old fighting days tabooed an inch thick, and as for the leader of the expedition, he was quite unapproachable. Similarly, when the Israelites march forth to war, they are bound by certain rules of ceremony and purity, identical with the rules observed by Marys and Australian blackfellows on the warpath. The vessels they used were sacred, and they had to practice continence and a custom of personal cleanliness, of which the original motive, if we may judge from the avowed motive of savages who conformed to the same custom, was a fear lest the enemy should obtain the refuse of their persons and thus be enabled to work their destruction by magic. Among some Indian tribes on North America, a young warrior in his first campaign had to conform to certain customs, of which two were identical with the observances imposed by the same Indians on girls at their first menstruation. The vessels he ate and drank out of might be touched by no other person, and he was forbidden to scratch his head or any other part of his body with his fingers. If he could not help scratching himself, he had to do it with his stick. The latter rule, like the one which forbids a taboo person to feed himself with his own fingers, seems to rest on the supposed sanctity or pollution, whichever we choose to call it, of the tabooed hands. Moreover, among the Indian tribes, the men on the warpath had always to sleep at night with their faces turned towards their own country. However uneasy the posture, they might not change it. They might not sit upon the bare ground, nor wet their feet, nor walk on a beaten path, if they could help it. When they had no choice but to walk on a path, they sought to counteract the ill effect of doing so by doctoring their legs with certain medicines or charms which they carried with them for the purpose. No member of the party was permitted to step over the legs, hands, or body of any other member who chanced to be sitting or lying on the ground. And it was equally forbidden to step over his blanket, gun, tomahawk, or anything that belonged to him. If this rule was inadvertently broken, it became the duty of the member 
whose personal property had been stepped over to knock the other member down, and was similarly the duty of that other to be knocked down peaceably and without resistance. The vessels out of which the warriors ate their food were commonly small bowls of wood or birch bark, with masks to distinguish the two sides. And marching from home, the Indians invariably drank out of one side of the bowl, and returning they drank out of the other. When on their way home they came within a day's march of the village, they hung up all their bowls on trees, or threw them away on the prairie, doubtless to prevent their sanity or defilement from being communicated with disastrous effects to their friends, just as we have seen that the vessels and clothes of the sacred Mikado, of women at childbirth and menstruation, of boys at circumcision, and of persons defiled by contact with the dead, are destroyed or laid aside for a similar reason. The verse four times an Apache Indian goes out on the warpath, he is bound to refrain from scratching his head with his fingers and from letting water touch his lips. Hence he scratches his head with a stick and drinks through a hollow reed or cane. Sticks and reed are attached to the warrior's belt and at each other by a leathern thong. The rule not to scratch their heads with their fingers but to use a stick for the purpose instead was regularly observed by Ojibwe's on the warpath. Ceremonies observed by American Indians before they went out on the warpath. For three or four weeks before they went on a warlike expedition, the Nootka Indians made it a variable rule to go into the water five or six times a day, and they washed and scrubbed themselves from head to foot with the bushes intermixed with briars, so that their bodies and faces were often entirely covered with blood. During this severe exercise, they continually exclaimed, Good or great God, let me live, not to be sick, find the enemy, not fear him, find him asleep, and kill a great many of them. All this time they had no intercourse with their women, and for a week before setting out abstained from feasting and every kind of merriment. For the last three days they were almost constantly in the water, scrubbing and lacerating themselves in a terrible manner. They believed this hardened their skin, so that the weapons of the enemy could not pierce them. Before they went out of the war path, the Arakaras and the big belly Indians, Grosventhres, Observe a rigorous fast, or rather abstain from every kind of food for four days. In this interval, their imagination is exalted to delirium, whether it be through bodily weakness or the natural effect of the warlike plans they cherish, they pretend to have strange visions. The elders and sages of the tribe, being called upon to interpret these dreams, drew from them omens more or less favourable to the success of the enterprise and their explanations are received as oracles by which the expedition will be faithfully regulated. So long as the preparatory fast continues, the warriors make incisions in their bodies, and so pieces of wood in the flesh, and having fastened leather thongs to them, cause themselves to be hung from a beam which is fixed horizontally above an abyss a hundred and fifty feet deep. Often indeed they cut off one or two fingers which they offer in sacrifice to the great spirit, in order that they may come back laden with scalps. It is hard to conceive any course of training which could more effectually incapacitate men for the business of war than that which these foolish Indians actually adopted. With regard to the Creek Indians and kindred tribes, we are told they will not cohabit with women while they are out of war. They religiously abstain from every kind of intercourse hidden with their own wives for the space of three days and nights before they go to war, and so after they return home, because they are to sanctify themselves and as a preparation for attacking the enemy, they go to the aforesaid winter house, and there drink a warm decoction of their supposed wholly consecrated herbs and roots for three days and nights, sometimes without any other refreshment. This is to induce the dirty to guard and prosper them amidst their impending dangers. In the most promising appearance of things, they are not to take the least nourishment of food, nor so much as to sit down, during that time of sanctifying themselves till after sunset. Rules observed by Indians on a war expedition While on their expedition, they are not allowed to lean themselves against a tree, though they may be exceedingly fatigued after a sharp day's march. Nor must they lie by a whole day to refresh themselves, or kill and barbecue deer and bear for their war journey. The more virtuous they are, they reckon the greater will be their success against the enemy by the bountiful smiles of the deity. To gain that favourite point, some of the aged warriors narrowly watch the young men who are newly initiated, 
as they should prove irreligious, and profane the holy fast, and bring misfortunes on the outstanding camp. A gentleman of my acquaintance, in his youthful days, observed one of their religious fasts, but under the greatest suspicion of his virtue in this respect, there he often headed them against the common enemy. During the three days' purification, he was not allowed to go out of the sanctified ground. Without a trusty guide, this tongue should have tempted him to violate their old martial law, and by that means have raised the burning wrath of the holy fire against the whole camp. Every war captain chooses a noted warrior to attend on him and the company. He is called Itsisu, or the waiter. Everything they eat or drink during their journey, he gives them out of his hand, by a rigid, abstemious rule. Though he carries on his back all his travelling conveniencies, wrapped in a deer skin, yet they are so bigoted in their religious customs in war, that none, though prompted by sharp hunger or burning thirst, dares relieve himself. They are contented with such trifling allowances as a religious waiter distributes to them, even with a scanty hand. Such a regimen would be too mortifying to any of the white people, let their opinion of its violation be ever so dangerous. When I roved the woods in a war party with the Indians, though I carried no script, nor a bottle, nor staff, I kept a large hollow cane, well corked at each end, and used to shear off now and then to drink, while they suffered great my thirst. The constancy of the savages in mortifying their bodies to gain the divine favour is astonishing, from the very time they beat their arms till they return from their campaign. All the while they are out, they are prohibited by ancient custom, the leaning against the tree, either sitting or standing, nor are they allowed to sit in the daytime, under the shade of trees, if it can be avoided, nor on the ground during the whole journey, but on such rock stones or fallen woods, as they arc of war rests upon. By their attention, they invariably pay to those severe rules of living. They weaken themselves much more than by the unavoidable fatigues of war. But it is fruitless to endeavour to dissuade them from those high things which they have by tradition, as the important means to move the deity, to grant them success against the enemy, and a safe return home. An Indian, intended to go to war, will commence by blackening his face, permitting his hair to grow long, and neglecting his personal appearance, and also will frequently fast, sometimes for two or three days together, and refrain from all intercourse with the other sex. If his dreams are favourable, he thinks that the great spirit will give him success. Among the Barpedi and Bartonga tribes of South Africa, not only are the warriors to abstain from women, but the people left behind in the villages are also bound to continence. They think that any incontinence on their part would cause thorns to grow on the ground transversed by the warriors, and the success would not attend the expedition. The rule of continence observed by savage warriors is perhaps based on a fear of infecting themselves sympathetically with feminine weakness and cowardice. When we observe what pains these misguided savages took to unfit themselves for the business of war by abstaining from food, denying themselves rest, and lacerating their bodies, we shall probably not be disposed to attribute their practice of continence in war to a rational fear of dissipating their bodily energies by indulgence in the lusts of the flesh. On the contrary, we can scarcely doubt that the motive which impelled them to observe chastity on a campaign was just as frivolous as the motive which led them simultaneously to fritter away their strength by severe fasts, gratuitous fatigue, and voluntary wounds at the very moment when prudence called most loudly for a precisely opposite regime. Why exactly so many savages have made it a rule to refrain from women in time of war, we cannot say for certain, but we may conjecture that their motive was a superstitious fear lest, on the principles of sympathetic magic, close contact with women should infect them with feminine weakness and cowardice. Similarly, some savages imagine that contact with a woman in childbed enervates warriors and enfeebles their weapons. Indeed, the Cayans of central Borneo go so far as to hold that to touch a loom or women's clothes would so weaken a man that he would have no success in hunting, fishing, and war. Hence, it is not merely sexual intercourse with women as savage warriors sometimes shuns. He is careful to avoid the sex altogether. Thus among the hill tribes of Assam, not only are men forbidden to cohabit with their wives during or after a raid, but they may not eat food cooked by a woman, nay, they should not address a word even to their own wives. 
Once a woman who unwittingly broke the rule by speaking to her husband while he was under the war taboo, sickened and died when she learned the awful crime she had committed. End of section 6「Section 7 of The Golden Bow, A Study in Magic and Religion – Part 2 – Taboo in the Perils of the Soul by Sir James George Fraser – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 4 – Part 2 Section 5 Manslayers tabooed. Taboos laid on warriors after slaying their foes. If the reader still doubts whether the rules of conduct which we have just been considering are based on superstitious fears or dictated by our rational prudence, his doubts will probably be dissipated when he learns that the rules of the same sort are often imposed even more stringently on warriors after the victory has been won, and when all fear of the living corporeal foe is at an end. In such cases, one motive for the inconvenient restrictions laid on the victors in their hour of triumph is probably a dread of the angry ghosts of the slain, and that the fear of the vengeful ghosts is not influenced the behaviour of the slayers is often expressly affirmed. The effect of the taboos is to schedule the tabooed person from ordinary society. The general effect of the taboos laid on sacred chiefs, mourners, women at childbirth, men on the warpath, and so on, is to seclude or isolate the tabooed persons from ordinary society. This effect being attained by a variety of rules, which oblige the men and women to live in separate huts or in the open air, to shun the commerce of the sexes, to avoid the use of vessels employed by others, and so forth. And the same effect is produced by similar means in the case of victorious warriors, particularly such as have already shed the blood of their enemies. Seclusion of Manslayers in the East Indies In the island of Timor, when a warlike expedition is returned in triumph, bringing their heads of the vanquished foe, the leader of the expedition is forbidden by religion and custom to return at once to his own house. A special hut is prepared for him, in which he has to reside for two months, undergoing bodily and spiritual purification. During this time he may not go to his wife nor feed himself, the food must be put into his mouth by another person. That these observances are dictated by fear of the ghosts of the slain seems certain. For from another account of the ceremonies performed on the return of successful headhunter in the same island, we learn that sacrifices are offered on this occasion to appease the soul of the man whose head has been taken. The people think that some misfortune will fall the victor with such offerings omitted. Moreover, a part of the ceremony consists of a dance accompanied by a song in which the death of the slain man is lamented and his forgiveness is entreated. Be not angry, they say, because your head is here with us. Had we been less lucky, our heads might now have been exposed in your village. We have offered this sacrifice to appease you. Your spirit may now rest and leave us at peace. Why were you our enemy? Would it not have been better that we should remain friends? then your blood would not have been spilt, and your head would not have been cut off. The people of Palu in central Salibs take the heads of their enemies in war and afterwards propitiate the souls of the slain in the temple. In some Dyak tribes, men are returning from an expedition in which they have taken human heads, are obliged to keep by themselves and abstain from a variety of things for several days. They may not touch iron, nor eat salt or fish with bones, and they may have no intercourse with women. Seclusion of Manslayers in New Guinea In Lugia, an island of the southeastern extremity of New Guinea, men who have killed or assisted in killing enemies shut themselves up for about a week in their houses. They must avoid all intercourse with their wives and friends, and they may not touch food with their hands. They may eat vegetable food only, which is brought to them cooked in special pots. The intention of these restrictions is to guard the men against the smell of the blood of the slain, for it is believed that if they smelt the blood, they would fall ill and die. In the Toraripi or Motomotu tribe of southeast New Guinea, a man who has killed another may not go near his wife, and may not touch food with his fingers. 
he is fed by others, and only with certain kinds of food. These observances last till the new moon. Among the tribes at the mouth of the Wanakala River in New Guinea, a man who has taken life is considered to be impure until he has undergone certain ceremonies. As soon as possible after the deed, he cleanses himself and his weapon. This satisfactorily accomplished, he repairs to his village and seats himself on the logs of sacrificial stagging. No one approaches him or takes any notice whatever of him. A house is prepared for him which is put in charge of two or three small boys as servants. He may eat only toasted bananas and only the centre portion of them, the ends being thrown away. On the third day of his seclusion, a small feast is prepared by his friends, who also fashion some new perennial bands for him. This is called Evi Poro. The next day the man dons all his best ornaments and badges for taking life, and sallies forth fully armed and parades the village. The next day a hunt is organised, and a kangaroo is selected from the game captured. It is cut open, and the spleen and liver rubbed over the back of the man. He then walks solemnly down to the nearest water, and standing straddle legs in it, washes himself. All the young, untried warriors swim between his legs. This is supposed to impart courage and strength to them. The following day, at early dawn, he dashes out of his house, fully armed, and calls aloud the name of his victim. Having satisfied himself that he has thoroughly scared the ghost of the dead man, he returns to his house. The beating of flooring boards and the lighting of fires is also a certain method of scaring the ghost. A day later, his purification is finished. He can then enter his wife's house. Among the rural speaking tribes of British New Guinea, homicides were secluded in the warriors' clubhouse. They had to pass a night in the building, but during the day, they might paint and decorate themselves and dance in front of it. For some time, they might not eat much food, nor touch it with their hands, but were obliged to pick it up on a bone fork, the heft of which was wrapped in a banana leaf. After a while they bathed in the sea, and thence forward, for a period of about a month, though they had still to sleep in the warrior's clubhouse. They were free to eat as much food as they pleased, and to pick it up with their bare hands. Finally, those warriors who had never killed a man before, assumed a beautiful ornament made of fretted turtle shell, which none but homicides were allowed to flaunt in their headdresses. Thence came a dance, and that same night, the men who wore the honourable badge of homicide for the first time were chased about the village. Embers were thrown at them and firebrands waved in order, apparently, to drive away the souls of the dead enemies, who seemed to be convinced, as imminent in some way, of the headgear of their slayers. Again among the Kowita of British New Guinea, when a man had killed another, whether the victim were male or female, he did not wash the blood off the spear or club but carefully let it dry on the weapon. On his way home, he bathed in fresh or salt water, and on reaching his village, went straight to his own house, where he remained in seclusion for about a week. He was taboo, aina. He might not approach women, and he lifted his food to his mouth with a bone fork. His women folk were not obliged to leave the house, but they might not come near him. At the end of a week, he built a rough shelter in the forest, where he lived for a few days, during this time, he made a new waistband, which he wore on his return to the village. A man who has slain another is supposed to grow thin and emaciated, because he had been splashed with the blood of his victim, and as the corpse rotted, he wasted away. Among the southern Masim of British New Guinea, a warrior who has taken a prisoner or slain a man remains secluded in his house for six days. During the first three days, he may eat only roasted food and must cook it for himself. Then he bathes and blackens his face for the remaining three days. The Manslayer Unclean Among the minor bones of German New Guinea, any one who has slain a foe in war becomes thereby unclean. Bolo Bolo, and they apply the same term unclean to menstruous and lying in women, and also to everything that has come into contact with a corpse, which shows that all these classes of persons and things are closely associated in their minds. The unclean man who has killed an enemy in battle must remain a long time in the men's clubhouse while the villagers gather round him and celebrate his victory with dance and song. He may touch nobody, not even his own wife and children. If he were to touch them, it is believed that they would be covered with sores. He becomes clean again by washing using other modes of purification. 
driving away the ghosts of the slain. In Windeshi, Dutch New Guinea, when a party of headhunters has been successful, and they are nearing home, they announce their approach and success by blowing on triton shells. Their canoes are also decked with branches. The faces of the men who have taken a head are blackened with charcoal. If several have taken part in killing the same victim, his head is divided among them. They always time their arrival so as to reach home in the early morning. They come rowing to the village with a great noise, and the women stand ready to dance in the verandas of the houses. The canoes row past the room strand, or house where the young men live, and as they pass, the murderers throw as many pointed sticks or bamboos at the wall or the roof as where enemies killed. The day is spent very quietly. Now and then they drum or blow on the conch, and other times they beat the walls of the houses with loud shouts to drive away the ghosts of the slain. Similarly, in the Dore district of Dutch New Guinea, if a murder has taken place in the village, the inhabitants assemble for several evenings in succession and utter frightful yells to drive away the ghost of the victim in case it should be minded to hang about the village. So the Abim of German New Guinea believe that the spirit of a murdered man pursues his murderer and seeks to do him a mischief. Hence they drive away the spirit with the shouts and the beating of drums. When the Fijians had buried a man alive, as they often did, they used a nightfall to make a great uproar by means of bamboos, trumpet shells, and so forth, for the purpose of finding away his ghost, lest he should attempt to return to his old home, and to render his house unattractive to him. They dismantled it and clothed it with everything that to their ideas seemed most repulsive. On the evening of the day on which they had tortured a prisoner to death, the American Indians were wont to run through the village with hideous yells, beating with sticks on the furniture, the walls, and the roofs of the huts to prevent the angry ghost of their victim from settling there and taking vengeance for the torments that his body had endured at their hands. Once, says the traveller, on approaching the night, a village of Ottawa's, I found all the inhabitants of confusion. They were all busily engaged in raising noises of the loudest and most inharmonious kind. Upon inquiry, I found that a battle had been lately fought between the Ottawa's and the Kickaboos and the object of all this noise was to prevent the ghosts of the departed combatants from entering the village. Precautions taken by executioners against the ghosts of their victims The executioner at Porto Novo, on the coast of Guinea, used to decorate his walls with the jaw bones of the persons on whom he had operated in the course of business. But for this simple precaution, their ghosts would unquestionably have come at night to knock with sobs and groans, in an insufferable manner, at the door of the room where he slept, the sleep of the just. The temper of a man who had just been executed is naturally somewhat short, and a burst of vexation as goes is apt to fall foul of the first person he comes across, without discriminating between the objects of his wrath with that nicety of judgment which in calmer moments he may be expected to display. Hence in China it is, or used to be customary, for the spectators of an execution to show a clean pair of heels to the ghosts as soon as the last head was off. The same fear of the spirits of his victims leads the executioner sometimes to live in seclusion for some time after he had discharged his office. Thus an old writer, speaking of a city on the gold coast of West Africa, tells us that the executioner has been reckoned and pure for three days. They build them a separate hut at a distance from the village. Meantime these fellows run like madmen, through the place, seizing all they can lay hands on, poultry, sheep, bread and oil, everything they can touch is theirs, being teams so polluted that the owners willingly give it up. They continue three days confined to their hut, their friends bringing them victuals. This time expired, they take their hut in pieces, which they bundle up, not leaving so much as the ashes of their fire. The first executioner, having a pot on his head, leads them to the place where the criminals suffered. There they all call him thrice by his name. The first executioner breaks his pot, and leaving the other old rags and bundles, they all scamper home. Hence the thrice-repeated invocation of the victim, by name, gives the clue to the rest of the observances. All of them are probably intended to ward off the angry ghost of the slain man, or to give him the slip. Purification of manslayers among the Basotos and Bekwanas 
Among the Basutos, ablution is specially performed on return from battle. It is absolutely necessary that the warriors should rid themselves as soon as possible of the blood they have shed, or the shades of their victims would pursue them incessantly and disturb their slumbers. They go in a procession, and in full armour, to the nearest stream. At the moment they enter the water, a diviner, placed higher up, throws some purified substances into the current. This is, however, not strictly necessary. The javelins of battle axes also undergo the process of washing. According to another account of the Basuntal custom, warriors who have killed an enemy are purified. The chief has to wash them, sacrificing an ox in presence of the whole army. They are also anointed with the gall of the animal, which prevents the ghost of the enemy from pursuing them any further. Among the Bekwanans, a man who has killed another, whether in war or in single combat, is not allowed to enter the village until he has been purified. The ceremony takes place in the evening. An ox is slaughtered, and a hole having been made through the middle of the carcass with a spear, the manslayer has to force himself through the animal, while two men hold its stomach open. Sometimes, instead of being obliged to squeeze through the carcass of an ox, the manslayer is merely smeared with the contents of its stomach. The ceremony has been described as follows. In the purification of warriors, too, the ox takes a conspicuous part. The warrior who has slain a man in the battle is unclean, and must, on no account, enter his own courtyard, or it would be a serious thing if even his shadow were to fall upon his children. He studiously keeps himself apart from the civil life of the town until he is purified. The purification ceremony is significant. Having bathed himself in running water, or if that is not convenient, in water that has been appropriately medicated, he is smeared by the doctor with the contents of the stomach of an ox, into which certain powdered roots have been already mixed, and then the doctor strikes him on the back, sides, and belly with the large bowel of an ox. A doctor takes a piece of roasted beef and cuts it into small lumps of about the size of a walnut, laying them carefully on a large wooden trencher. He has already prepared charcoal by roasting the root of certain trees in an old crack pot, and this he grinds down and sprinkles on lumps of meat on the trencher. Then the army surrounds the trencher. Every one who has slain a foe in the battle steps forth, kneels down before the trencher, and takes out a piece of meat with his mouth, taking care not to touch it or the trencher with his hands. As he takes the meat, the doctor gives him a smart cut with a switch, and when he has eaten the lump of meat, his purification is complete. This ceremony is called Go Alafsha Dente, or the purification of the strikers. The writer to whom we owe this description adds, the taking of meat from the trencher without using the hands is evidently a matter of ritual. The observation is correct. Here, as in so many cases, persons ceremoniously unclean are forbidden to touch food with defiled hands until the uncleanness has been purged away. Purification of Manslayers Among the Begushu The same taboo is laid on the manslayer by the Begushu of British East Africa. Among them a man who has killed another may not return to his own house on the same day, though he may enter the village and spend the night in a friend's house. He kills a sheep and smears his chest, his right arm, and his head with the contents of the animal's stomach. His children are brought to him, and he smears them in a like manner. Then he smears each side of the doorway with the tripe and entrails, and finally throws the rest of the stomach on the roof of his house. For a whole day he may not touch food with his hands, but picks it up with two sticks and so conveys it to his mouth. His wife is not under any such restrictions. She may even go to mourn for the man whom her husband has killed, if she wishes to do so. In some Bekoana tribes, the victorious warrior is obliged to eat a piece of the skin of the man he killed. The skin is taken from about the navel of his victim, and without it he may not enter the cattle pen. Moreover, the medicine man makes a gash with a spear in the warrior's thigh for every man he has killed. Expulsion of the Ghosts of the Slain by the Angoni Among the Angoni, a Zulu tribe settled to the north of Zambezi, warriors who have slain foes on an expedition smear their bodies and faces with ashes, 
and garments of their victims on their persons and tie bark ropes round their necks so that the ends hang down over their shoulders or breasts this costume they wear for three days after their return and rising at break of day they run through the village uttering frightful yells to drive away the ghosts of the slain which if they were not thus banished from the houses might bring sickness and misfortune on the inmates in some Kaffir tribes of south africa men who have been wounded or killed and an enemy in fight may not see the king nor drink milk till they have been purified an ox is killed and its gall intestines and other parts are boiled with roots of this decoction the men have to take three gulps and the rest is sprinkled on their bodies the wounded man has then to take a stick spit on it thrice point it thrice at the enemy and then throw it in his direction after that he takes an emetic and is declared clean seclusion and purification of manslayers in africa in some of these accounts nothing is said of an enforced seclusion at least after the ceremonial cleansing but some south african tribes certainly require the slayer of a very gallant foe in war to keep apart from his wife and family for ten days after he has washed his body in running water he also receives from the tribal doctor a medicine which he chews with his food when an Andy or British East Africa has killed a member of another tribe, he paints one side of his body, spear and sword red, and the other side white. For four days after the slaughter, he is considered unclean and may not go home. He has to build a small shelter by a river and live there. He may not associate with his wife or sweetheart, and he may eat nothing but porridge, beef and goat's flesh. At the end of the fourth day, he must purify himself by taking a strong purge made from the bark of the Sukethet tree, and by drinking goat's milk mixed with blood. Among the Akikuya of British East Africa, all who have shed human blood must be purified. The elders assemble, and one of them cuts a strip of hair from above both ears of each manslayer, and that the warriors rub themselves with the dung taken from the stomach of a sheep which has been slaughtered for the occasion. Finally their bodies are cleansed with water, all the hair remaining on their heads is subsequently shaved off by their wives. For a month after the shedding of blood, they may have no contact with women. On the contrary, when a Katosh warrior of British East Africa, who was killed or fell in battle, returns home, it is considered essential that he should have connection with his wife as soon as convenient. This is believed to prevent the spirit of his dead enemy from haunting and bewitching him. An Angoni who has killed a man in battle is obliged to perform certain purifactory ceremonies before he may return to ordinary life. Amongst other things, he must be sure to make an incision in the corpse of his slain foe, in order to let the gas escape and so prevent the body from swelling. If he fails to do so, his own body will swell in proportion as the corpse becomes inflated. Among the Ovambos of southern Africa, when the warriors return to their villages, those who have killed an enemy pass the first night in the open fields and may not enter their houses until they have been cleansed of the guilt of blood by an older man, who smears them for this purpose with a kind of porridge. Herero warriors on their return from battle may not approach the sacred hearth until they have been purified from the guilt of bloodshed. They crouch in a circle round the hearth, but at some distance from it, while the chief besprinkles their brows and temples with water in which branches of a holy bush have been placed. Again, ancient Herero custom requires that he who has killed a man or a lion should have blood drawn from his breast and upper arm so as to trickle on the ground. A special name, Otoni, is given to the cuts thus made. They must be made with a flint nor with an iron tool. Among the Bantu tribes of Kevirondo in eastern Africa, when a man has killed an enemy in warfare, he shaves his head on his return home and his friends rub a medicine which generally consists of goat's dung, over his body to prevent the spirit of the slain man from troubling him. Exactly the same custom is practiced for the same reason by the Wegira of German East Africa. With the Jalu of Kevirondo, the custom is somewhat different. Three days after his turn from the fight, the warrior shaves his head, but before he may enter his village, he has to hang a live fowl, head uppermost around his neck. Then the bird is decapitated, and his head left hanging round his neck. 
Soon after his return, a feast is made for the slain man, in order that his ghost may not haunt his slayer. After the slaughter of the Midianites, the Israelitish warriors were obliged to remain outside the camp for seven days. Whoever had killed a man or touched the slain had to purify himself and his captive. The spoil taken from the enemy had also to be purified, according to its nature, either by fire or water. Similarly, among the Basutos, cattle taken from the enemy are fumigated with bundles of lighted branches before they are allowed to mingle with the herds of the tribe. Manslaves in Australia guard themselves against the ghosts of the slain. The Arunta of Central Australia believe that when a party of men has been out against the enemy and taken a life, the spirit of the slain man follows the party on its return and is constantly on the watch to do a mischief to those of the band who actually shed the blood. It takes the form of a little bird called the Chichirkina and may be heard crying like a child in the distance as it flies. If any of the slayers should fail to hear its cry, he would become paralysed in his right arm and shoulder. At night time especially, when the bird is flying over the camp, the slayers have to lie awake and keep the right arm and shoulder carefully hidden, lest the bird should look down upon and harm them. When once they have heard its cry, their minds are at ease, because the spirit of the dead then recognises that he has been detected, and can therefore do no mischief. On their return to their friends, as soon as they come in sight of the main camp, they begin to perform an excited war dance, approaching in the form of a square and moving their shields as if to ward off something which was being thrown at them. This action is intended to repel the angry spirit of the dead man who is striving to attack them. Next, the men who did the deed of blood separate themselves from the others, and forming a line with spears at rest and shields held out in front, stand silent and motionless like statues. A number of old women now approach with a sort of exulting skip and strike the shields of the manslayers with fighting clubs till they ring again. They are followed by men who smite the shields with boomerangs. This striking of the shields is supposed to be a very effective way of frightening away the spirit of the dead man. The natives listen anxiously to the sounds emitted by the shields when they are struck, for if any man's shield gives forth a hollow sound on the blow, that man will not live long but a ring sharp and clear, he is safe. For some days after their return, the slayers will not speak of what they have done, and continue to paint themselves all over with powdered charcoal, and to decorate their foreheads and noses with green twigs. Finally, they paint their bodies and faces with bright colours, and become free to talk about the affair, but still the nights they must lie awake listening for the plaintive cry of the bird, in which they fancy they hear the voice of their victim. Seclusion of Manslayers in Polynesia In the Washington group of the Marquesas Islands, the man who has slain an enemy in battle becomes tabooed for ten days, during which he may hold no intercourse with his wife and may not meddle with fire. Hence another has to make fire and cook for him. Nevertheless, he is fitted with marked distinction and receives presents of pigs. In Fiji, anyone who has clubbed a human being to death in war was consecrated or tabooed. He was smeared red by the king with turmeric from the roots of his hair to his heels. A hut was built, and in it he had to pass the next three nights, during which he might not lie down, but must sleep as he sat. Till the three nights had elapsed, he must not change his garment, nor remove the turmeric, nor enter a house in which there was a woman. In the Palu Islands, when the men return from a warlike expedition in which they have taken a life. The young warriors who have been out fighting for the first time, and all who handle the slain, are shut up in a large council house and become tabooed. They may not quit the edifice, nor bathe, nor touch a woman, nor eat fish. Their food is limited to coconuts and syrup. They rub themselves with charmed leaves and chew charmed betel. After three days they go together to bathe as near as possible to the spot where the man was killed. Seclusion and purification of manslayers among the Tupi Indians of Brazil When the Tupi Indians of Brazil had made a prisoner in war, they used to bring him home amid great rejoicing, decked with the gorgeous plumage of tropical birds. In the villages well treated, he received a house and furniture and was married to a wife. 
when he was thus comfortably installed the relations and friends of his captor who had the first pick came and examined him and a sight of which of his limbs and joints they proposed to eat and according to their choice they were bound to provide him with victuals thus he might live for months or years treated like a king supplied of all the delicacies of the country and rearing a family of children who when they were big might or might not be eaten with their father while he was thus being fattened like a capon for the slaughter he wore a necklace of fruit or of fish bones strung on a cotton thread this was the measure of his life for every fruit or every bone on the string he had a month to live and as each moon waned and vanished they took a fruit or a bone from the necklace when only one remained they sent out invitations to friends and neighbours far and near who flocked in sometimes to the number of ten or twelve thousand to witness the spectacle and partake of the feast for often a number of prisoners were to die the same day father mother and children all together as a rule they showed a remarkable stolidity and indifference to death the club with which they were to be dispatched was elaborately prepared by the women who adorned it with tassels of feathers smeared it with the powdered shells of macaw's eggs and traced lines on the eggshell powder then they hung it on a pole above the ground in an empty hut and sank around it all night the executioner who was painted grey with ashes and his whole body covered with the beautiful feathers of parrots and other birds of gay plumage performed his office by striking the victim on the head from behind and dashing out his brains no sooner had he dispatched the prisoner than he retired to his house where he had to stay all that day without eating or drinking while the rest of the people feasted on the body of the victim or victims and for three days he was obliged to fast and remain in seclusion all this time he lay in his hammock and might not set foot on the ground if he had to go anywhere he was carried by bearers they thought that were he to break this rule some disaster would befall him or he would die meantime he was given a small bow and passed his time in shooting arrows into wax this he did in order to keep his hand and aim steady in some of the tribes they rubbed the pulse of the executioner with one of the eyes of his victims and hung the mouth of the murdered man like a bracelet on his arm afterwards he made incisions in his breast arms and legs and other parts of his body with the saw made of the teeth of an animal an ointment and a black powder were then rubbed into the wounds which left ineffaceable scars so artistically arranged that they presented the appearance of a totally fitting garment it is believed that he would die if he did not thus draw blood from his own body after slaughtering the captive we may conjecture that the original intention of these customs was to guard the executioner against the angry and dangerous ghosts of his victims seclusion and purification of manslayers among the north american indians among the natchez of north america young braves who had taken their first scalps were obliged to reserve certain rules of abstinence for six months they might not sleep with their wives nor eat flesh their only food was fish and hasty pudding if they broke these rules they believed that the soul of the man they had killed would work their death by magic that they would gain no more successes over the enemy and that the least wound inflicted on them would prove mortal when a choctaw had killed an enemy and taken his scalp he went into mourning for a month during which he might not comb his hair and if his head itched he might not scratch it except with a little stick which he wore fastened to his wrist for the purpose the ceremonial mourning for the enemies they had slain was not uncommon among the north american indians thus the dakotas when they had killed a foe unbraided their hair blackened the soles all over and wore a small knot of swans down on the top of the head they dress as mourners yet rejoice a thompson river indian of british columbia who had slain an enemy used to blacken his own face lest his victim's ghost should blind him when the osages have mourned over their own dead they will mourn for the foe just as if he was a friend from observing the great respect paid by the indians to the scalps they had taken and listening to the mournful songs which they howled in the shades of their victims catelyn was convinced that they had a superstitious dread of the spirits of their slain enemies and many conciliatory offices to perform to ensure their own peace seclusion and purification of manslayers among the pima indians when a pima indian has killed an apache he must undergo purification 
Sixteen days he fasts, and only after the fourth day is he allowed to drink a little pinole. During the whole time he may not touch meat nor salt, nor look on a blazing fire, nor speak to a human being. He lives alone in the woods, waited on by an old woman, who brings him his scanty dole of food. He bathes often in a river, and keeps his head covered almost the whole time with a plaster of mud. On the seventeenth day a large space is cleared near the village, and a fire lit in the middle of it. The men of the tribe form a circle round the fire, and outside of it sit all the warriors who have just been purified, each in a smaller excavation. Some of the old men take the weapons of the purified and dance with them in a circle, out of which both the slayer and his weapon are considered clean. But not until four days later is the man allowed to return to his family. No doubt the peace enforced by the government of the United States has, along with tribal warfare, abolished also these quaint customs. A fuller account of them has been given by a recent writer, and it deserves to be quoted at length. There was no law among the Pimmers, he says, observed with greater strictness than that which required purification and expiation for the deed that was at the same time the most lauded, the killing of an enemy. For sixteen days the warrior fasted in seclusion and observed meanwhile a number of taboos. Attended by an old man, the warrior who had to expiate the crime of blood guilt retired to the groves along the river bottom at some distance from the villages or wandered about the adjoining hills. During the period of sixteen days he was not allowed to touch his head with his fingers or his hair would turn white. If he touched his face it would become wrinkled. He kept a stick to scratch his head with and at the end of every four days the stick was buried at the root and on the west side of the cat's claw tree and a new stick was made of greasewood, arrow bush or any other convenient shrub. He then bathed in the river no matter how cold the temperature. The feast of victory, which his friends were observing in the meantime at the village, lasted eight days. At the end of that time, or when his period of retirement was half completed, the warrior might go to his home to get a fetish made from the hair of the Apache whom he had killed. The hair was wrapped in eagle down and tied with a cotton string and kept in a long medicine basket. He drank no water for the first two days and fasted for the first four. After that time, he was supplied with Pinol by his intended, who also instructed him as to his future conduct, telling him that he must henceforth stand back and tore all that was served when about taking a food and drink. If he was a married man, his wife was not allowed to eat salt during his retirement, else she would suffer from the hell disease which causes stiff limbs. The explanation offered for the observance of this law of lustration is that if it were not obeyed, the warrior's limbs will become stiffened or paralysed. Seclusion and purification of manslayers among the Pimas and Apaches The Apaches, the enemies of the Pimas, purify themselves for the slaughter of their foes by means of baths in the sweathouse, singing and other rites. These ceremonies they perform for all the dead simultaneously after their return home. But the Pimas, while punctilious on this point, resort to their elaborate ceremonies of purification the moment a single one of their own band or of the enemy has been laid low. How heavy these religious scruples must have told against the Pimas or their wars with their freighter's enemies is obvious enough. This long period of retirement immediately after a battle, says an American writer, greatly diminished the value of the Pimas as scouts and allies for the United States troops operated against the Apaches. The bravery of the Pimas was praised by all army officers having any experience with them, but Captain Burke and others have complained of their unreliability, due solely to their rigid observance of this religious law. In nothing, perhaps, is the penalty which superstition sooner or later entails on its devotees more prompt and crushing than the operations of war. Taboobs observed by Indians who had slain as close. Far away from the torrid home of the Pima and Apaches, an old traveller witnessed ceremonies of the same sort practised near the Arctic Circle by some Indians who had surprised and brutally massacred an unoffending helpless party of Eskimos. His description is so interesting that I will quote it in full. Among the various superstitious customs of those people, it is worth remarking, 
and ought to have been mentioned in its proper place, that immediately after my companions had killed the Eskimos at the Copper River, they considered themselves in a state of uncleanness, which induced them to practice some very curious and unusual ceremonies. In the first place, all who were absolutely concerned in the murder were prohibited from cooking any kind of victuals, either for themselves or others. As luckily, there were two in company who had not shed blood. They were employed always as cooks till we joined the women. This circumstance was exceedingly favourable on my side, for had there been no persons of the above description in company, that task, I was told, would have fallen on me, which would have been no less fatiguing and troublesome than humiliating and vexatious. When the victuals were cooked, all the murderers took a kind of red earth, or ochre, and painted all the space between the nose and the chin, as well as a greater part of their cheeks, almost to the ears, before they would taste a bit, and would not drink out of any other dish, or smoke out of any other pipe, but their own, and none of the others, seemed willing to drink or smoke out of theirs. We no sooner joined the women at our return from the expedition, than there seemed to be a universal spirit of emulation among them, fine who should first make a suit of ornaments for their husbands, which consisted of bracelets for the wrists, and a band for the forehead, composed of porcupine quills and moose hair, curiously wrought on leather. The custom of painting the mouth and part of the cheeks before each meal, and drinking and smoking out of their own utensils, was strictly and invariably observed, till the winter began to set in, and during the whole of that time, they would never kiss any of their wives or children. They refrained also from eating many parts of the deer and other animals, particularly the head and trails and blood. And during their uncleanness, the victuals were never sodden in water, but dried in the sun, eaten quite raw, or broiled, when a fire fit for the purpose could be procured. When the time arrived, that was to put an end to these ceremonies. The men, without a female being present, made a fire some distance from the tents, into which they threw all their ornaments, pipe stems, and dishes, which were soon consumed to ashes, out of which a feast was prepared, consisting of such articles as they had long been prohibited from eating. And when all was over, each man was at liberty to eat, drink, and smoke as he pleased, and also to kiss his wives and children at discretion which they seem to do with more raptures than I have ever known them to do it, either before or since. The purification of murderers like that of warriors who have slain enemies was probably intended to avert or appease the ghosts of the slain. Thus we see that warriors who have taken the life of a foe in battle are temporarily cut off from free intercourse with their fellows, and especially with their wives and must undergo certain rites of purification before they are redeemed to society. Now with the purpose of their seclusion, and of the expiratory rites which they have to perform is, as we have been laid to believe, no other than to shake off, frighten, or appease the angry spirit of the slain man. We may safely conjecture that the similar purification of homicides and murderers, who have imbued their hands in the blood of a fellow tribesman, had at first the same significance, and that the idea of a moral or spiritual regeneration symbolized by the washing, the fasting, and so on, was merely a latter interpretation put upon the old cost by men who had outgrown the primitive modes of thought in which the custom originated. The conjecture will be confirmed if we can show that savages have actually imposed certain restrictions on the murderer of a fellow tribesman, from a definite fear that he is haunted by the ghost of his victim. This we can do with regard to the Omahas, a tribe of the Siouan stock in North America. Among these Indians, the kinsmen of a murdered man had the right to put the murderer to death, but some must they were of their right in consideration of presence which they consented to accept. When the life of the murderer was spared, he had to observe certain stringent rules for a period which varied from two to four years. He must walk barefoot, and he must eat no warm food, nor raise his voice, nor look around. He was compelled to pull his robe about him and to have it tied at the neck, even in hot weather. He might not let it hang loose or fly open. He might not move his hands about, but it keep him close to his body. He might not comb his hair, and it might not be blown about by the wind. When the tribe went out hunting, he was obliged to pitch his tent about a quarter of a mile from the rest of the people, lest the ghost of his victim should raise a high wind, which might cause damage. 
Only one of his kindred was allowed to remain with him at his tent. No one wished to eat with him, for, they said, if we eat with him whom Wakanda hates, Wakanda will hate us. Sometimes he wandered at night, crying and lamenting his offence. At the end of his long isolation, the kinsman of the murdered man heard his crying and said, It is enough. Be gone and walk among the crowd. Put on more castings and wear a good robe. Here the reason alleged for keeping the murderer at a considerable distance from the hunters gives a clue to all the other restrictions laid on him. He was haunted and therefore dangerous. Ancient Greek Dread of the Ghosts of the Slain The ancient Greeks believed that the soul of a man who had just been killed was wroth with his slayer and troubled him. Wherefore it was needful even for the involuntary homicide to depart from his country for a year until the anger of the dead man had cooled down. Nor might the slayer return until sacrifice had been offered and ceremonies of purification performed. If his victim chanced to be a foreigner, the homicide had to shun the native country of the dead man as well as his own. The legend of the matricide Orestes, how he roamed from place to place pursued by the furies of his murdered mother, and none would sit and meet with him or take him in till he had been purified, reflects faithfully the real Greek dread of such as were still haunted by an angry ghost. When the turbulent people of Synethia, after perpetrating an atrocious massacre, sent an embassy to Sparta, every Arcadian town through which the envoys passed on their journey ordered them out of its walls at once, and the Mantinians, after the embassy had departed, even instituted a solemn purification of the city as territory by carrying sacrificial victims round at both. Taboos imposed on men who were partaken of human flesh. Among the Quekuitul Indians of British Columbia, men who have partaken of human flesh as a ceremonial rite are subjected for a long time afterwards to many restrictions or taboos of the sort we have been dealing with. They may not touch their wives for the whole year, and during the same time they are forbidden to work or gamble. For four months they must live alone in their bedrooms, and when they are obliged to quit the house for a necessary purpose, they may not go out at the ordinary act door, but must use only the secret door in the rear of the house. On such occasions each of them is attended by all the rest, carrying small sticks. They must all sit down together on a long log, then get up, then sit down again, repeating this three times before they are allowed to remain seated. Before they rise, they must turn round four times. Then they go back to the house. Before entering, they must raise their feet four times. With the fourth step, they really pass the door, taking care to enter with the right foot foremost. In the doorway, they turn four times and walk slowly into the house. They are not permitted to look back. During the four months of their seclusion, each man needing must use a spoon, dish and kettle of his own, which are thrown away at the end of the period. Before he draws water from a bucket or a brook, he must dip his cup into it thrice and he may not take more than four mouthfuls at a time. He must carry a wing bone of an eagle and drink through it, for his lips may not touch the brim of his cup. Also he keeps a copper nail to scratch his head with, for were his own nails to touch his own skin, they would drop off. For sixteen days after he has partaken of human flesh, he may not eat any warm food, and for the whole of the four months he is forbidden to cool hot food by blowing on it with his breath. At the end of winter, when the season of ceremonies is over, he feigns to have forgotten the ordinary ways of men and has to learn everything anew. The reason for these remarkable restrictions imposed on men who have eaten human flesh is not stated, but we may surmise that fear of the ghost of the man whose body was eaten has at least a good deal to do with them. We are confirmed in our conjecture by observing that though these cannibals sometimes contend themselves with taking bites out of living people, the rules in question are especially obligatory on them after they have devoured a corpse. Moreover, the careful treatment of the bones of the victim points to the same conclusion, for during the four months of seclusion observed by the cannibals, the bones of the person on whom they feast are kept alternately for four days at a time under rocks, in the sea, and in their bedrooms on the north side of the house, where the sun cannot shine on them. Finally, the bones are taken out of the house, tied up, weighed with a stone and thrown into deep water, because it is believed that if they were buried, they would come back and take their master's soul. 
This seems to mean that if the bones of the victim were buried, the ghost would come back and fetch away the souls of the men who had eaten his body. The Gibars, a cannibal tribe in the north of New Guinea, are much afraid of the spirit of a slain man or woman. Among them persons who have taken of human flesh for the first time reside for a month afterwards in a small hut and may not enter the dwelling house. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Golden Bell, A Study in Magic and Religion, Part 2, Taboo in the Perils of the Soul, by Sir James George Fraser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4, Part 3. Section 6. Hunters and Fishers Tabooed. Hunters and fishers have to observe taboos and undergo rites of purification, which are probably directed by a fear of the spirits of the animals or fish which they have killed or intended to kill. In savage society, the hunter and the fishermen have often to observe rules of abstinence and to submit to ceremonies of purification of the same sort as those which are obligatory on the warrior and the manslayer. And though we cannot in all cases perceive the exact purpose which these rules and ceremonies are supposed to serve, we may with some probability assume that, just as the dread of the spirits of his enemies is the main motive for the seclusion and purification of the warrior who hopes to take or has already taken their lives, so the huntsman or fisherman who complies with similar customs is principally actuated by a fear of the spirits of the beasts, birds or fish which he has killed or intends to kill. But the savage commonly conceives animals to be endowed with souls and intelligences like his own, and hence he naturally treats them with similar respect. Just as he attempts to appease the ghosts of the men he has slain, so he essays to propagate the spirit of the animals he has killed. These ceremonies of propitiation will be described later on in this work. Here we have to deal first with the taboos observed by the hunter and the fisherman before or during the hunting of fishing seasons, and second with the ceremonies of purification which have to be practised by these men are returning with their booty from a successful chase. While the savage respects more or less the souls of all animals, he treats with particular deference the spirits of such as are either especially useful to him or formidable on account of their size, strength or ferocity. Accordingly, the hunting and killing of these valuable or dangerous beasts are subject to more elaborate rules and ceremonies than the slaughter of comparatively useless and insignificant creatures. Taboos and ceremonies observed before catching whales. Thus the Indians of Nukta Sound prepared themselves for catching whales by observing a fast for a week during which they ate very little, bathed in the water several times a day, sang and rubbed their bodies, limbs and faces with shelves and bushes till they looked as if they had been severely torn with briars. They were likewise required to abstain from any commerce with their women for the like period, this last condition being considered indispensable to their success. A chief who failed to catch a whale has been known to attribute his failure to a branch of chastity on the part of his men. It should be remarked that the conduct thus described as a preparation for whaling is precisely that which, in the same tribe of Indians, was required of men about to go on the warpath. Rules of the same sort are, or were formerly observed, by Malagsi whalers. For eight days before they went to sea, the crew of a whaler used to fast, abstaining from women and liquor, and confessing their most secret faults to each other. And if any man was found to have sinned deeply, he was forbidden to share in the expedition. In the island of Kadiak, of the south coast of Alaska, whalers are reckoned unclean during the fishing season, and nobody would eat out of the same dish with them, or even come near them. Yet we are told that great respect was paid to them, and that they were regarded as purveyors of their country. Though it is not expressly said, it seems to be implied, and on the strength of analogy we may assume, that these cardiac whalers had to remain chaste so long as the whaling season lasted. Taboo was observed as a precaution for catching dudong and turtle. In the island of Mayborg, Continence was imposed on the people both before they went to hunt the dudong and while the turtles were pairing. The turtle season lasts during parts of October and November, and if at that time unmarried persons had sexual intercourse with each other, it was believed that when the canoe approached the floating turtle, 
the male would separate from the female, and both would dive down in different directions. So at Moat, in New Guinea, men had no relation with women when the total are coupling, though there is considerable laxity of morals at other times. Among the motto of Port Moresby, in New Guinea, chastity is enjoyed before fishing and wallaby hunting. They believe that men who have been unchaste will be unable to catch the fish and the wallabies, which all turn round and jeer at their pursuers. Among the tribes about the north of the Wenagala River in New Guinea, the preparations for fishing turtle and dulong are most elaborate. They begin two months before fishing. A headman is appointed who becomes holy. On his strict observance of the laws of the dugong net depends the success of the season. While the men of the village are making the nets, this sanctified leader is entirely secluded from his family and may only eat a roasted banana or two after the sun has gone down. Every evening at sundown he goes ashore and stripping himself of all his ornaments, which he is never allowed to doff at other times, bathes near where the dugons feed. As he does so, he throws scraped coconut and scented herbs and gums into the water to charm the dugon. Taboos observed as a preparation for hunting and fishing. Among the rural speaking tribes of British New Guinea, the magician who performs ceremonies for the success of a wallaby hunt must abstain from intercourse with his wife for a month before the hunt takes place, and he may not eat food cooked by his wife or by any other woman. In the island of Uap, one of the Carolean group, every fisherman plying his craft lies under a most strict taboo during the whole of the fishing season, which lasts for six or eight weeks. Whenever he is on shore, he must spend all his time in the men's clubhouse, Felu, and under no pretext whatever may he visit his own house, or so much as look upon the faces of his wife and womenkind. Were he but to steal a glance at them, they think that flying fish must inevitably bore out his eyes at night. If his wife, mother or daughter, brings any gift for him or wishes to talk with him, she must stand down towards the shore with her back turned to the men's clubhouse. Then the fisherman may go out and speak to her, or with his back turned to her. He may receive what she has brought him, at which he must return at once to his rigorous confinement. Indeed, the fisherman may not even join in dance and song, with the other men at the clubhouse in the evening, they must keep themselves and be silent. In the Pelu Islands, also which belong to the Carolyn group, fishmen are likewise debarred from intercourse with women, since it is believed that any such intercourse would infallibly have a prejudicial effect on the fishing. The same taboo is said to be observed in all the other islands of the South Sea. Taboos and ceremonies observed at the hatching and pairing of silkworms. In Mazabur, when the seed of the silkworm is brought into the house, the coal, or buyar, puts it in a place which has been carefully plastered with holy cow dung to bring good luck. From that time the owner must be careful to avoid ceremonial impurity. He must give up cohabitation with his wife. He may not sleep on a bed, nor shave himself, nor cut his nails, nor anoint himself with oil, nor eat food cooked with butter, nor tell lies, nor do anything else that he deems wrong. He vows a sinkan mati devi, that if the worms are duly born, he will make her an offering. When the cocoons open and the worms appear, he assembles the women of the house, and they sing the same song as at the birth of a baby, and red lead is smeared on the parting of the hair of all the married women in the neighbourhood. When the worms pair, rejoicings are made as at marriage. Thus the silkworms are treated as far as possible like human beings, Hence the custom which prohibits the commerce of the sexes while the worms are hatching may be only an extension, by analogy, of the rule which is observed by many races, that the husband may not cohabit with his wife during pregnancy and lactation. Taboos observed by fishermen in Uganda On Lake Victoria, Nyanza, the Uganda fishermen use a long stout line which is supported on the surface of the water by wooden floats while short lines with baited hooks attached to them depend from it at frequent intervals. The place where the fishman makes this line, whether in his hut or his garden, is tabooed. People may not step over his cords or tools, and he himself has to observe a number of restrictions. He may not go near his wife or any other woman. He eats alone, works alone, sleeps alone. He may not wash except in the lake. 
He may not eat salt or meat or butter. He may not smear any fat on his body. When the lion is ready, he goes to the god, asks his blessings on it, and offers him a pot of beer. In return, he receives from the deity a stick or bit of wood to fasten to the lion, and also some medicine or herbs to smoke and blow over the water in order that the fish may come to the lion and be caught. Then he carries the lion to the lake. If in going thither, he should stumble over a stone or a tree root, he takes it with him, and he does the same with any grass seeds that may stick to his clothes. These stones, roots and seeds he puts on the line, believing that just as he stumbled over them, and they stuck to him, so the fish will also stumble over them and stick to the line. The taboo lasts till he has caught his first fish. If his wife has kept the taboo, he eats the fish with her. But if she is broken it, she may not partake of the fish. After that, if he wishes to go to his wife, he must take his line out of the water and place it in a tree or some other place of safety. He is then free to be with her. But so long as the line is in the water, he must keep apart from women, or the fish would at once leave the shore. Any breach of this taboo renders the line useless to him. He must sell it and make a new one, and offer an expiatory offering to the god. Again in Uganda, the fisherman offers fish to his canoe. Believing that if he neglected to make this offering more than twice, his net would catch nothing. The fish thus offered to the canoe is eaten by the fisherman. But if at the time of emptying the traps there is any man in the canoe who has committed adultery, eaten fish with salt, or rubbed his body with butter or fat, that man is not allowed to partake of the fish offered to the canoe. And if the sinner has not confessed his fault to the priest and been purified, the catch will be small. When the adulterer has confessed his sin, the priest calls the husband of the guilty woman and tells him of her crime. Her paramour has to wear a sign to show that he is doing penance, and he makes a feast for the injured husband, which the latter is obliged to accept in token of reconciliation. After that, the husband may not punish either of the erring couple. The sin is atoned for, and they are able to catch fish again. Continents observed by Bangala fishermen and hunters among the Magala of the Upper Congo, while fishermen are making their traps, they must observe strict continence, and the restriction lasts until the traps have caught fish and the fish have been eaten. Similarly, Bangala hunters may have no sexual intercourse from the time they made their traps until they have caught game and eaten it. It is believed that any hunter who broke this rule of chastity would have bad luck in the chase. Taboos observed by hunters in Nias. In the island of Nias, the hunters sometimes dig pits, cover them lightly with twigs, grass and leaves, and then drive the game into them. While they are engaged in digging the pits, they have to observe a number of taboos. They may not spit, or the game would turn back in disgust from the pits. They may not laugh, or the sides of the pit would fall in. They may eat no salt, prepare no fodder for swine, and in the pit they may not scratch themselves, or if they did, the earth would be loosened and would collapse and the night after digging the pit, they may have no intercourse with a woman, or all their labour would be in vain. The practice of consonance by fishers and hunters seems to be based on a notion that incontinence offends the fish and the animals. This practice of observing strict chastity as a condition of success in hunting and fishing is very common among rude races. Any instance of which it has been cited rendered probable that the rule is always based on a superstition rather than on a consideration of the temporary weakness which a breach of the custom may entail on the hunter or fisherman. In general, it appears to be supposed that the evil effect of inconstance is not so much that it weakens him as that, for some reason or other, it offends the animals, who in consequence will not suffer themselves to be caught. In the Motomutu tribe of New Guinea, a man will not see his wife the night before he starts on a great fishing or hunting expedition. If he did, he would have no luck. In the Motu tribe, he is regarded as holy that night, and in the morning, no one may speak to him or call out his name. In German East Africa, elephant hunters must refrain from women for several days before they set out for the chase. We have seen that, in the same region, a wife's infidelity during the hunter's absence is believed to give the elephant power over him so as to kill or wound him. As this belief is clearly a superstition based on sympathetic magic, no doubt this is the practice of chastity before the hunt.
The pygmies of the great African forest are also reported to observe strict consonants the night before an important hunt. It is said that, at this time, they propagate their ancestors by rubbing their skulls, which they keep in boxes, with palm oil and with water in which the ashes of the bark and leaves of a certain tree, Molduna, have been mixed. Chastity observed by American Indians before hunting. The Hukul Indians of Mexico think that only the pure of heart should hunt the deer. The deer would never enter a snare put up by a man in love. It would only look at it, snort, poo poo, and go back the way it came. Good luck in love means bad luck in deer hunting. But even those who have been absent must invoke the aid of the fire to burn the last taint or blemish out of them. So the night before they set out for the chase, they gather round the fire and play aloud, all trying to get as near as they can to the flaming god, and turning every side of their bodies to his blessed influence. They hold out their open hands to it, warm the palms, spit on them, and then rub them quickly over the joints, legs, and shoulders, as the shamans do in, in curing a sick man in order that their limbs and sinners may be as strong as their hearts are pure for the task of the morrow. A carrier Indian of British Columbia is to separate from his wife for a full month before he set traps for bears, and during this time he might not drink from the same vessel as his wife, but had to use a special cup made of birch bark. The neglect of these precautions would cause a cane to escape after it has been snared, but when he was about to snare Martens, the period of continence was cut down to ten days. The Seer, a tribe of pure blue Indians, observed chastity for four days before a hunt, as well as the whole time that it lasts, even if the game be only rabbits. Among the Setsots Indians of British Columbia, hunters who desire to secure good luck fast and wash their bodies with ginger root for three or four days, and do not touch a one for two or three months. A Shaswap Indian who intends to go out hunting must also keep away from his wife, or he would have no luck. Among the Thompson Indians, the grizzly bear hunter must abstain from sexual intercourse for some time before he went forth to hunt. These Indians believe that bears always hear what is said of them, and the man who intends to go bear hunting must be very careful what he says about the beasts or about his preparations for killing them, or they will get wind of it and keep out of his way. In the same tribe of Indians, some trappers and hunters, who are very particular, do not eat with other people when they were engaged, or about to be engaged in hunting, or trapping. Neither would they eat food cooked by any woman, unless she were old. They drank cold water in which mountain juniper, or wild rhubarb, has been soaked, using a cup of their own, which no one else might touch. Hunters seldom combed their hair when they were on an expedition, but waited to do so till their return. The reason for this last rule is certainly not that at such seasons they have no time to attend to their persons. The custom is probably based on that superstitious objection to touch the heads of taboo persons of which some examples have already been given, and of which more will be adduced shortly. Taboos observed by Hidatsa Indians at Catching Eagles In the late afternoon or early winter, a few families of the Hidatsa Indians seek some quiet spot in the forest and pitch their camp there to catch eagles. After setting up their tents, they build a small medicine lodge, where the ceremonies supposed to be indispensable for trapping the eagles are performed. No woman may enter it. The traps are set on high places among the neighbouring hills. When some of the men wish to take part in the trapping, they fast and then go by day to the medicine lodge. There they continue without food till about midnight, when they partake of a little nourishment and fall asleep. They get up just before dawn, or when the morning star has risen, and go to their traps. There they sit all day without food or drink, watching for their prey, and struggling, it may be, from time to time, with a captive eagle, for they always take the birds alive. They return to their camp at sunset. As they approach, every one rushes into his tent, for the hunter may neither see nor be seen by any of his fellow hunters until he enters the medicine lodge. They spend the night in the lodge, and about midnight, eat and drink for the first time since the previous midnight, and they lie down asleep, and to rise again before dawn and repair anew to their traps. If any one of them has caught nothing during the day, he may not sleep at night, 
but I spend his time in loud lamentation and prayer. His routine has to be observed by each hunter for four days and four nights, on which he returns to his own tent, hungry, thirsty, and tired, and follows his ordinary pursuits till he feels able to go again to the eagle traps. During the four days of the trapping, he sees none of his family and speaks to none of his friends, except those who are engaged in the trapping at the same time. They believe that if any hunter fails to perform all these rites, the captive eagle will get one of his claws loose and tear his captor's hands. The men in the tribe who have had their hands crippled for life in that way. It is obvious that the severe fasting coupled with a short sleep, or even the total sleeplessness of the eagle hunters, can only impair the physical vigour, and so far tend to incapacitate them for capturing the eagles. The motive for their behaviour in these respects is purely superstitious, non rational, and so we may safely conclude, is a custom which simultaneously cuts them off from all intercourse with their wives and families. Miscellaneous examples of chastity practice by superstitious motives. An examination of the many cases in which the savage bridles his passions and remains chaste from motives of superstition would be instructive, but I cannot attempt it now. I will only add a few miscellaneous examples of their custom before passing to the ceremonies of purification which are observed by the hunter and fisherman after the chase and the fishing are over. The workers in the salt pans near Siphon in Laos, must abstain from all sexual relations at the place where they are at work, and they may not cover their heads nor shelter themselves as an umbrella from the burning rays of the sun. Among the Kachins of Burma, the ferment used in making beer is prepared by two women chosen by lot, who during the three days that the process lasts may eat nothing acid, and may have no conjugal relations with their husbands. Otherwise it is supposed that the beer would be sour. Among the Maasai, honey wine is brewed by a man and a woman who live in a hut set apart for them till the wine is ready for drinking. But they are strictly forbidden to have sexual intercourse with each other during this time. It is deemed essential that they should be chased for two days before they begin to brew and for the whole of the six days that the brewing lasts. The Maasai believe that were the couple to commit a breach of chastity, not only would the wine be undrinkable, but the bees which made the honey would fly away. Similarly, they require that a man who is making poison should sleep alone and observe other taboos, which render him almost an outcast. The Wandarobo, a tribe of the same region in the Maasai, believe that the mere presence of a woman in the neighbourhood of a man who is brewing poison would deprive the poison of its venom, and that the same thing would happen if the wife of the poison maker were to commit adultery while her husband was brewing the poison. Miscellaneous examples of chastity practiced from superstitious motives. In this last case, it is obvious that a rationalistic explanation of the taboo is impossible. How could the loss of virtue in the poison be a physical consequence of the loss of virtue in the poison maker's wife? Clearly, the effect which the wife's adultery is supposed to have on the poison is a cause of sympathetic magic. Her misconduct sympathetically affects her husband and his work at a distance. We may, accordingly, infer with some confidence that the rule of continence imposed on the poison maker himself is also a simple case of sympathetic magic, and not, as a civilized reader might be disposed to conjecture, a wise precaution designed to prevent him from accidentally poisoning his wife. Again, to take other instances, in the East Indian island of Buru, people smear their bodies with coconut oil as a protection against demons. But in order that the charm may be effective, the oil must have been made by young unmarried girls. In the Seranglo and Gorong Archipelagos, the same oil is regarded as an antidote to poison, but it only possesses this virtue if the nuts have been gathered on a Friday by a youth who has never known a woman, and if the oil has been extracted by a pure maiden while the priest recited the appropriate spells. So in the Marquesas Islands, when a woman was making coconut oil, she was tabooed for four or five or more days, during which she might have no intercourse with her husband. If she broke this rule, it was believed that she would obtain no oil. In the same islands, when a man has placed a dish of bananas and coconuts in an oven of hot stones to bake overnight, he might not go in to his wife, or the food would not be found baked in the morning. In ancient Mexico, the man who distilled the wine known as Balquer 
from the sap of the great aloe, might not touch a woman for four days. If they were unchaste, they thought the wine would be sour and putrid. Among the Ba Pedi and Ba Thonga tribes of South Africa, when the site of a new village has been chosen and the houses are building, all the married people are forbidden to have conjugal relations with each other. If it were discovered that any couple had broken this rule, the work of building would immediately be stopped and another site chosen for the village, for they think that a breach of chastity would spoil the village which was growing up and the chief would grow lean and perhaps die, and that the guilty woman will never bear another child. Among the chams of Chochin, China, when a dam is made or repaired on a river for the sake of irrigation, the chief offers the traditional sacrifices and implores the protection of the deities on the work, as to stay all the time in a rigid hovel of straw, taking no part in the labour, and observing the strictest continence, for the people believe that a breach of his chassis would entail a breach of the dam. Here it is plain, there can be no idea of maintaining the mere bodily vigour of the chief for the accomplishment of a task in which he does not even bear a hand. In New Caledonia, the wizard who performs certain superstitious ceremonies at the building and launching of a large canoe is bound to the most rigorous chastity the whole time that the vessel is on the stocks. Among the natives of the Gazelle Peninsula in New Britain, men who are engaged in making fire traps avoid women observe strict continence. They believe that if a woman were even to touch a fish trap, it would catch nothing. Here, therefore, the rule of continence probably springs from a fear of infecting sympathetically the traps with feminine weakness or perhaps with menstrual pollution. Continence was observed by the Motu or New Guinea before and during a trading voyage. Every year at the end of September or the beginning of October, when the northeast monsoon is near an end, a fleet of large sailing canoes leaves Port Moresby and the neighbouring Motu villages of New Guinea on a trading voyage to the deltas of the rivers which flow into the Papuan Gulf. The canoes are laden with a cargo of earthenware pots, and after about three months they return, sailing before the northwestern monsoon and bringing back a cargo of sago, which they have obtained by barter for their crockery. It is about the beginning of the southeast monsoon, that is, in April or May, at the skipper's who are leading men in the villages, make up their minds to go on these trading voyages. When the resolution is taken, they communicate it to their wives, and from about this time, husband and wife cease to cohabit. The same custom of conjugal separation is observed by what we may call the mate, or a second in command of each vessel. But it is not till the month of August that the work of preparing the canoes for sea by overhauling and corking them is taken seriously in hand. From that time, both skipper and mate become particularly sacred or taboo, hiligara, and consequently they keep apart from their wives more than ever. Husband and wife, indeed, sleep in the same house, but on opposite sides of it. In speaking of his wife, he calls her a maiden, and she calls him youth, and they have no direct conversation or dealings with each other. If he wishes to communicate with her, he does so through a third person, usually a relative of one of them, both refrain from watching themselves and he from combing his hair. The wife's position indeed becomes very much like that of a widow, but the canoe is being launched, skipper and maiden crew are all forbidden to touch their food with their fingers. They must always handle it and convey it to their mouths with a bone fork. A brief account of the custom and superstition had previously been given by a native pastor settled in the neighbourhood of Port Moresby. He says, here is a custom of trading voyage parties. If it is arranged to go westward to procure arrowwood, the leader of the party sleeps apart from his wife for the time being, and on until the turn for the expedition, which is sometimes a turn of five months. They say, if this is not done, the canoe of the chief will be sunk on the return voyage, or the arrow root lost in the sea, and he himself covered with shame. He, however, who observes the rule of self-denial, turns laden with arrow wood, has not a drop of salt water to injure his cargo, and so is praised by his companions and crew. Continent is preserved by the Akamba and Akakuyu on a journey and other occasions. The Akamba and Akakuyu of Eastern Africa retain from the commerce of the sexes on a journey, even if their wives are with them in the caravan, and they observe the same rule of chastity so long as the cattle are at pasture, that is, from the time the herds are driven out to graze in the morning till they come back in the evening. Why the rule should be in force, just while the cattle are at pasture is not said, but we may conjecture 
any act of incontinence at that time is somehow supposed, on the principle of sympathetic magic, to affect the animals injuriously. The conjecture is confirmed by the observation that among the Akikuyu, for eight days out of the quarterly festivals, which they hold for the sake of securing God's blessing on their flocks and herds, no commerce is permitted between the sexes. They think that any breach of continence in these eight days would be followed by a mortality among the flocks. The taboos observed by hunters and fishers are often continued and even increased in stringency after the game has been killed and the fish caught. The motive for this conduct can only be superstitious. If the taboos or abstinences observed by hunters and fishermen before and during the chase are dictated, as we have seen reason to believe by superstitious motives, and chiefly by a dread of offending or frightening the spirits of the creatures whom it is proposed to kill, we may expect that the restraints imposed after the slaughter has been perpetuated will be at least as stringent, the slayer and his friends having now the added fear of the angry ghosts of his victims before their eyes. Whereas on the hypothesis that the absences in question, including those from food, drink and sleep, are merely salutary precautions for maintaining the men in health and strength to do their work, it is obvious that the observance of these absences or taboos after the work is done, that is, when the game is killed and the fish is caught, must be wholly superfluous, absurd and inexplicable. But as I shall now show, these taboos often continue to be enforced or even increased in stringency after the death of the animals. In other words, after the hunter or fisher has accomplished his object by making his bag or landing his fish. The rationalistic theory of them, therefore, breaks down entirely. The hypothesis of superstition is clearly the only one open to us. Taboos observed by the Bering Strait Eskimos after catching whales or salmon. Among the Inuit or Eskimos of Bering Strait, the dead bodies of various animals must be treated very carefully by the hunter who obtains them, so that their shades may not be offended and bring bad luck or even death upon him or his people. Hence the Unalit hunter, who has had a hand in the killing of a white whale, or even has helped to take one from the net, is not allowed to do any work for the next four days, that being the time during which the shade or ghost of the whale is supposed to stay with its body. At the same time, no one in the village may use any sharp or pointed instrument for fear of wounding the whale's shade, which is believed to be hovering invisible in the neighbourhood, and no loud noise may be made, lest it should frighten or offend the ghost. Whoever cuts the whale's body with an iron axe will die. Indeed, the use of all iron instruments is forbidden in the village during these four days. These Inuit have a special name, Nuna Klukluk, for a spot of the ground where certain things are tabooed, or where there is to be feared any evil influence caused by the presence of offended shades of men or animals, or through the influence of other supernatural means. This ground is sometimes considered unclean, and to go upon it would bring misfortune to the offender, producing sickness, death, or lack of success in hunting or fishing. The same term is also applied to ground where certain animals have been killed or have died. In the latter case, the ground is thought to be dangerous only to him who there performs some forbidden act. For example, the shore where a dead white whale has been beached is so regarded. At such a place and time a chop wood with an iron axe is supposed to be fatal to the imprudent person who chops. Death too is supposed to result from cutting wood with an iron axe where salmon are being dressed. An old man at St. Michael told Mr. Nelson of a melancholy case of this kind which had fallen within the scope of his own observation. A man began to chop a log near a woman who was splitting salmon. Both of them died soon afterwards. The reason of this disaster, as the old man explained, was that the shade or ghost, in the while, of the salmon, and the spirit or mystery, you are, of the ground, were incensed at the proceeding. Such offences are indeed fatal to every person who may be present at the desecrated spot. Dogs are regarded as very unclean and offensive to the shades of game animals and great care is taken that no dog shall get at the bones of a white whale. Should a dog touch one of them, the hunter might lose his luck. His nest would break or be shunned by the whales, and his spirit would not strike. But in addition to the state of uncleanness, or taboo, which arises from the presence of the shades of men or animals, these Eskimos believe the uncleanness of another sort, which, though not so serious, 
nevertheless produces sickness or bad luck in hunting. It consists, we are told, of a kind of invisible, impalpable vapour, which may attach itself to a person from some contamination. A hunter infected by such a favour is much more than usually visible to game, so that his luck in the chase is gone until he succeeds in cleansing himself once more. That is why hunters must avoid menstruous women. If they do not, they will be unable to catch game. Taboos observed by the Bering Strait Eskimos and the Aleuts of Alaska out of regard for the animals they have killed. These same Eskimos of Bering Strait celebrate a great annual festival in December, when the bladders of all the seals, whales, walrus, and white bears that have been killed in the year are taken into the assembly house of the village. They remain there for several days, and so long as they do so, the hunters avoid all intercourse with women, saying that if they have failed in that respect, the shades of the dead animals would be offended. Similarly, among the Aleuts of Alaska, the hunter who had struck a whale where the charmed spear would not throw again, but returned at once to his home and separated himself from his people in a hut specially constructed for the purpose, where he stayed for three days without food or drink and without touching or looking upon a woman. During this time of seclusion, he snorted occasionally in imitation of the wounded or dying whale, in order to prevent the whale which had been struck from leaving the coast. On the fourth day he emerged from his seclusion and bathed in the sea, shrieking in a hoarse voice and beating the water with his hands, then taking with him a companion, he repaired to that part of the shore where he expected to find the whale stranded. If the beast was dead, he at once cut out the place where the death wound had been inflicted. Yet the whale was not dead, he again returned to his home and continued washing himself until the whale died. Here the hunter's imitation of the wounded whale is probably intended by means of homeopathic magic to make the beast die in earnest. Among the Kanigmats of Alaska, the men who attacked the whale were considered by their countrymen as unclean during the fishing season, though otherwise they were held in high honour. Taboos observed by the Central Eskimos after killing sea beasts The Central Eskimos of Baffin Land and Hudson Bay think that whales, ground seals, and common seals originated in the severed fingers of the goddess Sedna. Hence an Eskimo of these regions must make atonement for each of these animals that he kills and must observe strictly certain taboos after their slaughter. Some of the rules of conduct thus enjoined are identical with those which are in force after the death of a human being. Thus, after the killing of one of these sea mammals, as after the decease of a person, it is forbidden to scrape the frost from the window, to shake the bed, or to disturb the shrubs under the bed, to remove the drippings of oil from under the lamp, to scrape hair from skins, to cut snow for the purpose of melting it, to work on iron, wood, stone, or ivory. Furthermore, women are forbidden to comb their hair, to wash their faces, and to dry their boots and stockings. All these regulations must be kept with the greatest care after a ground seal has been killed, because the transgression of taboos that refer to this animal makes the hands of Sedna very sore. When a seal is brought into the hut, the women must stop working until it is cut up. After the capture of a ground seal, walrus, or whale, they must rest for three days. Not all kinds of work, however, are forbidden. They may mend articles made of seal skin, but they may not make anything new. Working on the new skins of caribou, the American reindeer, is strictly prohibited, for a series of rules forbids all contact between that animal and the sea mammals. The sea mammals may not be brought into contact with the reindeer. Thus reindeer skins obtained in summer may not be prepared before the ice has formed and the first seal is caught with the harpoon. Later, as soon as the first walrus has been killed, the work must stop again until the next autumn. Hence everybody is eager to have his reindeer skins ready as quickly as possible, for until that is done the walrus season will not begin. When the first walrus has been killed, a messenger goes from village to village and announces the news, whereupon all work on reindeer skins immediately ceases. On the other hand, when the season for hunting, the reindeer begins, all the winter clothing and the winter tents that had been in use during the war's hunting season become tabooed and are buried under stones. They may not be used again until the next war's hunting season comes around. No war's hide or thongs made of such hide may be taken inland, 
where the reindeer live. An Asian may not be put in the same boat with walrus meat, nor yet with salmon. If an Asian or the antlers of the reindeer were in a boat which goes walrus hunting, the boat would be liable to be broken by the walrus. The Eskimos are not allowed to eat Venetian and walrus on the same day, unless they first strip naked or put on clothing of reindeer skin that has never been worn in hunting walrus. The transgression of these taboos gives umbrage to the souls of walrus, and omit this toll to account for the mutual aversion of the walrus and the reindeer. And in general, the Eskimos say that Sedna dislikes the reindeer. Wherefore, they may not bring the beast into contact with her favourites, the sea mammals. Hence the meat of the whale and the seal, as well as of the walrus, may not be eaten on the same day with Venetian. It is not permitted that both sorts of meat lie on the floor of the hut or behind the lamps at the same time. If a man who has eaten Venetian in the morning happens to enter a hut in which seal meat has been cooked, he is allowed to eat Venetian on the bed, but it must be wrapped up before it is carried into the hut, and he must take care to keep clear of the floor. Before they change from one food to the other, the Eskimos must wash themselves. Even among the sea beasts themselves, there are rules of mutual avoidance which the central Eskimos must observe. But even among the sea beasts themselves, there are rules of mutual avoidance which the central Eskimos must observe. Thus a person who has been eating or hunting walrus must strip naked or change his clothes before he eats seal. Otherwise, the transgression will become fastened to the soul of the walrus in a manner which will be explained presently. Again, the soul of a salmon is very powerful, and its body may not be eaten on the same day with walrus or Venetian. Salmon may not be cooked in a pot that has been used to boil any other kind of meat, and it must be cooked at some distance from the hut. The salmon fisher is not allowed to wear boots that have been used in hunting walrus, and no work may be done on boot legs till the first salmon has been caught and put in a boot leg. Once more, the soul of the grim polar bear is offended if the taboos which concern him are not observed. His soul tarries for three days near the spot where it left his body, and during these days, the Eskimos are particularly careful to conform richly to the laws of taboo, because they believe that punishment overtakes the transgressor who sins against the soul of a bear far more speedily than him who sins against the souls of the sea beasts. Native Explanation of These Eskimo Taboos the native explanation of the taboos thus enjoined on hunters among the central Eskimos has been given us by the eminent American ethnologist Dr. Franz Bowers, as it sets what we called the spiritual basis of taboo in the clearest light. It deserves to be studied with attention. The object of the taboos observed after killing sea beasts is to prevent the souls of the slain animals from contracting certain attachments which would hurt not only them, but also the great goddess Sedna, in whose house the disembodied souls of the sea beasts reside. The goddess Sedna, he tells us, the mother of the sea mammals, may be considered to be the chief deity of the central Eskimos. She is supposed to bear supreme sway over the destinies of mankind, and almost all the observances of these tribes have for their object to retain her goodwill or appease her anger. Her home is in the lower world, where she dwells in a house built of stone and whale ribs. The souls of seals, ground seals and whales are believed to proceed from her house. After one of these animals has been killed, its soul stays with the body for three days. Then it goes back to Sidna's abode, to be sent forth again by her. If during the three days that the soul stays with the body, any taboo or prescribed custom is violated, the violation, pitsithe, becomes attached to the animal's soul, and causes it pain. The soul strives in vain to free itself of these attachments, but is compelled to take them down to Sedna. The attachments, in some manner, not explained, make her hands sore, and she punishes the people who are the cause of her pains by sending them sickness, bad weather, and starvation. If, on the other hand, all taboos have been observed, the sea animals will allow themselves to be caught. They will even come to meet the hunter. The object of the innumerable taboos that are in force after the killing of these sea animals, therefore, is to keep their souls free from attachments that would hurt their souls as well as Sedna. The souls of the sea beasts have a great aversion to the dark colour of death and to the vapour that arises from flowing blood, and they avoid persons who are affected by these things. The souls of the sea animals are endowed with greater powers than those of ordinary human beings. 
They can see the effect of contact with a corpse, which causes objects touched where to appear dark in colour, and they can see the effect of flowing human blood, from which a vapour rises that surrounds a bleeding person and is communicated to every one and everything that comes in contact with such a person. This vapour and the dark colour of death are exceedingly unpleasant to the souls of the sea animals that will not come near a hunter thus affected. The hunter must therefore avoid contact with people who have touched a body, or with those who are bleeding, or particularly with menstruating women, or with those who have recently given birth. The hands of menstruating women appear red to the sea animals. If anyone who has touched a body, or who is bleeding, shall allow others to come in contact with him, he would cause them to become distasteful to the seals, and therefore to Sedna as well. For this reason, Carson demands that every person must at once announce if he has touched a body, and that women must make known when they are menstruating or when they have had a miscarriage. If they do not do so, they will bring ill luck to all the hunters. The transgressor of a taboo must announce his transgression in order that other people may shun him. These ideas have given rise to the belief that it is necessary to announce the transgression of any taboo. The transgressor of a custom is distasteful to Sedna and to the animals, and those who abide with him will become equally distasteful through contact with him. For this reason it has come to be an act required by custom and morals to confess any and every transgression of a taboo, in order to protect the community from the evil influence of contact with the evil doer. The descriptions of Eskimo life given by many observers, contain records of starvation, which, according to the belief of the natives, was brought about by someone transgressing a law and not announcing what he had done. Hence, the central Eskimos have come to think that sin can be atoned for by confession. I presume the importance of the confession of a transgression, with view to warn others to keep at a distance from the transgressor, has gradually led to the idea that a transgression or, we might say, a sin can be atoned for by confession. This is one of the most remarkable traits among the religious beliefs of the central Eskimo. There are innumerable tales of starvation brought about by the transgression of a taboo. In vain the hunters try to supply their families with food. Gales and drifting so make their endeavours fruitless. Finally, the help of the Angakok is invoked, and discovers that the cause of misfortune of the people is due to the transgression of a taboo. Then the guilty one is searched for. If he confesses all is well, the weather moderates, and the seals allow themselves to be caught. But if he obstinately maintains his innocence, his death alone will soothe the wrath of the offended deity. The transgression of the taboos affects the souls of the transgressor, becoming attached to it and making him sick. If the attachment is not removed by the wizard, the man will die. The transgressions of taboos do not affect the souls of game alone. It has already been stated that the sea mammals see their effect upon man also, who appears to them of a dark colour, or surrounded by a vapour which is invisible to ordinary man. This means, of course, that the transgression also affects the souls of the evil doer. It becomes attached to it and makes him sick. The younger cock is able to see these attachments with the help of his guardian spirit and is able to free the soul from them. If this is not done, the person must die. In many cases, the transgressions become fastened also to persons who come in contact with the evildoer. This is especially true of children, to whose souls the sins of their parents, and particularly of their mothers, become readily attached. Therefore, when a child is sick, the anger cock, first of all, asks his mother if she has transgressed any taboos. The attachment seems to have a different appearance, according to the taboo that has been violated. A black attachment is due to removing all drippings from under the lamp. A piece of caribou skin represents the scrapings removed from a caribou skin at a time when such work was forbidden. As soon as a mother acknowledges the transgression of a taboo, the attachment leaves a child's soul and the child recovers. The Eskimos try to keep the sea beast free from contaminating influences, especially from contact with corpses and with women, who have recently been brought to bed. A number of customs may be explained by the endeavours of the natives to keep the sea mammals free from contaminating influences. All the clothing of a dead person, the tent in which he died, 
and the skins obtained by him must be discarded. For if a hunter should wear clothing made of skins that had been in contact with the deceased, these would appear dark, and the seal would avoid him. Neither would a seal allow itself to be taken into a hut darkened by a dead body, and all those who entered such a hut would appear dark to it, and would be avoided. While it is customary for a successful hunter to invite all the men of the village to eat of the seal that he has caught, they must not take any of the seal meat out of the hut, because it might come in contact with the persons who were under taboo, and thus the hunter might incur the displeasure of the seal and of Sidna. This is particularly strictly forbidden in the case of the first seal of the season. A woman who has a newborn child, and who is not quite recovered, may eat only of seals caught by her husband, by a boy, or by an aged man. Also vapour arising from her body would become attached to the souls of other seals, which would take the transgression down to Sedna, thus making her hands sore. Cases of premature birth require particularly careful treatment. The event must be announced publicly, else dire results will follow. If a woman should conceal from the other people that she has had a premature birth, they might come near her, or even eat in her hut of the seals procured by her husband. The vapour rising from her would thus affect them, and they would be avoided by the seals. The transgression would also become attached to the soul of the seal, which would take it down to Sedna. In the system of taboos of the central Eskimos, we see animism passing into religion. Morality is coming to rest on a supernatural basis, namely the will of the goddess Sedna. In these elaborate taboos, so well described by Dr. Boas, we seem to see a system of animism in the act of passing into religion. The rules themselves bear the clearest traces of having originated in a doctrine of souls, and have been determined by the supposed likes and dislikes and antipathies of the various classes of spirits toward each other. But above and behind the souls of men and animals has grown up the overshadowing conception of a powerful goddess who rules them all, so that the taboos come more and more to be viewed as a means of propitating her rather than as merely adapted to suit the tastes of the souls themselves. Thus the standard of conduct is shifted from a natural to a supernatural basis. The supposed wish of the deity, or, as we commonly put it, the will of God, tends to supersede the wishes, real or imaginative, of purely natural beings as the measure of right and wrong. The old savage taboos, resting on a theory of the direct relations of living creatures to each other, remain in substance unchanged, but they are outwardly transformed into ethical precepts with a religious or supernatural sanction. In this evolution of religion, the practice of confession has played a part. It seems to have been regarded as a spiritual purge or emetic by which sin conceived as a sort of morbid substance was expiled from the body of the sinner. In this gradual passage of a rude philosophy into an elementary religion, the place occupied by confession as a moral prerogative is particularly interesting. I can hardly agree with Dr. Boas that among these Eskimos the confession of sins was in its origin no more than a means of warning others about the dangerous contagion of the sinner. In other words, that its saving of Fasi consisted merely of preventing the innocent from suffering with the guilty, that it had no healing virtue no purifying influence for the evildoer himself. It seems more probable that originally the violation of taboo, in other words, the sin, was conceived as something almost physical, a sort of morbid substance lurking in the sinner's body, from which it could be expelled by confession, as by a sort of spiritual purge or emetic. This is confirmed by a form of auricular confession, which is practiced by the Akikuyu of British East Africa. Among them, we are told, sin is essentially remissible. It suffices to confess it. Usually this is done to the sorcerer, who expels a sin by a ceremony of which the principal rite is a pretended medic. Kotahikio, derived from Tahika, to vomit. Thus among these savages, the confession and absolution of sins is, so to say, a purely physical process of relieving a sufferer of a burden which sits heavily on his stomach, rather than on his conscience. This view of the matter is again conferred by the observation that these same Akiku resort to another physical mode of expelling sin from a sinner, and that is by the employment of a scapegoat, which by them 
as by the Jews and many of the people, has been employed as a vehicle for carting away moral rubbish and dumping it somewhere else. For example, if a cuckoo man has committed incest, which would naturally entail his death, he produces a substitute in the shape of a he-goat, to which, by ignoble ceremony, he transfers his guilt. Then the throat of the animal is cut, and the human culprit is thereby purged of his sin. Hence the confession of sins is employed as a sort of medicine for the recovery of the sick. Hence we may suspect that the primary motive for the confession of sins among savages was self-regarding. In other words, the intention was rather to benefit the sinner himself and to safeguard others by warning them of the danger they would incur by coming into contact with him. This view is born out of the observation that confession is sometimes used as a means of healing the sick transgressor himself, who is supposed to recover as soon as he has made a clean breast of his transmission. Thus, when the carriers are severely sick, they often think that they shall not recover, lest they divulge to a priest or magician every crime which they may have committed, which has hitherto been kept secret. In such a case, they will make a full confession, and then they expect that their lives will be spared for a time longer. But should they keep back a single crime, they certainly believe that they shall suffer almost instant death. Again, the Orohoka Indians, who under the tropical sun of South America, inhabit a chilly region bordering on perpetual snows of the Sierra Nevada in Colombia, believe that all sickness is a punishment for sin. So when one of their medicine men is summoned to a sick bed, he does not inquire after the patient's symptoms, but makes strange passes over him and asks in a spectral voice whether he will confess his sins. If the sick man persists in drawing a veil of silence over his frailties, the doctor will not attempt to treat him, but will turn on his heel and leave the house. On the other hand, if a satisfactory confession has been made, the leech directs the patient's friends to procure certain odd-looking bits of stone or shell to which the sins of the sufferer may be transferred, for when that is done, he will be made whole. For this purpose, the sin-laden stones or shells are carried up into the mountains and laid in some spot where the first beams of the sun, rising in clear or clouded majesty above the long white slopes or the towering crags of the Sierra Nevada, will strike down on them, driving sin and sickness far away by their radiant influence. Here again, we see that sin is regarded as something almost material, which, by confession, can be removed from the body of the patient and laid on stones or shells. Further, the confession of sins has been resorted to by some people as a means of accelerating the birth of a child, when the mother was in hard labour. Similarly, the confession of sins is sometimes resorted to by women in hard labour as a means of accelerating their delivery. Thus, among the Indians of Guatemala, in the time of their idolatry, when a woman was in labour, the midwife ordered her to confess her sins, and if she was not delivered, the husband was to confess his, and if that did not do, they took off his clouts and put them about his wife's loins. If she still could not be delivered, the midwife drew blood from herself and sprinkled it towards the four quarters of heaven with her invocations and ceremonies. In these attempts of the Indians to accelerate the birth of the child, it seems clear that the confession of sins on the part first of the wife and afterwards of the husband is nothing but a magical ceremony by the putting of the husband's clothes on the suffering woman or the sprinkling of the midwife's blood towards the four quarters of the heaven. Amongst the Antambahoga, a severed tribe of Madagascar, when a woman is in hard labour, a sorcerer is called in to her aid. After making some magical signs and uttering some incantations, he generally declares that the patient cannot be delivered unless she has publicly confessed a secret fault which she has committed. In such a case, a woman has been known to confess to incest with a brother, and immediately after her confession, the child was born. In these cases, confession is a magical ceremony designed to relieve the sinner. In these cases, the confession of sins is clearly not a mode of warning people to keep clear of the sinner. It is a magical ceremony primarily intended to benefit the sinner himself or herself, and no other. The same thing may perhaps be said of a confession which was prescribed in a certain case by ancient Hindu ritual. At a great festival of Varuna, which fell at the beginning of the rainy season, the priest asked his wife of the sacrificer to name her paramour 
or paramours, and she had to mention their names, or at least to take up as many grass stalks as she had lovers. Now when a woman who belongs to one carries on intercourse with another, she undoubtedly commits a sin against Faruna. He therefore thus asks her, lest she should sacrifice with a secret pang in her mind, for when confessed the sin becomes less, since it becomes truth. This is why he thus asks her, and whatever connection she confesses, not, that indeed will turn out injurious to her relatives. In this passage of the Satipatha Brahmana, confession of sin is said to diminish the sin, just as if the mere utterance of the words ejected or expelled some morbid matter from the person of the sinner, thereby relieving her of its burden, and benefiting also her relatives, who would suffer through any sin which she might not have confessed. Thus the confession of sins is at first rather a bodily than a moral purgation, resembling the ceremonies of washing, fumigation, and of so on, which are observed by many primitive peoples for the removal of sin. Thus, at an early stage of culture, the confession of sins wears the aspect of a bodily rather than of a moral and spiritual purgation. It is a magical rather than a religious rite and as such it resembles the ceremonies of washing, scouring, fumigation, and so forth, which in like manner are applied by many primitive peoples to the purification of what we should regard as moral guilt, but what they consider rather as a corporeal pollution or infection, which can be removed by the physical agencies of fire, water, fasts, purgatives, abrasion, scarification, and so forth. But when the guilt of sin ceases to be regarded as something material, a sort of clinging vapour of death, and is conceived as a transgression of the will of a wise and good God, it is obvious that the observance of these outward rites of purification becomes superfluous and absurd, a vain show which cannot appease the anger of the offended deity. The only means of turning away his wrath and averting the fatal consequences of sin is now believed to be the humble confession and true repentance of the sinner. At this stage of ethical evolution, the practice of confession loses its old magical character as a bodily purge and assumes the new aspect of a purely religious rite, the propitiation of a great supernatural and moral being, who by a simple fit can cancel the transgression and restore the transgressor to a state of pristine innocence. This comfortable doctrine teaches us that in order to blot out the effects of our misdeeds, we have only to acknowledge and confess them with a lowly and penitent heart whereupon a merciful God will graciously pardon our sin and resolve us and ours from its consequences. It might indeed be well for the world if we could thus easily undo the past, if we could recall the words that have been spoken amiss, if we could arrest the long train that follows, like a flight of avenging furies, on every evil action. But this we cannot do. Our words and acts, good and bad, have their natural, their inevitable consequences. God may pardon sin, but nature cannot. It is possible that some savage taboos may still lurk under various disguises in the morality of civilized peoples. It seems not improbable that our own rules of conduct in what we call the common decencies of life as well as in the weightier matters of morality there may survive not a few old savage taboos which, masquerading as an expression of the divine will, or draped in the flowing robes of a false philosophy, have maintained their credit long after the crude ideas out of which they sprang have been discarded by the progress of thought and knowledge. While on the other hand, many ethical precepts and social laws, which now rest firmly on a solid basis of utility, may at first have drawn some portion of their sanity from the same ancient system of superstition. For example, we can hardly doubt that in primitive society the crime of murder derived much of its horror from a fear of the angry ghost of the murdered man. Thus, superstition may serve as a convenient crutch to morality till she is strong enough to throw away the crutch and walk alone. To judge by the legislation of the Pentateuch, and ancient Semites appear to have passed through a course of moral evolution not unlike that which we can still detect in progress among the Eskimos of Baffinland. Some of the old laws of Israel are clearly savage taboos of a familiar type, thinly disguised as commands of the deity. This disguise is indeed a good deal more perfect in Palestine than in Baffinland, but in substance it is the same. Among the Eskimos it is the will of Sedna, among the Israelites it is the will of Jehovah. 
but it is time to return to our immediate subject, to wit, the rules of conduct observed by hunters after the slaughter of the game. Ceremonies observed by the Cayans after killing a panther. When the Cayans of Bahoas of central Borneo have shot one of the dreaded Bornean panthers, they are very anxious about the safety of their souls, for they think that the soul of a panther is almost more powerful than their own. Hence they step eight times over the carcass of the dead beast, reciting the spell, Panther, thy soul under my soul. On returning home, they smear themselves, their dogs, and the weapons with the blood of fowls, in order to calm their souls and hid them from fleeing away. For being themselves fond of the flesh of fowls, they ascribe the same taste to their souls. For eight days afterwards, they must bathe by day and by night before going out again to the chase. After killing an animal, some Indian hunters used to purify themselves in water as a religious rite. Ceremonies of purification observed by African hunters after killing dangerous beasts. When a Damaro hunter returns from a successful chase, he takes water in his mouth and injects it three times over his feet, and also into the fire on his own hearth. Amongst the Kafras of South Africa, the sword of a lion, however honourable it is esteemed, is nevertheless associated with the idea of moral uncleanness, which is followed by a very strange ceremony. When the hunters approach the village on their return, the man who gave the lion the first wound is hidden from every eye by the shields which his comrades hold up before him. One of the hunters steps forward and, leaping and bounding in a strange manner, praises the courage of the lion killer. Then he rejoins the band, and the same performance is repeated by another. All the rest, meanwhile, keep up a ceaseless shouting, rattling with their clubs on their shields. This goes on till they have reached the village. Then a main hut is run up not far from the village, and in this hut the lion killer, because he is unclean, must remain four days, cut off from all association with the tribe. There he dyes his body all over with white paint, and lads who have not yet been circumcised are therefore, in respect to uncleanness, in the same state as himself, bring him a calf to eat and wait upon him. When the four days are over, the unclean man washes himself, paints himself with red paint in the usual manner, and is escorted back to the village by the head chief and tenor by a guard of honour. Lastly, a second calf is killed, and the uncleanness being now at an end, everyone is free to eat of the calf with him. Among the Hottentots, when a man has killed a lion, leopard, elephant, or rhinoceros, he is esteemed a great hero, but he is deluged with urine by the medicine man and has to remain at home quite idle for three days, during which his wife may not come near him. She is also enjoined to restrict herself to a poor diet and to eat no more than is barely necessary to keep her in health. Ceremonies observed by the lap hunters after killing a bear. Similarly, the laps deem it the height of glory to kill a bear, which they consider the king of beasts. Nevertheless, all the men who take part in the slaughter are regarded as unclean, and will live by themselves for three days in a hut or tent made specifically for them, while they cut up and cook the bear's carcass. The reindeer which brought in the carcass on a sledge may not be driven by a woman for a whole year. Indeed, according to one account, it may not be used by anybody for that period. Before the men go into the tent where they are to be secluded, they strip themselves of the garments they had worn in killing the bear, and their wives spit the red juice of alder bark in their faces. They enter the tent not by the ordinary door, but by an opening at the back. When the bear's flesh has been cooked, a portion of it is sent to the hands of two men to the women, who may not approach the men's tent while the cooking is going on. The men who convey the flesh to the women pretend to be strangers, bringing presents from a foreign land and women keep up the pretense and promise to tie red threads round the legs of the strangers. The bear's flesh may not be passed into the women through the door of their tent, but must be thrust in at a special opening made by lifting up the hem of the tent cover. When the three days' seclusion is over, and the men are at liberty to return to their wives, they run, one after the other, round the fire, holding the chain by which pots are suspended over it. This is regarded as a form of purification, they may now leave the tent in the ordinary door and rejoin the women. But the leader of the party must still abstain from cohabitation with his wife for two days more. 
Expiatory ceremonies performed for the slaughter of servants. Again, the Kafirs are said to dread greatly the boa constrictor, or an enormous serpent resembling it, and being influenced by certain superstitious notions, they even fear to kill it. The man who happened to put it to death, whether in self-defence or otherwise, was formally required to lie in a running stream of water during the day for several weeks together, and no beast whatever was allowed to be slaughtered at the hamlet to which he belonged, until this duty had been fully performed. The body of the snake was then taken and carefully buried in a trench, dug close to the cattle fold, where its remains, like those of a chief, were henceforward kept perfectly undisturbed. The period of penance, as in the case of mourning for the dead, is now happily reduced to a few days. Amongst the Iwo-speaking peoples of the slave coast, who worshipped the python, a native who killed one of these serpents used to be burned alive. But for some time past, though a semblance of carrying out the old penalty is preserved, the culprit is allowed to escape with his life, but he has to pay a heavy fine. A small hut of dry faggots and grass is set up, generally near the lagoon at Waida. If the crime has been perpetrated there, the guilty man is thrust inside. The door of plated grass is shut on him, and the hut is set on fire. Sometimes a dog, a kid, and two fowls are enclosed along with him, and he is drenched with palm oil and yeast, probably to render him the more combustible. As he is unbound, he easily breaks out of the frail hut before the flames consume him but he has to run the gauntlet of the angry serpent worshippers who belabor the murderer of their god with sticks and pelt him with clods until he reaches water and plunges into it, which is supposed to wash away his sin. Thirteen days later, a commemoration service is held in honor of the deceased python. In Madras, it is considered a great sin to kill a cobra. When this has happened, the people generally burn the body of the serpent just as they burn the bodies of human beings. The murderer deemed himself polluted for three days. On the second day, milk is poured on the remains of the cobra. On the third day, the guilty wretch is free from pollution. Under native rule, we may suspect he would not get off so lightly. All such expiatory rites are based on the respect which the savage feels for the souls of animals. In these last cases, the animal whose slaughter has to be atoned for is sacred. That is, it is one whose life is commonly spared from motives of superstition. Yet the treatment of the sacrilegious slayer seems to resemble so closely the treatment of hunters and fishermen who have killed animals for food in the ordinary course of business, that the idea in which both sets of customs are based may be assumed to be substantially the same. Those ideas, if I am right, are the respect which the savage feels for the souls of beasts, especially valuable or formidable beasts and the dread which he entertains of their vengeful ghosts. Some confirmation of this view may be drawn from the ceremonies observed by fishermen of an arm when the carcass of a whale is washed ashore. These fisherfolk, we are told, worship the whale on account of the benefits they derive from it. There is hardly a village on the seashore which has not its small pagoda, containing the bones, more or less authentic, of a whale. When a dead whale is washed ashore, the people who called it a solemn burial. The man who first caught sight of it acts as chief mourner, performing the rites which, as chief mourner, an heir, he would perform for a human kinsman. He puts on all the garb of woe, the straw hat, the white robe of long sleeves turned inside out, and the other paraphernalia of full mourning. As next of kin to the deceased, he presides over the funeral rites. Perfumes are burned, sticks of incense kindled, leaves of gold and silver scattered, crackers let off. When the flesh has been cut off and the oil extracted, the remains of the carcass are buried in the sand. Afterwards a shed is set up and offerings are made in it. Usually some time after the burial, the spirit of the dead whale takes possession of some person in the village and declares by his mouth whether he is a male or a female. End of section 8